This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. This is the Lex Friedman Podcast. To support it, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now, dear friends, here's Balaji Srinivasan. At the core of your belief system is something you call the uh, prime number maze. I'm curious. I'm curious. We got. We got to start there. Sure. If we can start anywhere, it's with mathematics. Let's go. All right. Great. A rat can be trained to turn at every even number or every third number in a maze to to get some cheese, but evidently it can't be trained to turn at prime numbers, two, three, five, seven and then 11, and so on and so forth. That's just too abstract. And frankly, if most humans were dropped into a prime number maze, they probably wouldn't be able to figure it out either. You know, they'd have to start counting and so on. Actually, it'd be pretty difficult to figure out what the, the turning you know, rule was. Yet the rule is actually very simple. And so the thing I think about a lot is just how many patterns in life are we just like these rats and we're trapped in a prime number maze. And if we had just a little bit more you know, cogitation, if we had, you know, a little bit more cognitive ability, a little bit more, whether it's, uh, you know, brain machine interface or just better physics, we could just figure out the next step in that prime number maze. We could just see it. We could just see the grid. Right. And that's what I think about like that. That's a big thing that drives me is figuring out how do we can actually conceive, understand that prime number maze that we're living in. So understand which patterns are just complex enough that they are beyond the limit of human cognition yes and uh what do you make of that are the limits of human cognition a feature or a bug i think mostly a bug i admire ramanujan i admire uh you know Feynman. I, I admire these great mathematicians and physicists who were just able to see things that others couldn't and just by writing it down, you know, that's that's a leap forward. You know, people talk about it's not the idea, it's execution, but that's for trivial ideas, for great ideas, for Maxwell's equations or Newton's laws or, you know, quantum electrodynamics or some of Ramanujan's identities. That really does bring us forward, especially when you can check them and you don't know how they work, right? You, you have the phenomenological, but you don't have the theory underneath it. And then that stimulates the advancement of theory to figure out why is this thing actually working. And that's actually, you know, Statmec, you know, arose in part from the kind of phenomenological studies that were basically being done where people are just getting steam engines and so on to work. And then they kind of abstracted out thermodynamics and so on from that, right? So the, the practice. That's amazing, and it pulls us forward. So I, I do think that the limits are are more of a bug than a feature. Is there something that humans will never be able to figure? Is is not only an abstraction of objective reality, but it's actually completely detached. Like hmm. we're in a video game, essentially. That's uh, consistent between each, uh, consistent for all humans but it doesn't, it's not at all connected to physical reality. Hmm. So it's, it's an it's illusion. Like a version of the simulation hypothesis, is that his? In a very distant way, but uh, the simulation says that there's a sort of computational nature to reality, and then there's a kind of a programmer that creates this reality and so on. Now, he's, he says that we humans have a brain that is able to perceive the environment, and uh, evolution has produced from primitive life to complex life on earth produce the kind of brain that doesn't at all need to sense the reality uh, directly. So like this table, according to Donald Hoffman, is not there. Well, so... <laughs> like, that, not not just as an abstraction, like we don't sense the molecules that make up the table, but all of this is fake. Interesting. So, uh, you know, I, I tend to be more of a hard science person, right? And so... Um, you know, so just on that, people talk about qualia, you know, like is, you know, 
know, spectrum of light, and we can build artificial eyes. And if we can build artificial eyes, which we can, you know, they're, like they're not amazing, but you can actually, you can do that. You can build artificial ears and so on. Obviously, we can build recording devices and, you know, for cameras and things like that. Well, operationally, the whole concept of your perception of green, you see green as purple, I see green as green, or what I call green, doesn't seem to add up because it does seem like we can do engineering around it, right? So the Hoffman thing, I get why people more broadly will talk about a simulation hypothesis because, you know, it's like Feynman and many others have talked about how uh, math is surprisingly useful to describe the world. You yeah. know, like very simple equations give rise to these complex phenomena. Wolfram is also on this um, from from a different angle with the cellular automata stuff. But um, it's almost suspicious how well it works. Yeah, but on their hand, it's like, uh, you know, it, it is, yet we're still also in a prime number maze. You know, there's things we just don't understand. And, right. um, you know, so. Also, the, within the constraints of the non-prime numbers, we find math to be extremely effective, surprisingly effective. Yeah, exactly. So maybe maybe the math we have gets us through the equivalent of the even turns and the odd turns, but there's math we don't yet have that is more complex or more complex rules for other parts. Despite all our rage, and, and, we're and all the, just rats in a cage. I know that gets like very abstract, but you know, there are unsolved problems in, in physics. Uh, you know, like the condensed matter space, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening. My recollection, I may be you know, out of date on this, like things like sonar luminescence, we don't know exactly how they work. And sometimes those things that are like at the edges of physics, you know, in the late 1800s, I think Rutherford, uh, somebody, I think it was Rutherford said, you know, basically all physics is being discovered, et cetera. And that was obviously before quantum mechanics, you know, that, that sort of edge case, people are looking at the bomber and the passion series and seeing, you know, this weird thing, you know, with the, with the hydrogen spectrum, and it was, quantized and you know that led to uh like the, the sort of phenomenological set of observations that led to quantum mechanics and 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 everything and you know sometimes i think the uap stuff might be like that right people immediately go to aliens for uap like the unidentified aerial phenomena right and people have been uh there's surprising amount of stuff out there on this the uk has declassified a bunch of material you know harry reed who's a sender has talked about this it's not an obviously it's not an obviously political thing, it, it, which is good. It's something that is, – is there something happening there, right? Mm -hmm. And people had thought for a long time that the UAP thing was a like American um, kind of counter-propaganda to cover up their new spy planes that were spying over the Soviet Union to make anybody who talked about them seem, you know, crazy and, and, and hysterical or whatever. But if the UAP thing is real, it could be atmospheric mm – -hmm. Presence. Um, there's one calculation I saw, and I haven't reproduced it myself, but basically says that the uh, the assumption that other civilizations have seen ours is wrong because when you have like a spherical radius for like the you know electromagnetic radiation that's leaving our planet, as that sphere gets larger and larger, it gets like smaller and smaller amounts of energy. So you know you get farther out, you're you're not getting enough. Um, you know, uh, you know, photons or, or what have you to, to actually, uh, detect it. Um, I, you know, I don't know, I actually haven't looked into the math behind it, but I remember, remember seeing that argument. So actually it is possible that it's so diffuse when you go past a certain, you know, number of light years out that people, you know, that, that an alien civilization wouldn't be able to detect it. Right. That's, that's another argument. That's more basically about signals, signals from strength. them, from us yeah. to be able to signals colliding in, enough to, uh, find the signal from the noise. Right, exactly. Intelligent right. signal. Yeah, Hansen, noise. Hansen has an article called Grabby Aliens. Yeah. Um, have you seen his thing? Yes, on this, yes, right? yes, yes. And so there's He's been a, on this podcast. Oh, great. He's brilliant. I like him. He, he pushes, you know, boundaries in interesting ways. In every ways. In all of the ways. In all yeah. the ways. That's right. Yeah. I, I, I like him overall. He's, he's you know, he, he he's an asset to you, Andy. Grabby he, Aliens. So he, he, has, he has this interesting idea that... Uh, the civilizations uh, quickly learn how to travel close to the speed of light. Right. So we're not going to see them until they're here. Yeah, that's possible. I mean, one of the things is, so here's, for example, a mystery that we haven't yet done, right? Which, or we haven't really figured out yet, which is um, abiogenesis in the lab, 
right? We've done lots of things where we, you've got, you can show macromolecules binding to each other. You can show, you know, evidence for the so-called RNA world, abiogenesis is to go from, you know, like non-life to life, right? In the lab, you can show microevolution, obviously with bacteria, you can do artificial selection on them. Lots of other aspects of, um, you know, fundamental, you know, biochemistry origins of life stuff have been established. There's a lot of plausibility arguments about the primitive environment and nitrogens and carbon snapping together to get, you know, the, you know, the RNA world is the, the, uh, the initial hypothesis, but to my knowledge, at least we haven't actually seen a biogenesis demonstrated. Now, one argument is you need just like this massive world with, uh, you know, so many different reps before that actually happens. And, um, one possibility is if we could do atomic level, you know, simulations of molecules bouncing against each other, it's possible that in some simulation we could find a path, a reproducible path to abiogenesis, and then just, you know, replicate that in the lab, right? Um, I, I don't know, okay? Uh, but that. Oh, you know, nice. That's a nice word. That's a. a Quran. I'm probably mispronouncing it, but. Yeah. Um, We'll edit it in post to sure, pronounce sure, it sure. correctly sure, with AI. Sure. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll be... copy your voice and it will pronounce it perfectly correctly Yeah. in post. One thing that I do think was interesting is uh, Craig Venter a while back tried to make a minimum viable cell um, where he just tried to delete all of the genes that were that were not considered essential. And so it's like a new life form. And this was like almost 20 years ago and so on. And that thing was a, was was viable in the lab, right? And so it's possible that you could, you kind of reverse engineer. So you're coming at the problem from different directions. Like RNA molecules can do quite a lot. You've got some, you know, reasonable assumptions as to how that could come together. Uh, you've got like sort of stripped down minimum viable life forms. And, and so it's, sort of, there's, it's not, there isn't stuff here. You can see microevolution. You can see at the sequence level, you know, if you do molecular phylogenetics, you can actually track back the bases. There's actually, so it's not like there's no evidence here. There's a lot of tools to work with, but this in my view is a fascinating area and actually also relevant to AI because another form of abiogenesis would be if we are able to give rise to a different branch of life form, the silicon based as opposed to carbon based, you know, to, to stretch a point. Um, you give rise to something that actually does meet the definition of life for some definition of life, right? Well, what, what do you think that definition is for an artificial life form? Because you mentioned consciousness. Yeah. When will it give us pause that we created something that feels by some definition or by some spiritual, poetic, romantic, philosophical, mathematical definition that it is alive Right. And we wouldn't want to kill it. So a couple of remarks on that. One is um, Francis Crick of, of Watson and Crick, uh, before he died, I think his last paper was published on something called the claustrum. Okay. <music> Organs, like the claustrum is kind of this system integrated level, right? It's like the, the last layer in the neural network or something, you know? Um, and uh and so that's that's the kind of thing that i think is worth studying um so consciousness is another kind of big abiogenesis is a big question the prime number maze consciousness is a big question um and uh you know then definition of life right uh there's folks gosh there's i think so this one is something I'd have to Google around, but there was a guy, I think at Santa Fe Institute or something who had some definition of life and like some thermodynamic definition. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right that it's gonna be a multi-feature definition. We might have a Turing test-like definition, frankly, which is just if enough humans agree it's alive, it's alive, right? And that might frankly be the operational definition. Because, uh, you know, viruses are like this boundary case, you know, are they are they alive or not? Most people don't think they're alive. But they're 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 on they're kind of they're more alive than a rock, in a sense. Well, I think uh, in a world that we'll talk about today quite a bit, which is the digital world, I think the most fascinating philosophically and technically definition of life is life in the digital world. Mm -hmm. So chatbots, essentially creatures, whether they're replicas of humans or totally independent creations 
perhaps in an automatic way, I think there's going to be chatbots that we would ethically be troubled by if we wanted to kill them. They would have the capacity to suffer. They would be very unhappy with you trying to sh turn them off. Hmm. And then there will be large groups of activists that will protest and they'll go to the Supreme Court of whatever the Supreme Court looks like. And, and that serious step ups are possible. And obviously, you know, you know you, you've talked about AI in your podcast a ton. Um, is it possible that GPT-9 or something is is kind of like that? Or GPT-15 or, or GPT-4, maybe? But... Yeah, for people just listening, there's a deep skepticism in your face. Yeah, you know, the reason being because... Um, it, you know, it's possible. It's possible that you have like a partition of society on literally this basis. You know, mm -hmm. um, that's one model where there's some people, just like there's vegetarians and non vegetarians, right? There may be um, machines have life and machines are machines, you know, like, or something like that, right? Uh, you know, you could you could definitely imagine some kind of partition like that in the future where your fundamental political social system that's a foundational assumption and you know is ai does it you know deserve the same rights as like a human or for example a corporation is an intermediate uh do you see that thing which is how human is, are different corporations have you seen that infographic <laughs> it's actually funny yeah, so it's, it's like a spectrum there's a spectrum. So for example, Disney is considered about as human as like a dog, but like Exxon, I, I may be remembering this wrong, but they had like a level with like human at one end yeah. and like rock at the other. Does it have to do with corporate structure? What, what, what's I think it's the, about people's empathy for that corporation, their brand oh. identity. But it's interesting to see that first of all, people sort of do think of corporations as being more or less, like the branding yeah. is really what they're responding well, to. Well, that's right? what, I mean, they're also responding you know, I have a brand of human that I'm trying to sell, mm -hmm. and it seems to be effective for the most part. <laughs> sure. Although it has become like a running joke that I might be a robot. Right. Which means there's the brand is cracking. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> it's seeping through. But I mean, in that sense, I just, I think, uh, I don't see a reason why chatbots can't manufacture the brand of being human, of being sentient. I mean, that is the Turing test, but it's like the multiplayer Turing test. Now that actually a fair number of chatbots have passed the Turing test, I'd say there's at least two steps up, right? Mm -hmm. One is um, a multiplayer Turing test where you have chatbots talking to each other. And then you ask, can you determine the difference between and chatbots talking to each other and clicking buttons and stuff in apps and, and humans doing that? Mm -hmm. be able to kind of swap in and you're not just convincing one human that this is a human for a small you know session you're convincing all humans that this is a human for n sessions remote work actually makes this possible right that's another definition of a multiplayer turing test where basically you have a chatbot that's fully automated that is earning money for you as an intelligent agent on a computer that's able to go and get remote work job theory log you know the actions of 10,000 or 100,000 or a million people and with cryptocurrency you could even monitor a wallet that was on that computer and you could see you know what long run series of actions were increasing or decreasing this digital balance you see what i'm saying mm -hmm. right so you start to get at least conceptually it would be invasive and and you know there'd be a privacy issue in Okay. Mm -hmm. there, there may be better ways to formulate it, but that I would consider a challenge problem is to go from the Turing test to a genuine intelligent agent that can actually go and make money for you. If you can do that, that's a big deal. People oh. obviously have trading bots and stuff, but that would be, you know, the next level. It's typing out emails, it's creating documents. It's actually so mimic human behavior in its entirety. Yeah, that's right. And it can, it'll schedule Zooms, it'll send emails, it'll essentially, because 
if you think about it, a human is hitting the keys and clicking the mouse, but just like a self-driving car, the wheel rotates by itself, right? Those keys are effectively just, it's like a, like the automator app in, in Apple, right? Um, everything's just moving on the screen. You're seeing it there and it's just an AI. It's kind of hilarious that the I'm not a robot click thing mm -hmm. actually works. Because I, I, I actually don't know how, how, that's happening. how it works, but I think it has to do with the movement of the mouse, yes. the timing, and they know that it's very difficult for currently for a bot to mimic human behavior in the way they would click that little checkbox. Yeah, exactly. I think it's something, I mean, uh, again, my recollection on that is it's like a pile of highly obfuscated JavaScript with all kinds, it looks like a very simple box, but it's doing a lot of stuff and it's collecting all kinds of instrumentation. And yeah, exactly like a like a robot is just a little too deterministic or if it's got noise, it's like Gaussian noise and the way humans do it is just not. Kind of, you know, I think that's exactly what mushrooms do or like psychedelics is you get to go outside and look back in and yeah, that's what a computer needs to do. I, you know, I do wonder whether they actually give people insight or whether they give people the illusion of insight. Um, is there a difference? Yeah. Because, uh, well, actual insight, you know, actual insight is, again, Maxwell's equations. You're, you're able to shift the world with that. There's a lot of practical devices that work. The illusion of insight is I'm Jesus Christ and nothing happens, right? So, I don't know. I think those are quite different. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I, I think you can fake it till you make it on that one, which is um, insight in some sense is revealing a truth that was there all along yeah so i mean i guess like i'm talking about technical insight where you you have this is the thing you know we were talking about actually before the podcast like technical truths versus political truths right some truths they're they're on a spectrum and there's some truths that are actually entirely political in the sense that if you can change the software in enough people's heads you change the the value of the truth. For example, the location of a border is effectively consensus between large enough groups of people. Uh, who is the CEO? That's you know consensus among a certain group of people. What is the value of a currency or any stock? Right, that that market price is just the psychology of a bunch of people. Like literally, if you can change enough people's minds. linear fascinating journey to the question i wanted to ask you in the sure. beginning which is um this political world that you mentioned in the world of political truth as we know it in the 20th century in the early 21st century what do you think works well and what is broken about government the fundamental thing is that we can't easily and peacefully start new opt-in governments and like startup governments. Yeah. And what do I mean by that is basically um, you can start a new company, you can start a new community, you can start a new currency even these days. You don't have to beat the former CEO in a duel to start a new company. Um, you don't have to become head of the World Bank to start a new currency. Okay. Um, because of this, yes, if you can, if, if you're, if you want to, you can join, I don't know, uh, Microsoft or name some company that's a GameStop and you can try to reform it, okay? Or you can start your own. And the fact that both options exist mean that, you know, you have you can actually just start from scratch. And that's just, I mean, the same reason we have a clean piece of paper, right? I mentioned this actually in, in the Network State book. I'll just quote this bit, but... We want to be able to start a new state peacefully for the same reason we want a bare plot of earth, a blank sheet of paper, an empty text buffer, a fresh start, or a clean slate, because we want to build something new without historical constraint, right? For the same reason you hit plus and do docs.new, you know, like create a new doc. It's mm -hmm. for the same reason, right? Because you don't have backspace. You don't have to have just like 128 bytes of space, 128 kilobytes, and just have to backspace the old document before creating the new one. So that's a fundamental thing that's wrong with today's governments. And it's a meta point, right? Because it's not any one specific reform. It's a meta reform of being able to start new countries. Okay, so that's one problem. But, there, you know, you could push back and say that's that's a feature. Because, you know, a lot of people argue that tradition is power. 
through generation, if you try a thing long enough, which is the way I see marriage, there's value to the struggle and the journey you take through the struggle and you grow and you develop ideas together, you grow intellectually, philosophically together. And that's the idea of a nation that spans generations, that you have a tradition that becomes more, that, that strives towards the truth and is able to arrive there, or no, not arrive, but take steps towards there through the generations. So you, you may not want to keep starting new governments. You may want to uh, stick to the old one and uh, improve it one step at a time. So just because you're having a fight inside a marriage doesn't mean you should get a divorce and go on Tinder and start dating around. That's the uh, that's the pushback. So it's, sure. not, it's not obvious that this is a, a strong feature to have sure. able to launch new governments. There's several different kind of lines of attack or, or debate or whatever on this, right? First is... Uh, Yes, there's obviously value to tradition. And, uh, you know, people say this is Lindy and that's Lindy. It's been proven for a long time and so on. But of course, there's a tension between tradition and innovation. You know, like going to the moon wasn't Lindy, just it was awesome. And, you know, like artificial intelligence is something that's very new. New is good, right? And this is a tension within humanity actually itself, because, you know, it's, way older than all of these nations. I mean, humans are tens of thousands of years old. The answers to humans are millions of years old, right? And you go back far enough, and the time that we know today of the sessile farmer and soldier is, if you go back far enough, you wanna be truly traditional? Well, we're actually descended from hunter-gatherers who were mobile and wandered the world, and there weren't borders and so on. They kind of went where they want, right? And, you know, people have, you know, had done historical reconstructions of like skeletons and, and stuff like that. And uh, many folks report that the transition to agriculture and being sessile um, resulted in, you know, diminution of height. You know, people had like tooth decay and stuff like that. The skeletons, they, people had traded off upside for stability, right? That's what the state was. That was what these sessile kinds of things were. Now, of course, um, they, they had more likelihood of living uh, consistently, you could support larger population sizes, but it had lower quality of life, right? And so the hunter-gatherer era, you know, maybe that's our, actually our collective recollection of a Garden of Eden where people, you know, just like a, a spider kind of knows in innately how to build webs or a beaver knows how to build dams. You know, some people theorize that uh, the entire Garden of Eden is like um, a sort of built-in neural network recollection of this, you know, pre sessile era where we're able to roam around, just pick off fruits and so on, low population density. So point is that for the, uh, yeah, you, the chatbot emulation isn't fully working there. Yeah, right? yeah, glitch. That's where in the, in the beta. And let me say, say one other thing about this, which is the most American thing in the world is going and you know, leaving your country in, in search of a better life. America was founded 200 years ago by the founding fathers. It's not just a nation of immigrants, it's a nation of emigrants, right? Emig emigration, you know, from other countries to the U.S. and actually also emigration within the U.S. There's this amazing YouTube video called, um, it's like 50 states, U.S. population, I think 1790 to, it says 2050, so they've got a simulation. So you just stop it at 2019 or 2020. But it shows that like Virginia was like number one early on, and then it lost ground and like New York gained. Mm -hmm. And then like Ohio was a big deal in the early 1800s. And it was like father of presidents and general these presidents and later Illinois and Indiana. And then California only really came up in the, the 20th century, like during the Great Depression. And now we're entering the modern era where like Florida and Texas have risen and New York and California have dropped. Mm -hmm. And so interstate competition, it's actually just like... In ready for V3, that we're just actually uh, trying to figure out the V2 thing. You're trying to like mm. skip. When are we ever ready? Now again, we'll go back to marriage, I think, yeah. uh, and, and having kids kind of thing. I think everyone who has kids is never really ready to be kids. That's the whole point, you dive in. Okay, but the, 
I mean, you you mentioned that you can launch. Is there other criticisms of government that you can provide as we know it today? Before we sure. kind of so, outline the ideas of of V three, let's I'll, stick I'll, to V two. I'll give a few, right? And so a lot of this stuff will go into the version. So I've got you know this book, The Network State, um, which which covers some of these topics. Does Network State have a subtitle? Um, it, it is uh, the Network State: How to Start a New Country. How to start a new country. And, but um, I just have it at the networkstate.com. I should say yeah. it's an excellent book that you should get. I read it on Kindle, but there's also a website. And uh, Balaji said that is constantly working on improving it, changing it. By, 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 the, by the time the whole project is over, it'll be a different book than it was yeah. in the beginning. I think it's so. It's always and shedding its old skin. Well, I, I wanted to get something out there and get feedback and, and whatnot, just like an app, right? You know, you again, you have these two poles of an app is highly dynamic and you're you're accustomed to having updates all the time and a book is supposed to be static. And there's a value in something static, something unchanged and, and, and so on. But in this case, I'm glad I kind of shipped a version 1.0 and, uh, you know, the, the next version, um, you know, I'm going to split into like uh, tentatively motivation theory and practice like motivation like what is the sort of political philosophy and so on that motivates me at least to do this which you can take or leave right and then theory as to why network state is now possible and i can define it in a second and then the practice is zillions of practical details and everything from roads to diplomatic recognition and so on um funding founding all that stuff a lot of the stuff actually i left out of v1 simply because i wanted to kind of get the desirability of it on the table and then talk about the the feasibility. And I should actually linger on that briefly in, in terms of things we can revolutionize. Like um, one of the biggest innovations I think that Tesla does with the way they think about the car, the way they deploy the car is not the automation or the electric. To me, it's the uh, over the air updates. Mm -hmm. Right. Be able to send instantaneously uh, updates to the software that completely changes the behavior, the UX, everything about the car. And so I do think it would be interesting because books are a representation of human knowledge, a, um, a snapshot of human knowledge. Such that it makes sense for the subscription. And that, that means your book isn't just a snapshot, but it's a lifelong project. Right. If so you care enough about the book. So I think there's a lot that can be done there because actually in going through this process, in many ways, the most traditional thing I did was a self-published ebook on Kindle, mm -hmm. right? Uh, why? Because basically like, you know, if you actually ink a deal with a book publisher, first they, you know, they'll give you some advance. I, I didn't need the advance or anything. But second is it's all these constraints. Um, oh, you know, you want to translate into this, or you want to do this other format, or you want to update it, you have to go and now talk to this other party, right? You know, and uh, also the, the narrowing window of what they'll actually publish, it gets narrower and narrower. You see all these, you know, meltdowns over young adult novels and stuff on Twitter, but it's, it's, it's more than that. So, you know, actually having an Amazon page, it's just like a marker that a book exists, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, now I've got an entry point where if someone says, okay, I like this tweet, but how do I kind of get the, um, that, that might be a, a concept from like the middle of chapter three, right? How do I get the thing from front to back? I can just point them at the networkstate.com. That is import this, right? This one entry point, okay? And um, you mentioned like subscription and, and, and money and so on and so forth. And I think people are paying for content online now with newsletters and so on. But I've chosen to, and I will always have the thing free, um, and I want it on, or you can get the Kindle version on Amazon simply because they, you have to kind of set a price for that. But the networkstate.com, what I want to do is have that optimized for every Android phone. So people in India or Latin America or Nigeria can just tap and open it. Going to do translations and stuff like that. Uh, Greg Fodor of Allspace VR, you know, founder of Allspace VR, you know, he, he sold that and uh, he coded the website and, um, you know, worked with him on it. And there's another designer who, um, Elijah, and uh, it's basically just a three-person group. And we thought we had something pretty nice. But one thing I was really uh, 
pleasantly surprised by is how many people got in touch with us afterwards and asked us if we could open source the software to create this this website, right? Because it's actually, you, you can try it on mobile. I think it's actually, um, in some ways, a better experience than Kindle. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was interesting because um, I do think of the website as like a V1 version of uh, this concept of a book app, right? For example, imagine if you have the Bible and the Ten Commandments aren't just text, but there's like a checklist and there's a gateway to a Christian community there. And, um, you know, the practice is embedded into the thing, you know? Like, if, if, you know brilliant.org? Mm -hmm. Amazing site, I love this site. Brilliant is basically mobile-friendly tutorials, and you can kind of just swipe through, you know, you're in line at Starbucks or, you know, getting on a plane or something. You just swipe through and just get really nice micro lessons on things, mm -hmm. and it's just interactive enough that your brain is working and you're problem solving. And uh, sometimes you'll need a little pen and paper, but that format, um, of sort of very mobile friendly, just continuous learning. I, I, I'd like to do a lot more with that. And so that's kind of where we're going to go with the, the book app. So the, the, there's a lot of fun stuff about the sure. way you did at least V1 of the book, which is you have like a one sentence summary, one paragraph summary, TLDR, and like one image summary, which yeah. is, um, I think honestly, it's not even about a short attention span. It's a really good exercise about summarization, condensation, and yes. really like helping you think through what is the key insight. Like we mentioned, the the prime number maze that reveals something central to the human condition, which is struggling against the limitation of our of our minds. And in that same way, you summarize the network state in the book. So let, let, let's actually jump right there. And let me ask you, what is the network state? What is the network state? So I'll give it a sentence and also give it an image, right? So the informal sentence. Why would they do that? They're a, they're a guild of electrical engineers. They're a guild of graphic designers. And you've got a thousand people in this guild. And every day somebody is asking a favor from the guild and the other 999 people are helping them out. You, you, you don't have a highly aligned online community unless you have a thousand people and you paste in a tweet and a thousand of them RT it or, or like it, mm -hmm. okay? If you can't even get that, you don't have something. If you do have that, you have the basis for at least collective digital action on something, okay? And you can think of this as a group of activists. You can think of it as, for example, let's say I mentioned a guild, but let's say they're a group that wants to raise awareness of the fact that life extension is possible, right? Every day there's a new um, tweet on, I don't know, whether it's uh, Metformin research or Sinclair's work or David Sinclair, right? Andrew Huberman has good <laughs> that, That's pretty good, right? That's solid. You've got something there. You've got you've got a laser, right? You've got something which you can focus on. It's meant to be, you know. We're some of them look delicious. Some of them look delicious. Novelty. We can overconsume novelty, right? So you know, what we were talking about earlier the balance between tradition and innovation, right? Here is a different version of that, which is um, entropy going in a ton of different directions due to novelty versus uh like focus you know it's like it's like heat versus work you know heat is entropic and work force along a distance you're going in a, in a direction right and so if those 30 links on you know the next version of hacker news or red or something like so brilliant it's just that's leveling you up the the 30 things you click you've just gained a skill as a function of that right so these kinds of online communities i don't know what they look like they probably don't look like the current social media they, they just like, for example, I know this is a meta analogy, but in the 2000s, people thought Facebook for work would look like Facebook. And, you know, David Sachs, you know, found and sold a company, Yammer, that was partially on that basis. It was, it was fine. It was a billion dollar company. But Facebook for work tended, w was actually Slack, right? Mm -hmm. It looked different. It was more chat focused. It was less image focused and whatnot. What does the platform for a highly aligned online community look like? I think Discord is the transitional state, but it's not the end state. Discord is sort of chatty, 
the work isn't done in Discord itself, right? The cryptocurrency for tracking or the crypto karma for sort of tracking people's contributions is not really done in Discord itself. Discord was not built for that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what that UX looks like. Maybe it looks like tasks, uh, you know, like uh, maybe, maybe it looks uh, something different. Okay. So wait, 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 wait. Let, let me linger on this. So sure. you're actually, uh, there's some people might not be even familiar with Discord or Slack or so on. Mm -hmm. Even these platforms have like communities associated with them. Yes. Meaning, meaning the the big the, like the meta community of people who are aware of the feature set and that you can do a thing that this is a thing and then you could do a thing with it discord like when i first realized that i think it was born out of the gaming world yes is like holy shit this is like a thing there's a lot of of um you know, the uh, the commons, which is like the lunchroom or the gathering area, then everybody else has a cave on the border they can kind of retreat to. Cave in the commons. I love it. By the way, I was laughing internally about the heat versus work. I think that's going to stick with me. That's such an interesting way to see Twitter. Yeah. Like, is this heat or is this, is this thread? Like, because there's a lot of stuff going on. Right. Is it just heat or are we doing some like, is, it, is there a directed thing that's exactly. going to be productive at the end of the day? That's right. I love this. I'll never see different. I mean, anyway, the cave in the commons is a, is a really nice. Uh, so that has to do with the layout of an office that's yeah, effective. That's right. And uh, so you can think of many kinds of social networks um, as being on the cave and commons continuum. For example, Twitter is just all commons. The caves are just like individual DMs or DM threads or whatever, but it's really basically just one gigantic global public fight club for the most part, right? Then you have- Or love club. Well, somewhat love, but mostly fight. Or actually it's- I love aggressively, that's all. Yeah, I mean, the, the way I think, I mean, Twitter is like a cross between, uh, you know, a, a library and a civil war. Of its- the commons structure of it, it's a mechanism for virality of anything. Yeah. So you just describe the kind of things that become viral. Yeah. Meaning no, no offense to librarians. It's like a library and Liberia. Liberia was racked by civil war for, for many years. Right. It's, um, uh, libraries is one of my favorite sets, uh, for porn. Just kidding. Jokes. I'm learning as that's probably crossing the line. Uh, for the engineers working on this humor module, maybe take that down. Yeah. Watch. Um. Gosh. Uh. We're just talking about. Oh yeah. So uh, continue. Uh, Go ahead. Continue. Twitter's right? a commons. Yeah. So Twitter's a commons. Then Facebook is like it's got all these warrens and stuff. Facebook it's very difficult to reason about, uh, like privacy on that. And the reason is I think it's easy to understand when something is completely public, like Twitter, or completely private, like Signal. And those are the only two modes I think in which one can really operate. When something is quasi-private, like Facebook, you have to just kind of assume it's public because if if it's interesting enough, it'll go outside your friend network and it'll get screenshotted or whatever and posted. And so, you know, Facebook is sort of, sort of forced into default public despite its privacy settings. Uh, you know, for anybody who says something interesting, uh, you know, if it's like, uh, you, you can figure out all their dials and stuff like that, but just hard to understand unless it's, totally private or totally public, right? You have to basically treat it if it's totally public, if it's not totally private, okay. At least under a real name, I'll come back to pseudonym. So you've got Twitter, that's that's total commons. Facebook, which is like a Warrens, you know, it's like, you know, it's like rabbit Warrens or like a ant colony where you don't know where information is traveling. Then you've got Reddit, which has sort of your global Reddit and then all the subreddits. That's a different model of cave and commons. I think one of the reasons it works is that you have individual moderators where something is totally off topic and acceptable, uh, totally off topic and unacceptable in this subreddit and totally on topic and acceptable in another. That's like kind of a, you know, a precursor of the digital societies I think that we're going to see that actually are become physical societies, like lots and lots of subreddit like things, you know, uh, become physical societies. Then you start going further into like Discord where it's, it's more full featured than, um, you know, as, as you go Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, now you jump into Discord and Discord is 
a bunch of individual communities that are connected and you can easily sort of jump between them, right? And then you have Slack and, you know, yes, you can use um, Slack to go between different company Slacks, but Slack historically, at least, I'm not sure what their current policy is, historically they discourage public Slacks. So there, it's mostly like, you have your main Slack for your company, and then you sometimes may jump into like, a, let's say you've got a design consultant or somebody like that. You'll jump into their Slack. But yeah. Discord is, you've got way more Discords usually that you jump into than than Slacks, right? Okay. Well, yeah, and let me ask you then on that point, because there is a culture, one of the things I discovered on Reddit and Discord of anonymity or pseudonyms or usernames yes. that don't represent the actual name. On Slack is an example of one. Because I think I did a, I used to have a Slack for like deep learning course that I was teaching and that was like a very large, like 20,000 people, whatever. But so you could grow quite large, but there was a culture of like, I'm going to represent my actual identity, my actual name. And That's then right. the same stuff in Discord. I think I was the only asshole using my actual name on there. Hmm. It's like everybody was using uh, pseudonyms. So what's what's the role of that in the online community? Well, so I actually gave a talk on this a few years ago called uh, The Pseudonymous Economy, okay? And um, it's come about faster than I expected, uh, but I did think it was going to come about fairly fast. And essentially the concept is obviously we've had, so first, anonym, pseudonym, real name, right? Can you describe the difference between difference. that? Anonymous is like 4chan, uh, where there's no tracking of a name, You're, you know, there's zero reputation associated with an identity, Right. Pseudonymous is like much of Reddit, where there's a persistent username, and it has karma over time, but it's not linked to a the global identifier that is your state name, all right? Mm -hmm. So your quote, real name, even the term real name, by the way, is a misnomer, because it's like your social security name, like social security number. It's your official government name. It's your it's your state name. It is the tracking device. It's a It's an air tag that's put on you. Right? Why do I say that? Right? Another word for a name is a handle, and so just visualize like a giant file cabinet. There's a handle with Lex Freeman on it that anybody, the billions of people around the world, can go up to, and they can pull this file on you out. Images of you, things you said, like billions of people can stalk billions of other people now. That's a very new thing, and I actually think this will be a transitional era in like human history, we're actually going to go back into a much more encrypted world. And okay, 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 let me linger on that because sure. uh, another way to see real names is the label on a thing that can be canceled. Yes, that's right. In fact, there's a book called Seeing Like a State, which actually talks about the origins of surnames and whatnot. Like if you have a guy who is that guy with brown hair, that's like an analog identifier. It could mean 10 different people in a village. Mm -hmm. But if you have a first name, last name, okay, that guy can now be conscripted. You can go down with a list, a list of digital identifiers, pull that guy out, pull him you know, into the military for conscription, okay. right? So that was like one of the purposes of names was to make masses of humans legible to a state, mm -hmm. right? Hence seeing like a state, you can see them now, right? See, digital identifiers, like one thing that people don't usually think about is, Pseudonymity is itself a form of decentralization. So, you know, people know Satoshi Nakamoto was pseudonymous. He also knew he's into decentralization. But one way of thinking about it is, let's say his real name, okay, or his state name is a node, okay, attached there, right? You can't just go, you can't log into USA.gov and backspace your name and change it. Moreover, um, your birth certificate, all these stuff that's fixed and immutable, right? Whereas you would take for granted that on every site you go to, you can backspace, you can be like, call me Ishmael, you know, walk into a site, you use whatever name you want. You decide to use the same name across multiple sites, you can do that. And if not, you don't have to. One thing that we're seeing now actually is at the level of kids, you know, the younger generation, um, Eric Schmidt several years ago mentioned that, you know, people would like change their names when they became adults so that they could do that. This is kind of already happening. People are using, I've remarked on this many years ago, search resistant identities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why? They have their Finsta, which is their quote, fake name Instagram and Rinsta, which is their real name Instagram. Oh, this is cool. Okay. And what's interesting is on their Rinsta, they're their fake self because they're in their Sunday best 
and you know smiling and this is the one that's meant to be search indexed right mm -hmm. on the finsta with their fake name this is just shared with their closest friends they're their real self and they're you know hanging out at parties or whatever you know and so this way they've got something which is the public persona and the private persona right the public persona that's search indexed and the private persona that is private for friends right and so organically people are, you know, like Gene Jacobs, she talks about like cities and how, you know, they're organic and, and whatnot. Like uh, some of the mid 20th century guys, the architecture they had removed shade from, uh, you know, like, like awnings and stuff like that got removed. So this is like the restoration of like awnings and shade and structure so that you're not always exposed to the all seeing web crawler that I have Sauron, which is like Google bot just indexing everything. These are search resistant identities and that like I just sort of passes over you, like, you know, in the Terminator, like in the Terminator, I just kind of passes over you, right? So search resistant identity is not pulled up, it's not indexed, right? And now you can be your real self. And so we've had this kind of thing for a while with communication. The new thing is that cryptocurrency has allowed us to do it for transaction, hence the pseudonymous economy, right? And um, you should go from anonymous, pseudonymous, real name. These each have their different purposes. But the new concept is that pseudonym, you can have multiple of them, by the way. Your, your ENS name, you could have it under your, quote, real name or state name, like lexfriedman.eth, but you could also be uh, punk6529.eth, okay? Mm -hmm. And now you can earn, you can sign documents, you can boot up stuff, you can have a persistent identity here okay, which has a level of indirection to your real name. Why is that very helpful? Because now it's harder to both discriminate against you and cancel you. Concerns of various factions are actually obviated or at least partially addressed by going pseudonymous as default, right? It is the opposite of bring your whole self to work. It's bring only your necessary self to work, right? Only show those credentials that you need, right? Now, of course, you know, anybody who's in cryptocurrency understands Satoshi Nakamoto and so on is for this. But actually, many progressives are for this as well. Why? You don't ban the boxes. It's like you're not supposed to ask about like felony convictions when somebody is, you know, being hired because they've paid, they've served their time, right? Or um, you're not supposed to ask about immigration status or marital status in an interview. Um, and, uh, you know, people have this concept of blind auditions where, you know, uh, if a woman is auditioning for for a, uh, like a violin seat, they put it behind a curtain so they can't downgrade. You know, and you put it together and you say, okay, let's use pseudonyms. That actually takes unconscious bias even off the table, right? Because um, now you have genuine global equality of opportunity. Moreover, you have all these people, billions of people around the world that might speak with accents but they type without them. And now if they're pseudonymous, you aren't discriminating against them, right? Moreover, with AI, very soon, the AI version of Zoom, you'll be able to be whoever you wanna be and speak in whatever voice you wanna speak in, right? And um, you'll be, and that'll happen in real time. Uh, so, I mean, this is really interesting. With, I, for Finsta and Rinsta, there's some sense in which the fake Instagram you're saying is where you could be a real self. Well, my question is under uh, under a pseudonym or when you're completely anonymous, is there some sense where you're not actually being your real self? That as a social entity, the, the, it is human beings are fundamentally social creatures. Mm -hmm. And for us to be social creatures, there is some sense in which we have to have a consistent identity that can be canceled, that can be criticized uh, or applauded in society. And right. that identity persists through time. So is there some sense in which we would not be our full beautiful human selves unless we have a lifelong consistent real name att attached to us in a digital world. So this is a complicated topic, but let me make a few remarks. First is real names, quote unquote, state names were not built for the internet. They were actually names. state names, right? It's actually a great way of thinking about it, social security name, right? Yeah. Um, so your state name, 
your official name, was not built for the internet. Why? They give both too much information and too little. Okay. So too much information because uh, someone with your name can find out all kinds of stuff about you. Like, for example, um, if someone doesn't want to be stalked, right? The real name is out there. Their stalker knows it. They can find address information, all this other kind of stuff, right? Um, stone cops, right? Why? They, they slurp up all the information and then they can't secure it. So it leaks out the back door. Okay, they've they basically have you know 100 million records of all this very 300 million records of all this very sensitive data. They just get owned, hacked over and over again, right? And so really, there should be something which just totally inverts the entire concept of KYC and what have you. Um, and of course, comply with the regulations as they are currently written. But also, you should argue privacy over KYC. The government should not be able to collect what it can't secure. It's slurping. Up can just run this stuff and find, you know, oh, okay, so that guy who's got that net worth online and he merges various databases, they've got a bunch of addresses to go and hit, okay? So in that sense, real names were not, state names were not built for the internet. They just give up too much information. In, in our... Yes, okay. First, if you've got a uh, let's like streaming.eth, what can you do with that? Um, some you can do today, some you'll soon be able to do. Uh, you can pay Lexroom.eth, you can message Lexroom.eth, you can um, look it up like a social profile, you can send files to it, you can upload and download. Basically, it combines aspects of an email address, um, a, uh, a, a website, a username, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you, you know, eventually I think you'll go from email to phone number to ENS address or something like that as the primary online identifier because this is actually a programmable name, right? Whereas a state name is not. You know, think about it. ENS name is developed for the online world. Now, a reason to say ENS or something like it, you know, somebody at a in a village, they'll their name might be Smith because they were a blacksmith or Potter because they were a Potter, right? And the same way I think your surname, right now for many people it's .eth and that reflects the, the Ethereum community. Your surname online will carry information about you. Like .sol says something different about you. Mm -hmm. .btc says yet something different. I think we're going to have a massive fractionation of this over time. We're still in the very earliest days of our internet civilization, right? Mm -hmm. 100, 200 years from now, those surnames may be as informative as, say, Chen or Friedman or, or Srinivasan in terms of what information they carry. Because the protocol, it's the civilization fundamentally that you're associated with, right? Right, so the, there's some improvements to the real name that you could do in the digital world. But do you think there's value of having... <laughs> well, well, I, 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 I would kidding. like you to, pr to take prevent that me... Sure a person who's clearly bad for society sure, from sure. doing that. Sure, sure. Murder is going to be against the rules in almost every society. And I mean, basically, I mean, people will argue. Likely, yeah. yeah, most likely, right? And um, the reason Except I'm thinking animals. About, well, I'm thinking of like the Aztecs or the Mayas or, you know, something like that. There's various, you know. Contract or a social contract that says that's illegal. Therefore, you're in jail. Therefore, you're deprived of the right to exit. But upon entry into that society, in theory, you would have said, okay, I accept this, quote, social contract, right? Obviously, if I kill somebody, I can't leave, okay? So you've, you've accepted upon crossing the border into there, right? Now, um, as I mentioned, you know, uh, like, what is murder? Like, people will, I mean, there's an obvious answer. But as I said, there's been human sacrifice in some societies. Communism, they kill lots of people. Nazism, they kill lots of people. Unfortunately, there's quite a lot of societies. You know, I wanted to say it's an edge case, but maybe many of the 20th century societies around the world have institutionalized some kind of murder, whether it's the Red Terror, you know, in the Soviet Union, or obviously the Holocaust, or, you know, the Cultural Revolution, or, or Year Zero, and, and so on and so forth, right? So my point there is that who is committing all those murders? It was the state, it was the organization that one is implicitly trusting them to track you, right? And how did they commit those murders? Well, 
how did, how did Lennon, you know, uh, you know, the hanging order, you know, what I'm talking about the hanging order for the Kulaks. Yes. Okay. The famous hanging order, which actually showed they were actually bloodthirsty. The key thing was he said, here's a list of all the quote, rich men, the Kulaks go and kill them. The real names, the state names were what facilitated the murder. Mm -hmm. They didn't prevent the murderers there. Right. So my point is just in the, the ethical weighting of it, it's a two-sided thing, right? You're right that the tracking can, you know, prevent disorganized murders, but the tracking facilitates, unfortunately, organized murders. Lists of undesirables were the prime. More negative than positive. I think it is a, it is like, it's like nuclear energy. Okay. It's, it's, or it's like fire. It is something which, um, you're going to keep having it reform because there's, there's good reasons where you have centralization, decentralization, recentralization, but power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And you just have to be very suspicious of this kind of centralized power. The more trust you give it, often the less trust it, it deserves. It's like a weird feedback loop, right? The more trust, the more it can do, the more it can do, the more bad things it will do. So, okay. <sighs> There is a lot of downside to the state being able to track you. Right. And history teaches us lessons when at a large scale, especially in the 20th century, at the largest of scale, a state can do commit a large amount of murder and suffering. And, and by the way, history isn't over. If you think about what the Chinese are building on this, right, that surveillance state, it's not just tracking your name, it's tracking everything on you. You know, like WeChat is essentially like it, it is all the convenience and none of the freedom. So that's the downside. But don't you, the question is about, is I, I think probably fundamentally about the human na uh, nature of an in individual of how much murder there would be if we can just disappear every time we murder. Well, I at mean, at the individual level. So the issue is basically like, once, once one realizes that the moral trade-off has two poles to it, right? And moreover, that basically centralized organized murder has, I mean, if we add up all the disorganized murder of the 20th century, it's probably significantly less than the organized murder that was, that these states facilitated, right? And probably by, you know, R.J. Rommel has this thing called democide, right? And the thing is, it's so grim, right? Because, you know, it's saying like one, one death is a tragedy, a million is a statistic, right? These are just like just incalculable tragedies that we, we can't even, you know, uh, understand. But, um, you know, nevertheless, engaging with it, like, you know, I don't know, is the ratio 10x? Is it 100x? I wouldn't be surprised if it's 100x. Yeah, right? but have you seen the viciousness, the negativity, the division within online communities that have anonymity? So People that's the thing is basically you. there's also a Scylla and a Charybdis. I'm not... You know, when you when you see what centralization can do, and then you you correct in the direction of decentralization, you can overcorrect with decentralization, and you get anarchy. And this is basically then you want to recentralize, right? And this is the you know uh, I think it's the Romance of the Three Kingdoms: the uh, the empire long united must divide, the empire long divided must unite. That's always the way of it, right? So what's going to happen is we will state certain verbal principles, right, and then. The question is where in state space you are. Are you too centralized? Well, then, okay, you want to decentralize. And are you too decentralized? Then we want to centralize and maybe track more, right? And people will opt into more tracking because they will get something from that tracking, which is a greater degree of societal stability. So, so it's kind of like saying, are we going north or south? And, and the answer is like, what's our destination? Where's our current position in the, in the civilizational state space? Well, my main question, I guess, is... Uh... Does uh, creating a network state escape from the, some of the flaws of human nature? The reason you got no. Nazi Germany is a large-scale resentment uh, with different explanations for that resentment yeah. that ultimately lives in the heart of each individual that made up the entirety of Nazi Germany and had a charismatic leader that was able to channel that resentment into action, into actual policies, into actual political and military movements. 
can't you not have the same kind of thing in digital communities as well? Have you heard the term argumentum ad Hitlerum or like Godwin's law or something like, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's something where if the reference point is Hitler, it's this, it's this thing where a lot of things break down. But I do think, I mean, look, is there any... The states, the states, the states, right, yeah. But that's okay. because Bitcoin and Google are a tiny minority of communities. That's It's like the the icing on the cake of human civilization. Sure. Any, basically, any technology, I mean, like you can use, uh, you can use a hammer to go and hit somebody with it, right? I'm not, I'm not saying every technology is equally destructive or what have you, but you can conceive of, it's kind of like rule 34, but for technology, mm -hmm. right? You, okay, right? You can, you can probably figure out Your some- Your ability to reference brilliant things throughout is quite admirable, yes. But anyway, sorry, rule 34 for technology. Yes. Rule 34, but for abusive technology, you can always come up with a black mirror version of something. And in fact, there is this kind of funny tweet, which is like a sci-fi author. My book, Don't Invent the Torment Nexus, was meant to be a cautionary tale on what you know would happen if society invented the torment nexus. And then it's like... Uh, Tech guys, at long last, we have created the torment nexus, yeah. <laughs> right? And uh, so the thing is that simply describing something, some abuse, uh, unfortunately, um, after the initial shock wears off, people will unconsciously think of it as sort of an attractor in the space, right? It's like, I'll give you some examples, like, uh, you know, Minority Report had the, the gesture thing, right? And the connect was based on that. So it's a dystopian movie, but had this cool kind of thing and people, you know, kind of keyed off it, right? Or, you know, people have said that movies like, um, you know, Full Metal Jacket, that was meant to be, in my uh, my understanding, it was meant to be like an anti-war movie, but lots of, you know, soldiers just love it, you know, despite the fact that the drill sergeant is actually depicted as a bad guy, yeah. right? For the sort of portrayal of that, you know, kind of, kind of environment, right? So I'm just saying it's like giving the vision of like the digital Hitler or whatever is not actually a vision I want to paint. I do think is it is it, everything is it's possible. Obviously, you know, ISIS uses the internet, right? Like, is it? Yeah, I'm not, we're not bringing up Hitler in a shallow argument. We're bringing up Hitler in a long, empathetic, relaxed discussion, which sure, is sure, a different, sure. I understand. Which, I understand. Is, which is where Hitler can live in a right. healthy way. We, so, that there is a there's deep le lessons in Hitler and Nazi Germany as so there is with Stalin. It. Yes. Okay. So, in many ways, uh, you know, and, and this is a very superficial way of talking about it, but this is um, exit is the anti genocide technology, right? Because exit is the route of the politically powerless. Exit is not. People will always say, "Oh, exit is for the rich," or whatever. that's actually not true. Most emigrant, most immigrants equals most emigrants are not rich, they're politically powerless. You can describe exit. The voice versus exit is this interesting dichotomy. Do you try to reform the system or do you exit it and build a new one or find, seek an alternative? And then loyalty modulates this, where if you are a patriot as part of the, the initial part of your conversation, right? Like, you know, uh, are, you, are you a traitor? You know, you're giving up on our great thing or whatever, right? And you know, people will push those buttons to get people to stick. That's like, you know, I, I shouldn't say the bad version. Let's say a common version. It's sometimes good, sometimes bad. Um, then, uh, but then there's the good version, which is, oh, you know, maybe the price is down right now, but you believe in the cause. So even if they're, uh, you know, on paper, you you would rationally exit. You believe in in this thing, and you're going to stick with it. Okay. So loyalty can be, again, good and bad, but it kind of modulates the trade-off between voice and exit. Okay. So given that framework, we can think of uh, a lot of problems in terms of, am I going to use voice or exit or some combination thereof? Because they're not mutually exclusive. It's kind of like, you know, left and right, sometimes you can use both together. I think that one of the biggest things the internet does is it increases microeconomic leverage and therefore increases exit in every respect of life. For example, um, you know, on every phone, you can pick between Lyft and Uber, right? When you're at the store, uh, you see a price on the shelf and you can comparison shop, right? Um, if it's Tinder, you can swipe, right? If it's Twitter, you can click over to the next account. The back button is exit. The, 
the microeconomic leverage, leverage in the sense of alternatives, right? This is like the one of the fundamental things. That Dark mode uh, for USA. But I mean, just your profile. Is there is there like a national profile? I mean, there's like driver's license. Point is that. Think about that. Let me let me think about sort of the analogy of it. So the microeconomic leverage, you can switch apps. Can you switch your experience in, in small ways efficiently? See, of the, the, the civilization of the farmer and soldier, right? But coming back to this, like, one other thing about it is in the 1950s, if a guy on assembly line might literally push the same button for 30 years, okay? Whereas today, you're pushing a different key every second, right? That is, that's like one version of like microeconomic leverage. Another, another version is, you know, in the 1980s, I mean, they didn't have Google Maps, right? So you couldn't just like discover things off the path. People would just essentially do, you know, home to work and work to home and home to work. And a trip had to be planned, right? They were contained within a region of space. Or you do home to school, school to home, home to school. You know, it wasn't like you went and explored the map. Most people didn't. Right? They were highly canalized, okay? Meaning, you know, the, it was just back and forth, back and forth, very routine, just like the push the button, push the button, trapped within this very small piece and also trapped within this large country because it was hard to travel between countries and so on. Again, uh, you know, of course, there were vacations. Of course, there was some degree of news and so on. Your mobility wasn't completely crushed, but it was actually quite low, okay, relatively speaking. Just... The, the, you you were you were trapped in a way that you weren't even really thinking about it, okay? And now that map has opened up. Now you can see the whole map. You can go all over the over your yeah. life, right? How many places on the surface of your You're actually unusual. You might be like a world traveler, or what have you, right? <laughs> but still, even your even your physical mobility yes. is less than your digital mobility, yeah. right? You can just essentially. I mean, the entire concept are like nations and borders and whatnot didn't exist in the hunter gatherer era right because you couldn't um you couldn't build permanent fortifications and, and whatnot even even nations as we currently think of them with like demarcated borders um you needed cartography you needed maps right that stuff didn't exist for a long time you just had a sort of a fuzzy area of we kind of control this territory and these guys are on the other side of the river okay i think uh just to, I don't want to because, digress too much, but yeah. Where it digress away, I think entirety of life on Earth is, is a kind of a digression which creates beauty and complexity as part of the digression. I think your vision of the network state is really powerful and beautiful. I just would want to linger on this yeah, let's talk about it, yeah. real name issue. Yes, real name. Sure. Let, let me just give you some data. Go ahead. A personal anecdotal experience data. There's a reason I only do this podcast in person. There is something lost in the digital space. Oh, sure. But, and I find, now I personally believe to play devil's advocate against the devil's advocate that I'm playing, I personally believe that this is a temporary thing. We will figure out technological solutions to this, but I do find that currently people are much more willing to be on scale cruel to each other online yes. than they are in person. Uh, the only, the way to do that, I just visit Ukraine, went to the front, the way you can have people be cruel to each other in the physical space is through the machinery. Too easily engage in the drug of mockery derision and cruelty yes. when they can hide behind anonymity. I don't know what that says about human nature. I ultimately believe most of us want to be good and have the capacity to do a lot of good, but sometimes it's fun to be shitty, to shit on people, to it's, be cruel. I don't know what weird. that is. It's weird because I think, you know, one of my sayings is just like the internet increases microeconomic leverage, the internet increases variance. For anything that exists before, you have, you know, the zero and 100 versions of it. I'll give some examples and I'll come to this. For example, you go from the 30-minute sitcom to the 30-second clip or the 30-episode Netflix binge, right? You go from 
guy working 95 to uh, the guy who's the, you know, 40 years old and and has failed to launch, hasn't, you know, the ha, doesn't have a job or anything, and the 20-year-old tech billionaire, okay? You go from all kinds of things that were sort of Gaussian or kind of constrained in one location to kind of extreme outcomes on both sides, okay? And uh, applying that here, you are talking about the bad outcome, which I agree does happen, where the internet in some sense makes people have very low empathy between others. But it also is the other extent where people find their mental soulmates across the world, someone who's living in Thailand or in, you know, like Latin America who thinks all the same stuff, just like them. Wow, you never met this person before, right? You get to know them online, you meet in person, it's like, you know, the brains have been communicating for two years, three years, you've been friends, and you see them in person, it's just great, right? So it's actually, it's not just the total lack of empathy, it is frankly far more empathy than you would be able to build usually with an in-person conversation in the 80s or the 90s with someone on their side of the world, because you might not even be able to get a visa to go to their country or not even know they existed. You, how would you be able to find each other and so on and so forth, right? So it, it is kind of both. It is tearing society apart and it's putting it back together, both at the same time. My main concern is this. What I see is that young people are for some reason more willing to engage in the drug of cruelty online under the veil of anonymity. That's what you're and seeing publicly, but you're not seeing the, the private chats. Like there's, there's, it's kind of, it's a, it's a, well, you know, the I, 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 I work for the intelligence agency. Okay. So I'm, <laughs> you see the private chats. I mean, I'm collecting all of your data. Uh, yeah, yes, but you can intuit stuff. And I don't think I'm being very selective. I mean, I, I if you, if you just look at the young Folks, I mean, I am very concerned about the uh, the intellectual, psychological growth of young men and women. So I'm, right? I'm I'm not disagreeing with you on this. I am saying, however, there is a positive there that once we see it, we can try to amplify that. Yes, that with technology. Me. Yes, yes. That's but right. I'm just saying the very, very basic technology. I give stuff I I code up over the weekend, kind of thing. I think. If I throw anonymity on top of that, it will lead to uh, many bad outcomes for young people. Anonymity, yes. Pseudonymity, maybe not, because Reddit is actually maybe fairly not. polite, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> the entirety of Reddit just chuckled as you said that. Well, well, within a, within a subreddit, it's actually fairly polite. Like they say, you, you're not usually seeing. Uh, it depends on which subreddit, of course. There's a consistency. There's a right. The, uh, the I think definition of politeness is interesting here because it's polite within the culture of that subreddit. Yes, they abide by. Let me put it a different way. They abide by the social norms of that subreddit. Right, and that's the definition of politeness. Yeah, well, or civility is like right. So there is an interesting difference between pseudonymous and anonymous. You're saying it's possible that pseudonymity, you can actually avoid some of the neg negative aspects. Absolutely. We're re Dunbarizing the world in some ways. Okay. With China being the big exception or outlier, you know, the Dunbar number, 150 people, if you know that that's like roughly the scale of your society, mm -hmm. right? Um, well, th that's the number of people that a human can kind of keep in in their brain. That's you know whether apocryphal or not. I think I think it's probably roughly true. And uh, we're re Dunbarizing the world because a we're making small groups much more productive, and b we're making large groups much more fractious. Mm -hmm. Right. So you have an individual like Notch who can program Minecraft by himself, or Satoshi who could do V one of Bitcoin by himself, or you know, Instagram, which is just like 10 people or WhatsApp, which is like 50 people when they sold. Um, but on the other hand, you have huge quote, countries of hundreds of millions of people that are just finding that the first and second principle or the, the you know, they're just splitting on principal components, you know, what Scott Alexander thinks of them as scissor statements, you know, the statements that one group thinks is obviously true, one group thinks is obviously false. You can think of them as, as political polarization. You can think of it in terms of game theory. There's lots of different reasons you can give for why this happens. But those large groups now are getting split. And so you have both the unsustainability of these large sort of artificial groups 
and the productivity of these small organic ones. Mm -hmm. And so that is kind of, it's like sort of obvious that's the direction of civilizational rebirth. We just need to kind of lean into that. So there's, statements. there's so many beautiful, just like, um, you know, we mentioned chocolates right. that are advertising themselves. Your entirety of speech is an intellectual like box of chocolates, but okay. So I don't think we finished defining the network state. Let's like linger on the, the definition. You gave the one sentence statement, which I think essentially encapsulated the online nature of it. I forget what else. Uh, can we just try to bring more uh, richness to this definition Absolutely. of how you think about the network state? Absolutely. So that informal sentence is, a network state is a highly aligned online community with a capacity for collective action that crowdfunds territory around the world and eventually gains diplomatic recognition from pre-existing states. So we talked about was the alignment of online communities and the capacity for collective action. Yep. Well, one collective action, it could be a thousand people liking a, a tweet, right? If you can get a thousand of a thousand people doing it. But a much higher level, much higher bar is a thousand people crowdfunding territory and actually living together, just like people currently- In physical space. In physical space. And not all in one place. That's critical. Just like Bitcoin is a decentralized currency, the network is a recipe for a decentralized state-like entity, okay? Where it starts with, um, you know, for example, two people just get- you know, they become roommates. They meet in this community. They become roommates. Okay, they get a, they a place together. Or ten people get a group house. Or eventually, a hundred people just buy a small apartment building together. And guess what? They start getting equity, not just paying rent. Okay, these are all people who share their values, and now they can crowdfund territory together. Now, of course, they don't just jump straight from a thousand people liking something to a thousand people crowdfunding something. What I describe in the middle is. You do a lot of meetups. You get to know these other people before you decide to live, you know, to collectively with them. But once you live with them, you start to get a network effect. For example, if those hundred people want to learn Spanish or Turkish or Vietnamese, they could all have a building where they're doing Vietnamese immersion, right? And that's something which they get a benefit from being physically around the other people that the pure digital wouldn't give them to quite the same extent, right? Um, and so crowdfunds territory around the world, crucially, not just one place, they're all connected by the internet, just like Hawaii is 2000 miles away from the continental U S but both sides think of them as American, but the people on Hawaii and people in the continental U S what's the role of having to have territory Why? if most of the exchange. So presumably as technology gets <laughs> Just like take a trend. Why is it not a cult? It's not a cult because a cult is very internally focused and it's it, it tries to close its members off from the outside world. This is much more how America itself was populated, where there were lots of towns, like Penn is named after William Penn, or the founder of Texas, like Sam Houston, right? Lots of towns like the Oneida Commune in in you know northern New York, they recruited and they became a town and they became actually the Oneida um glassware company kind of, you know, makes makes glassware out of there. All of these communities that were opt-in voluntary communities were not simply like cults that were closed off from the world. They were meant to set an example to the world of what virtuous living looked like. And they were trying to recruit from the rest of the world. They were exporting goods to the rest of the world, right? So it is, um, it's, yes, reproduction, it's, you know, marriage and kids and so on, but it's also just hanging out. And it is just, the physical world is very high bandwidth. There's lots of stuff. You know, it's fun to just go and have a dinner in person, just to hang out, to build things. Moreover, there's also lots of innovation that can only take place in the physical world. Um, you know, look, I'm, you know, one of my sayings in the book is cloud first, land last, but not land never. Yeah. Okay. In many ways, what one of the problems the book solves is Teal's problem of, you know, we have innovation in bits, but not in atoms, right? We can build a billion dollar company online, but we need a billion permits to build a shed in San Francisco, mm -hmm. right? How do you reconcile that? Well, what is stopping the innovation in atoms? It is a thicket of regulations. What are those regulations? Ultimately a social construction. If you lean into the, you know, whole deconstructionist, you know, school of thinking, you can deconstruct and then reconstruct the state itself given sufficient social consensus online. Okay. If, 
the population of Nevada had 100% consensus. You could just dissolve every law in Nevada in theory and then build new ones. Okay. So the online consensus of getting people to agree on something is upstream of what happens offline. So once you have consensus in bits, the con human consensus, also, you know, cryptographic consensus, cryptocurrency consensus, then you can reshape the world of atoms. The reason we can't reshape the world of atoms right now is because you don't have that consensus of minds, okay? For example, in SF, anything you do, there's going to be 50% of people who are against you. Like, so you, that's just a recipe for gridlock. Whereas if you have a bare piece of land that everybody agrees on, you can get, you know, 70,000 units get set up in Burning Man in just a few days, okay? That's the power of what when you actually have human consensus. And one way I talk about this also in the book a little bit, and this I'm going to go much more into detail in the V2, I think of this as 100% democracy as opposed to 51% democracy. 51% democracy, which is the current form of government, is 49% dictatorship. Because the entire premise of democracy is about the consent of the governed, right? That's actual legitimating underpinning principle. And, uh, Insofar as 49% did not consent to the current, you know, president or prime minister or whatever, um, let's say presidential system first past the post, okay. Um, insofar as 49% did not consent or in a, in a prime minister system, it could be like 60% or more didn't consent to the current leader. Mm -hmm. Those folks are having something imposed on them that they did, literally did not vote for. And that's how you get the seesaw that is just splitting countries apart, right? The alternative to that is you build a consensus online, you go and get some godforsaken patch of territory. Actually, the, the worse the territory, the better. Why? Because it's like Burning Man. Nobody cares, right? The nicer the piece of land, the more the people are going to argue about it. But Starlink has repressed the world. Basically, all kinds of pieces of territory that were previously, you know, they're far away from natural ports, they're far away from natural resources, all kinds of pieces of territory around the world now have satellite internet. And so what you can do is, again, the map has been reopened, right? Like we were talking about earlier, the map has been reopened, you can gather your community online, they're now capable of collective action, you can point here, this place has great Starlink co coverage, you go there like the Verizon guy, you know, can you hear me now? Good, right? You see that the coverage is good there, you drive out there, you test it out, Maybe you do it with mobile homes first, right? Um, this, by the way, is its own thing. There's Yimby and there's there's NIMBY and there's Yimby, but I actually also like Himby, okay? Mm -hmm. Do you know that? Let's go. NIMBY, Yimby, Himby. What are those? So NIMBY is not in my backyard. Don't build in cities. Yimby is let's build high-density buildings, really tall buildings, and so on in cities. There's a third version, which uh, is Himby. Uh, it's my little coinage, which is horizontal sprawl is good. Mm -hmm. Why horizontal sprawl? Because to build a skyscraper, to build a tall building in a city, you have this enormous permitting process, all of this stuff which has to get done. It's expensive. It's time consuming. The way that cities were built, if you go back to the V1, what does the startup city look like? It looks like something like Burning Man. It looks like the cities of the Wild West. They were not multi-story buildings, right? They were basically things that were just like one story and someone could have it there in the dust, and then you build roads and stuff between them, and they can move them around. It was a much more dynamic geography. The last bit is uh, eventually gains diplomatic recognition from pre-existing states. And this is the part that people, you know, different people will be with me up to this point, and then they'll say, okay, that's a part I disagree with, or how are you gonna ever do that, right? They'll say, yeah, you can build an online community. I believe you can get them to do collective action. And of course, People have crowdfunded land and moved it together. You're doing it at a larger scale. All that I believe, how are you possibly ever going to gain diplomatic recognition from pre-existing states? You dumb delusional tech bro, right? That's okay. a you know, common thing. Okay. That, that's about the tone of it as well, right? Mm -hmm. And so first I would say uh, sovereigns are already out for business. They're, they're inking deals, okay? Uh, Nevada inked a deal with Tesla to build the Geiger factory. El Salvador has Bitcoin as its national currency. Wyoming has done the Dow law where Ethereum is now recognized, where you can have on-chain incorporations that are recognized by Wyoming law. Um, Virginia and New York negotiated with Amazon for HQ2. Tuvalu signed a deal with GoDaddy for the .tv domain. Columbia signed a deal 
for the .co domain and on and on and on. Sovereigns are open for business. Sovereigns are doing deals with companies and with currencies. Sovereigns at the level of cities like Miami or New York, where the mayors are accepting their their salary in Bitcoin. Um, states like you know Wyoming or Nevada has its new private cities legislation, or entire countries like El Salvador. So when if, you say sovereigns, by the way, you mean the old school physical nation states, governments, fiat states, fiat states. Okay, and but but the fiat isn't the thing that makes a state. What makes no, it's a just, state is geographical location. It is is something where uh, they're both right. So basically, it's it's a play on words. So just like fiat currency and cryptocurrency, we will have fiat oh, country right, 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 right. and crypto country, right? right? And in fact, you can think of the fiat and crypto version of almost anything. One thing I'll come to later is a big thing. The big thing I think comes after digital currency is digital passports. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and that's a big part of this this whole network state thing, which we can come back to, but. So that last bit, the reason I just mentioned all those deals between sovereigns, whether at the city, U.S. state, or U.N. listed country level, okay, and on the other hand, so there, that's on one side of the market, and the other side are the um, – Aren't you still attached to the responsibilities uh, – that come from being a member of a sovereign, a, 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 a old school nation state. So, can you possibly escape that? So, yes, and let me give you a concrete example: Israel. Okay, why? Um, you know, people talk about. You know, a lot of people are like, "Oh, biology just he took this from Snow Crash or the, some sci-fi book they'll reference." Mm -hmm. Remember, actually, if uh, there's many different references to the book, this is not the only reference, but a very important reference. That I think is much more important to me than Snow Crash, which is which is good, a good book, whatever, but it's fictional, is Der Judenstaat by Theodor Herzl, which translates as the Jewish state, and that led to the foundation of Israel. And that's very real. It's worth reading because it's amazing. Theodor Herzl was like a tech founder, okay? In the book, he was writing about the death of distance in 1897. Why? Because steamships could take you across, you know, countries, okay? And he like it's just, you know, amazingly smart and practical guy where he just handled all these various objections. And he said, look, you know, the Jewish people, you know, our choices are either A, assimilate and give up the culture, or B, some people are thinking communism is a good idea. I disagree with that. We should do C. There were a bunch of intermediate stages between the book and the idea, and then the actual state of Israel in 1947. For example, um, the you know the folks who were committed Zionists got together and started crowdfunding territory in what is now Palestine. And in fact, though, Palestine was only one choice. In the book, they also had Argentina as a choice. So this is my concept, cloud first, land last, and the land's a parameter you can choose, right? Other places that were considered at various points, like Madagascar, Birubidzin in the former Soviet Union, right? So the land was a parameter. Palestine went out because of its, you know, historical religious importance. Now, by the way, one thing I'm sure there's some like some fraction of viewers are gonna be like, oh my God, like all the bad stuff they have. I'm obviously not denying that there's enormous amounts of controversy and so on that attends Israel. I consider myself generally pro-Israeli. I'd also consider myself pro-Palestinian. I fund lots of Palestinians and, and so on and so forth. So I've, I'm leaving that part out, that huge conflict or, you know, for, for now. Okay. And you might say that's airbrushing it. I don't mean it to do that. I'm saying here is the positive things they did. Can we take the positive and not have the negative. And I'll come back to how we, we we might swap those parts out. But let me just talk about this a little bit more. So one of the things that happened was committed Zionists went and crowdfunded territory in what is now Israel. And they knit it together, right? Why? Because when you're physically present on territory, yes, in theory, like the, the British Empire was in control. They were the sovereign, okay? In practice, who are the boots on the ground, the facts on the ground, right? These are the people who are actually tilling the land and building the buildings and, and so on and so forth. It, it, like who had the claim there is like the people who are present. What became Israel. Now, I'm fully aware that the exact 
configuration of what territory belongs to Israel, what territory belongs to Palestinians. This is an enormous topic of dispute, okay? But I just point this out to say the process of going from book to crowdfunding territory to a sovereign state where people were now citizens of Israel, as opposed to the British Empire, is not some fictional thing, but did happen. And within the lifetimes of some of the older, you know, I mean, they're in their 80s now, but in the lifetimes of some older people, okay? So so it's not impossible. In fact, it has happened, right? Okay. But for that step, then perhaps, hopefully, is a better example, because in this particular, like you said, land last, if I were to say that, it was if I was an alien and arrived at Earth and mm -hmm. say choice of land, maybe if you were interested in uh, create choosing a land that represents a network state where ideas that uh, unites a people uh, based on ideas, maybe pick a land that doesn't lead to. Uh, generational conflict and war. Yes, so I'll and, get to that And point. destruction okay. and suffering and all that. Kind all of stuff. stuff. That's right. So, so now that I've said what are, you know, the positive things about Israel, and I think there's a lot to admire in Israel. As I said, I think there's also a lot to admire in the Palestinians and so on. I'm not taking any position on that. There's other inspirations for the network state. The second major inspiration is India, which managed to achieve independence nonviolently, Right. That's very important, right? So can you can you fuse these things, right? A state started with a book that achieved independence nonviolently, okay? And that managed to build this polyglot, you know, multicultural democracy, right? That does, you know, like, you know, India has its flaws, but it does manage to have, you know, human rights of lots of people respected and what have you, right? And um, has managed to, you know, there were times like emergency in the 1970s in the Aragon, the declared emergency. There were times when it seemed touch and go, but overall with fits and starts, this flawed thing has, has kind of made its way through. And, you know, the third inspiration is Singapore with Lee Kuan Yew, who built a city state from nothing. You know, I shouldn't say from nothing. Okay, there was something there, but let's say built one of the richest countries in the world without like huge amounts of natural resources in the middle of a zone where there was lots of communist revolution going on. Um, and so he was the CEO founder essentially of this amazing startup country, right? And, um, you know, finally, of course, America, which has too many influences to name things we talk about, the nation of immigrants, obviously the constitution and so on. And you think, okay, can we go, you think of, uh, you know, these inspirations, what's interesting about these four countries, by the way, Israel, India, Singapore, and the US, they have something in common. You know what that is? Who's that? They're all forks of the UK code base. Hmm. We think, obviously, you know, the UK was sort of the ancestor of America, but Israel was a former British colony, right? The uh, India was a British colony, and so was Singapore, right? And For people who don't know what fork and code base means, it's a uh, language from versioning systems, particularly Git, represented online on a website called GitHub. And a fork means you copy the code and all the changes you make to the code now live in their own little world. So America took the ideas that define the United Kingdom and then forked it by evolving those ideas in a way that didn't affect the original the original country. That's right. And what's interesting about this is, and of course, I'm saying that in a somewhat playful way, right? Mm -hmm. But I think it's a useful analogy, an interesting analogy, right? So you have the Americans who forked, you know, the UK code base, and then you have, you know, the Indians, the Israelis, and the Singaporeans who also made their own modifications. And in some ways, each society has pieces that you can take from them and learn from them and try to combine them, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a state that is started by a book that um, non-violently assembles, that crowdfunds territory around the world, mm -hmm. that um, is led by a CEO founder, um, and uh, that is also governed by something that's like a constitution. But just like you went from, you know, I talk about the V1, V2, and V3 a lot, right? Like V1 is gold and V2 is fiat and V3 is Bitcoin, right? Or V1 is hunter-gatherer and V2 is farmer-soldier. V3 is digital nomad or sovereign collective, okay? Which is not just an individual, but a group. Um, here, V1 is 
UK common law. They don't have a constitution. It's all precedent going for many years, right? V2 is the US constitution and V3 is the smart contract, the social smart contract, which is a you know fusion obviously of Rousseau's concept of the social contract and the smart contract. The social smart contract is like written in code. Europeans, African Americans, all the immigrants to the the you know the Americans or the um, you know North America. Then you go to all the people of the world, and uh, so you you basically are more democratic, and you're more capitalist because you're talking about internet capitalism, not just nation state lock capitalism. In a sense, it's the V three, right? Another way, it's the V three. Only about two percent of the world um, is. Uh, over 35, native-born American can qualify to be president of the United States. But 100% of the world, you could become the president of a network state. There might be a, you know, Palestinian Washington or a, you know, Brazilian Hamilton, right? And now, rather than say, okay, maybe you're, maybe you have a small percentage chance of immigrating to the U.S. and a small percentage chance of your descendant, you know, becoming like, you know, president. Now we can just say, you can start online. And you know what? Maybe this person is so exceptional, they have Americans coming to their, you know, network state, right? You don't think that kind of thing is possible with, like, the rich get richer uh, in a digital space, too? The people with more followers uh, have friends that have followers, and they, like... I don't think it's the rich get richer. I think what happens is... Um, <laughs> is yet another axis, right? You Ethereum, ETH is Ethereum. Right. So you, you are essentially getting new social systems, which are actually net inequality decreasing because before you only had USD millionaires and now you have a new track and then another track and another track, right? You have different hierarchies, different ladders, right? And so on net, you have more ladders to climb and so it's not the rich getting richer. In fact, old money in some ways is a last to cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. um, old money and old states, I think, those people who are the most focused on, you might call it reform, I would call it control, okay? The most focused on control of the old world who have the least incentive to switch, they will. the rich will get poorer because it will be the poor or those who are politically powerless, politically poor, who go and seek out these new states. Yeah, I, I didn't mean in the actual money, but yes, okay, there's other ladders. I meant in, in terms of influence, political and social influence in, the, in these new network states. You, you, I think, said that basically anybody can become president of a network state. Just like anybody can become CEO of a startup company. Of course, whether people follow you is another matter, but anybody can go and found one. Go ahead, sorry. Oh, from the perspective that anyone can found one. Mm -hmm. Anyone could found. I see. We don't think it's implausible that uh, you know somebody from Brazil or Nigeria. I mean, most quote billionaires in the world are not American. And in fact, actually, here's another important point: it's far easier to become a tech billionaire than become or a billionaire period than become president of the United States. There's less than 50 U.S. presidents ever, all time. Mm -hmm. Okay, it is a much more realistic ambition to become a billionaire than to become president. There's like thousands of billionaires worldwide. In fact, 75% of them are outside of the US. And many of those have been, you know, some of them are like energy and oil, which is often based on political connections, but a very large chunk of the rest are tech, okay? And uh, that's something where you're mining, but you're mining online by hitting keys as opposed to with a pickaxe, you know, in granite, right? So the point is that we think it's totally understandable today for there to be, a you know huge founder who comes out of Vietnam or you know uh, South America like that like you can name founders from all over the world right exceptional people can rise from all the world to run giant companies why can they not rise to run giant new countries and the answer is we didn't develop the mechanism yet right um, and just as another example I talk about this in the book Vitalik Buterin is far more qualified than Jerome Powell right? Or anybody at the Federal Reserve. He actually built a car and managed a monetary policy and a currency from scratch, okay? As a 20-something, right? The, obviously, that's a more accomplished person than somebody who just inherited an economy. This is a, a lot of people can push back at that and say, 
that the the people that initially build a thing aren't necessarily the best ones to manage a thing once it scales and actually has impact. Sometimes, sometimes, but Zuck has done a good job of both. I think Vitalik has done a good job of both, right? But that's not an inherent truth. Well, so actually, I have a- If you built the thing, you will be the best person to run it. I will agree with you on that. And actually, I talk about this in the book, uh, or I've got an essay on this called Founding versus Inheriting, okay? And the premise is actually that The classic example, you know the saying shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. It means the guy who starts out poor and builds a fortune, his son maintains it and his dissipate grandson dissipates it, right? Mm. Why is shirt sleeves a symbol of poverty? Well, back in the past, it was kind of like, you know, you're just working with your, you're not, you're not white collar, you're back to working with your hands. You're just, oh, you're so poor. it's a blue collar to blue collar in three generations. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or working class or something working like class, that. Right. Yeah. So essentially that the, the grandson squanders it. Right. And, you know, in sense, by the way, um, just to talk about that for a second, if you have two children and four grandchildren and eight great grandchildren and 16 and so on, and an older family is, you know, they, they were much bigger, right? Six, you know, children is not uncommon. Whatever fortune you have is now split six ways and then six ways and six ways again. So with the exception of primogeniture, where the oldest son inherits all the way down, the majority of your descendants just a few generations out have probably inherited none of that fortune unless it has compounded to such an extent that it's like up 6x over 20 years, right? So it's actually hard to maintain a, quote, ruling class in the sense that this person who's like four generations down has you know, uh, like one sixteenth of the DNA, you know, one over two to the fourth, right? Of their their scion who built a fortune. So it's not even like the same, is, is it the same family even, right? Is the fortune actually in the family? So most people don't think a few generations out, they just kind of think, oh, Marx is right. There's always been a rich and a poor. It's actually much more dynamic than that because you literally like, what is even the family when it's diluted out, you know, one sixteenth, right? Um, if you're 116th the Rockefeller, are you a Rockefeller? Or are you like 15, 16, something else? Would you have the Rockefeller fortune? Probably not, right? Now, are there, again, primogeniture, where the guy who inherits the name all the way through, um, that be, would be one way to pass it down. But even that person doesn't necessarily have the qualities of the guy who, you know, the cultural qualities, other qualities, the guy who's like four generations past, so they tend to squander it, right? So this actually brings us to, you know, coming back up to governance, the system, the, the guys who built the United States, you know, like Washington and Hamilton, these are giants, right? These are founders. And the, the folks today are like, not the, the grandson, but like the 40th generation heir of a factory that somebody else built. Like think about a factory and you have, you know, this grandchild or great grandchild that inherits a factory. Mm-hmm. Most of the time it's just cranking out widgets and the great grandson is cashing checks they have been selected as legitimate heir because it's the, you know, the founder passes it down to his son, passes it down to his grandson, to his great grandson. So legitimacy is there. They've got title. They can show, I own this factory. Okay. They can cash the checks. There's professional managers there. Everything seems fine until one day that factory has to go from making, you know, widgets to making masks for COVID or something else. It has to change direction. It has to do something it hasn't done before. None of that capability for invention and reinvention is present anymore. These people have inherited something that they could not build from scratch. Because they could not build from scratch, they can't even maintain it. This is an important point. The ability to build from scratch is so important because if some part breaks and you don't know why it was there, can you even maintain it? No, you can't. Okay. Unless all the replacement parts and the know-how to fit them together is there, you can't repair this. So in 2009, Mother Jones had a story that said that the U.S. military had forgotten how to make some kinds of nuclear weapons because there was a part where all the guys who knew how to make it had like aged out or left. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this was some like aerogel or something like that. It was was rumored. Okay. Thing is, um, you're, you're seeing, you know, increasingly, for example, you've got, uh, wildfires in California, you've got you know, water that's not potable in Jackson. You've got power outages in Texas. Um, you're seeing a lot of the infrastructure of the U.S. is just less functional. I think probably part of that is due to civil engineering not being that sexy a field, people aging out, and just domain knowledge being lost. And 
the heirs who win, you know, the role of mayor or whatever of this town don't have the ability to build it from scratch. You're just selected for legitimacy, not competence. Okay. So once you think about this concept of founding versus inheriting, and I've got the whole essay which talks about this. Um, of course, the alternative to somebody who's legitimate but not competent, what people will say is, oh, we need like a, you know, an authoritarian to be in control of everything. And then their their hope is that that person is competent, but they don't have legitimacy because if they're just installed as just like a authoritarian ruler, 50% of the population is really mad at them. They don't have title, they just grab the title. You know, maybe they can exert enough force, but that's a problem with kind of the authoritarian, you know, dictator takeover, right? So the alternative, the third version is the founder who combines both legitimacy and competence because they start from scratch and they attract people to their vision and they build it from scratch. And so you need is the ability to constantly do refoundings, rebirths. So if you imagine a world that is primarily network states, can you help me imagine exactly. what that looks like? Now, there's several ways to imagine things, which is how many of them are there and how often do they, the new ones pop up? There could be thousands. Given 7 billion people, 8 billion people on earth. Yeah, yeah. So there's network state in the, like the precise definition I have in the book, which is a diplomatically recognized entity. And there's network state in sort of the loose definition where, you know, one thing that's interesting is this term has become a lowercase term really fast. Okay. No you, state. Yeah. Like in the sense of Google became lowercase Google for like Googling or like Uber yeah. became lowercase Uber. Like if you go to the networkstate.com front slash reviews, or you go to search.twitter.com and put, put in network state, you'll see it's just become like a word or a phrase. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that means it's sort of whatever I intend it to mean, people will use it to mean what they want it yeah, to mean. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Internet. So with, it's Welcome interesting, right? The it's internet. You've become a meme. Well, first of all, you're a meme, and this book is a meme. Am I a meme? Okay, maybe I'm a meme. But the the book is the book is, I think, is a good meme. That's actually why I wanted to make it free. I wanted people to take it out there, make it their own. And one of the things I say at the beginning, and I'll come back to this thing, is uh, it's a toolbox, not a manifesto. Even if you dislike 70% of it, 80% of it, 90% of it, if there's something that's useful to you, you can take that and use it, just like a, like a library, you know, a software library. You might just use one function there. <laughs> Do you have love friends. advice in the book? I didn't. I didn't see it. So, did you talk about love in? The I do not state? talk about love. Right. I, I rather maybe in not, V2 you. Not will. that I don't believe in love. Love is great. All right, I will accept your offer to write a guest chapter in your in your V two book about love. Yeah. All right, great. Um, <laughs> uh, because there is some aspect that's very interesting. Which as, which parts of human civilization require physical contact? Physical. Uh, because it seems like more and more can be done in the digital space. Yeah, but uh, as I said, like we, work, for example. But you're not going to build a self-driving car city in digital space. You're not going to be able to do well, why all you cars at all. Well, you well, so sure, sure, but let's say you're not going to be able to get to Mars in a purely digital thing. You need to build, you know, you have to have a little rocket launch pad. You're not going to be able to uh, do all the innovative biomedicine, whether it's you know all the. Um, you know, have you seen bioelectricity or there's, there's stuff on regenerative medicine, stem cells, all this stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. you, you just can't do that digitally, right? We're still physical beings, you know, so you need physical space, but how do we get that? Right. So that this is, this is meant to wend its way through various roadblocks in the so-called. There's another 50 or 60 something that have between a million and 10 million. Mm -hmm. So most countries in the UN are less than 10 million people. There's only 14 countries that are over 100 million people, okay? So most countries are small countries is kind of surprising to us because most people live in big countries, okay? And uh, so now you're like, okay, well, I've built social networks that are bigger than that. I have, you have a following that's bigger than 100,000 people. You have a following that's bigger than, you know, a small country like Kiribati or, or what have you, right? And, uh, okay, so that, that first changes feasibility. You think of a country as this huge, huge, huge thing, but it's actually smaller than many, many, many countries are smaller than social networks that you've built. Okay, number one. Uh, number two is the number of UN listed countries, um, even though it's been flat-ish for the last 30 years with like, a, you know, a few things like South Sudan and East Timor that, that, have, that have come online. There's a graph that I posted, which shows that it's increased by about, from about 40 or 50 something at the end of, 
uh, World War II um, when the unit was set up to 197 today. There's been like kind of a steady increase in particular with all the decolonization, all the countries that got their independence from first from the British Empire and then from the Soviet Empire, right? That imperial breakup led to new countries, mm -hmm. okay? And so then the question is, is that flat forever? Well, the number of new currencies similarly increased for a while, roughly one per country or thereabouts. And then it was flat for a while. And then suddenly it's gone completely vertical. That's an interesting graph, right? Where it's like linear-ish, then it's flat. Again, at some point. So we know that you can have a currency out of nowhere that ranks with the fiat currencies of the world. Could you have a country out of nowhere that ranks with the countries of the world? So this is this is maybe the, the fastest way, you probably should have said this at the very beginning. If you go to the network state in one image, okay, that kind of summarizes what a network state looks like in a visual, just one single visual. And the visual is of a dashboard. And the dashboard shows something that looks like a social network, except you're visualizing it on the map of the world. And it's got network nodes all over the place, 100 people here, 1,000 people there. They're all connected together. The total population of the people in this social network is about 1 million uh, people. So 1.7 1, 1. million people in this example. And some of the buildings are, some of the people are just singletons. They're just folks in their apartment who can conceptualize themselves as citizens of this network state. And they've got the flag on their wall, right? And the digital passport on their on their uh um, phone along with the digital currency. Others are groups of hundreds or thousands or even tens of thousands of people that have all taken over a neighborhood, just like Chinatowns exist, right? Just like, you know, um, uh, intentional communities existed. Uh, they just basically, you know, go and crowdfund land together, right? And these are all networked together, you know, just like the islands of Indonesia are separated by ocean. These are islands of this network state that are separated by internet. Okay, so they conceptualize themselves as something. And at the very top of the dashboard, there's something very important, which is the population, annual income, and real estate footprint of this network state. So the population we already discussed, you can build an online social network. We know you can build something which has a population that's bigger than these 100,000 or million person countries. One of the new things contributions the network state has is say that you can not just exceed in population, you can exceed it in real estate footprint. Mm -hmm. Because one way of thinking about it is, um, I don't exactly know the numbers on foreign ownership in Estonia, but let's say to first order, the million something Estonians own and could afford Estonia. Mm -hmm. Okay, a million people could buy a territory that is the size of Estonia, right? That's probably true to first order. There might be some overseas ownership, but it's probably true, okay? You probably find a country for which that's true. What that means is a million people digitally could buy distributed territory that is probably greater than or equal to the size of Estonia, yeah. especially if they're buying like desert territory or stuff like that, which means now you have a digital country that is ranking not just in people, not just in real estate. Could be BAI, AIs, proof of human, proof of income, and also proof of real estate start to actually rise dramatically in importance because you're saying we're going to rank this digital state on the leaderboard of the, the fiat states. Okay. And so that means that people will start to, at yeah, first, they'll just laugh at it. Once you start claiming you have 10,000 citizens, people are going to start poking and be like, is that real? Prove that it's real. Okay. So I have a whole talk on this actually I'm giving at this uh, Chainlink conference, but essentially, how do you prove this, right? The short answer is crypto oracles plus auditing. The somewhat longer answer is you put these assertions on chain, these proof of human, um, these proof of real estate, et cetera, assertions on chain, okay? And there's people who are writing to the, to the blockchain and they are digitally signing their assertions. Now, of course, simply just putting something on chain doesn't make it true. It just says you can prove not that the what is written on chain is true, but that the metadata is true. You can show who wrote it via their digital signature, what they wrote, their hash, and when they wrote it, their timestamp. So you can establish those things in metadata of who, what, and when was written. Who's the who? An on-chain receipt that says this 
LexFriedman.eth bought this piece of property from us and it has, you know, like it's a thousand square meters and, and this is put on chain. They sign it. Okay. That's a, that's their digital receipt. Just like you might get an email receipt when you buy a piece of property or something. Okay. It's just put not online, but on chain and it's signed by Blackstone or whatever real estate vendor you, you buy it from. It could be a company. It could obviously be an individual, right? And so you have a bunch of these assertions. You, you Let's say there's 47 different real estate vendors. I know vendors is an atypical term there, but just bear with me, right? 47 different real estate um, sellers that you've bought all of your territory from. Each of them put digital signatures that are asserting that a certain amount of real estate was bought and it's square meters, it's location or whatever else they want to prove. The sum of all that is now your real estate footprint, okay? And now the question is, was that real? Well, because they signed what they put on chain, you can do things like you can audit. Let's say Blackstone has signed 500,000 properties and they've, they've sold them. And, put them. and uh, basically the, the, the accountants that do corporate balance sheet and cash flow and-, and Who keeps them in check? From corruption. I'm just imagining a world full of network states. Yeah, it's a good question. So, you know, at a certain point, you get to who watches the watchers, right? Yeah. And, oh, well, the government is meant to keep the accountants accountable. And, you know, Arthur Anderson actually did have a whole flame out in, you know, the um, around the time of the Enron thing. Um, so it is possible that there's corrupt accountants or bad accountants or what have you. But of course, or the government itself is corrupt in many ways and prints all this money and seizes all these assets and surveils everybody and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, the answer to your question is going to be um, probably exit in the sense that if those accountants, they are themselves going to digitally sign a report and put it on chain. Okay. So they're going to say, we believe that X, Y, and Z's, um, you know, reports are on chain where this reliable and here's our study. If they falsify that, well, if somebody finds that eventually, then that person is downweighted, then you have to go to another accountant, right? Is there ways to mess with this? I mean, I just, let me breathe in and out. As I mentioned, some of the heaviest shit I've ever read. Uh, so because I visited Ukraine, I've read Red Famine by Ann Applebaum, Bloodlands, Yep, and it's just just a lot of coverage of the census. I mean, there's, there's a lot of coverage of a lot of things, but in Ukraine in the 1930s, uh, Stalin messed a lot with the census to hide the fact that sort of a lot of people died from starvation. And did that with the cooperation of Arthur G. Salzberger's New York Times company, like Walter I mean, Duranty yeah. falsified all those reports. There's several parties involved. Is can there be several parties involved? in this case, that manipulate the truth as it, as it is represented by the crypto oracle and as it is checked by the auditing mechanism. It is possible, but the more parties are involved in falsifying something, the more defections there are. So that's why you basically... ...naturally consistent across the world, whereas lies can be found out, even, you know, Siskel Tesla, you know, Benford's Law, uh, yes. Right. It's something where the digits in like a real, um, if you take the last digit or the first, I think it was the last digit or the first digit. I think, I it's, think it's the first. first digit, right? So you take the first digit in, um, an actual financial statement, you look at the distribution of like how many ones and how many twos, how many threes, the percentages. Um, it has actually, a, a, it, you'd, you'd guess it might be, oh, each one will be equally random. It'd be 10%. It's not like that actually. Uh, there's, there's a certain distribution that it has and fake data, um, doesn't look like that. Uh, but Set about 30% will have a leading digit of one. Yeah. So that's a great example of what we were talking about earlier, the observational leading to the theory. Ooh, there's a Benford's law of controversy. I'm looking that up. Benford's law of controversy. Benford's Law of Controversy is an adage from the 1980 novel Timescape stating passion is inversely proportional to the amount of real information available. The adage was quoted in an international drug policy article in peer-reviewed social science. Can I just say how much I love Wikipedia? 
vodë. On political truth, it's like a defamation engine. Um, just as one example, okay? This is something that you know I was going to write up, but there was a scam called HPZ token that managed to edit Wikipedia. Nobody detected it. It said that I was like the founder of HPZ token. That and, you were the founder. Yeah, of HPZ I, had, token. I had nothing to do with this. Yeah. And people were scammed out of it because Google just pushes Wikipedia links to you know high on, or, uh, to high on Google. Like the more trust something gets, the less trustworthy it often becomes. It kind of abuses the power, right? Mm -hmm. So um, what I'm interested in, you know, Google actually had a model a while back called KNOL. KNOL uh, null um, was something where when there were different versions of something versus the thing that just kind of rewards dogged persistence or being an editor or something like that. The other thing is a lot of the folks who have editorial privileges at Wikipedia are there from the early 2000s. And most of India wasn't online then. Most of Africa was. So here's a phenomenon that happens in Wikipedia. You have an editor who has, who's privileged above just With you, not against sure, you. Sure, sure. Okay, I'm saying how many articles have that kind of war where douchebags are manipulating each other? So that's the question. What's the audit? Has Wikipedia actually been audited, right? Yeah, but, Who are the editors? Like, who's actually writing this stuff? It is actually something where, uh, again, on technical topics, I think it's pretty good. On non-technical topics, there's something called uh, the Wikipedia Reliable Sources Policy. It's a fascinating page, okay? So it actually takes a lot of the stuff that we have been, you know, the world has been talking about in terms of what's a reliable source of information and, you know, so on and so forth. It's called the Wikipedia Reliable Sources Perennial Sources, okay? Yeah. And if you go to this page, okay, which I'm just going to send to you now, right? Yeah. You will literally see every media outlet in the world and they're colored gray, green, yellow, or red, Okay. Um, and so red is like untrustworthy, green is trustworthy, yellow is like neutral, okay? Now, this actually makes Wikipedia's epistemology explicit. They are marking a source as trustworthy or untrustworthy. For example, you are not allowed to cite social media on Wikipedia, mm -hmm. which is actually an enormous part of what people are posting. You will, you will, instead, you have to cite a mainstream media outlet that puts the tweets in the mainstream article, and only then can it be cited in Wikipedia. By the way, to push back, this is a sure. dance. We're dead. Sure, 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 of course. Um, that those are rules written on a, on a sheet of paper. I have seen Wikipedia in general play in the gray area that these rules create. Oh, well, if, uh, you, example, if you are an editor, then you can get... But you can use the rules... And you can, because there's there's a lot of contradictions within the mm -hmm. rules, you can use them to, in, in the ways you said, to achieve the ends you want. It really boils down to the incentives, the motivations of the editors. That's right. And one of the magical things about Wikipedia, the positive versus the negative, is that it seems like a very small number of people, same with Stack Overflow, can do uh, an incredible amount of good editing and um, aggregation of good knowledge. Now, as you said, that works, seems to work much better for technical things over which there's not uh, a, a significant division. The, yeah, the, so the, uh, some of that has to do less with the rules and more with, uh, with the human beings involved. Well, but here's the thing is, um, so first, let me take this, I should finish off this point sure, of reliable source, perennial sources, right? So if you go to this, you'll see that Al Jazeera is marked green. Mm -hmm. But let's say uh, the Cato Institute is marked um, yellow, right? The nation is marked oh, green. Oh, shit. Oh, snap. Okay. Why? Okay, sure. Yes. Right? The nation is marked green, but National Review is marked yellow. Okay. You could probably go and do, so what's good about this is it makes the uh, epistemology explicit, right? 
you could actually take this table and you could also look at all the past edit wars and so on over it and take a look at what things are starting to get marked as red or yellow and what things are starting to get marked mm -hmm. as green. And I'm pretty sure you're going to find some kind of partisan polarization that comes out of it, mm -hmm. right? Number one. Uh, number two is once something gets marked as being yellow or red, yeah. then all... on every single article to make Wikipedia align with US mainstream media corporations, yeah. right? I am as often playing devil's advocate uh, to counter a point so that the disagreement reveals some profound wisdom. That's what I'm doing here. Uh, but also in that task here, I'm trying to understand exactly how much harm is created by the bias within the team of editors that we're discussing and how much of wikipedia is technical knowledge for example the russian invasion of ukraine mm -hmm. The Wikipedia article I've seen there, now that changes very aggressively, a lot. And I hear from every side on this, but it did not seem biased to me. Here's it, like, right. as compared to uh, mainstream media in the United States. So now I'm gonna sound extremely woke. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you go and look at this, all right, Times of India is yellow, but Mother Jones, Jacobin, okay, they are green, mm -hmm. right? So a niche, mostly white, Western, like partisan left outlet mm -hmm. is marked green, but a billion people, you know, like the Times of India is marked yellow, right? That's a structural bias towards Western media outlets and Western editors when much of the rest of the world hadn't gone online or whatever. I would just time. love to see, in terms of the actual article, mm -hmm. what ideas are being censored, sure. altered, shifted. Okay. I would love, I just think it's an open, I'm not uh, sort of. Uh, so the edit logs are there, the edit logs are public. Yeah, okay, so here's be, a way. It'd ahead. be fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Is there a way to f explore the way that narratives are shifted because of. Sure. This? So, a very simple one is if you were to pull all the edit logs of Wikipedia, you could see how many times are social. Wikipedia or inconsistently. You think allowed. that's a problem? It's a huge problem. Like you, you can't cite, let's say, Jeff Bezos' own tweet. You have to cite some random media no, corporation. Here's the thing, uh, and sorry, sorry yeah. if I'm interrupting. Please. Uh, hopefully, I'm adding to it. I think, I think they're trying to create friction as to uh, the sources used because if you can use social media, then you can use basically bots to create a bunch of sources, right? And then that you can almost automate the editor war. Right. Like, uh, Here's the thing is basically Wikipedia initially, ref, you know, like said, oh, we'll only cite mainstream media uh, as a way of boosting its credibility in the early 2000s. OK, when its credibility was low. Now it's sort of become merged with the U.S. establishment and it only cites these things whose trust. I mean, have you seen the graphs on trust in mainstream media? Like it's plummeted. It's down to like 10% or something like that, right? So the most trusted sources for Wikipedia are untrusted by the population. Yeah. True. Uh, that that, that fe feels like it's a fixable technological problem. I think I'm under-informed and my gut says we're both together under-informed to do a rigorous three to four hour discussion about Wikipedia. Oh, but hold on a second. Okay. Uh, I, I, I think I have a gut... Uh, sort of developed feeling about which articles not. I did, I would go to maybe sections that don't have room for insertion of bias or like the section on controversy or accusations of racism or so on or uh, sexual assault. I'll usually not 
trust Wikipedia on those sections. Like math, that'll be great, right? Wikipedia is great for that. On many topics that do not have a single consensus truth, it's structurally shifted towards um, basically white Western liberals, woke whites, right? Fundamentally, that's the demographic of the Wikipedia. Editor. What kind of articles do you think are affected by this? Let, let's let's like think about like what everything it, that's not math and t and technology. I think that's too strong a statement. So we can, like I said, uh, war in Ukraine. I, I, I sure. <laughs> um, I think that's too strong a statement. I there's so much affect. I guess I'm saying affected to a large degree. Even his uh, major battles in history, battle of Stalingrad, or sure, like uh, that's not math. So like, you think all of that is affected to a point where it's not a, tr a trusted source? Absolutely. If you look at the edit wars, for example, on Stalin versus Hitler, Hitler's the tone on Hitler starts out legitimately and justifiably as. <laughs> worry about i know you don't mean this but a cynical interpretation of what you're saying which is don't trust anything written on wikipedia i think you're being very consistent and eloquent in the way you're describing the issues of wikipedia and i don't have enough um actual specific examples to give where there is some like still battle for for truth that's happening that's that's outside of the bias of society i just i i think if we naturally distrust every source of information there is a general distrust of institutions and a distrust of sources of knowledge that leads to an apathy and the cynicism about the world in general if you believe uh, if you believe a lot of conspiracy theories, you basically tune out from this collective journey that we're on towards the truth. And that that's that like if um, escape from the from the political battles of ideology. And um as you're quite eloquently describing, it is not it has become part of the battleground of political ideology. I just would love to know where the boundaries of that are. You know, Glenn Greenwald has observed this. Um, lots of other folks, you know, for example, I'm definitely not the only person who's observed that Wikipedia- A lot of, let me just state, because I'm sensing this, sure. and because of your eloquence and clear brilliance here, that a lot of people are going to immediately agree with you. Okay. And this is what I am also troubled by. Not This is not you. Sure, sure. But I often see that people will detect cynicism, especially when it is phrased as eloquent yes. as yours, and will look at a natural dumbass like me and think that Lex is just being naive. Look at him trusting Wikipedia. Let me argue for your the side. mainstream never. Let me argue right. your side. Okay. Can you can you please do that? Because you could do that better than me. <laughs> no, no, no. No, Lex, I enjoy talking to you. And um, I am doing devil's advocate a little sure. bit because I, I do really want to be I am afraid about the forces <laughs> uh, that like are basically editors talk of authority of talking down to people and s censoring information. Yeah. So let me first argue your side and then let me say something, okay, which is what you are reacting to is, oh, even those things I thought of as constants are becoming variables. Where is the terra firma? If we cannot trust anything, then everybody's just, it's anarchy and it's chaos. Like there's literally no consensus reality and anybody can say anything and so on and so forth, right? And I think that there's two possible deviations from, you know, let's say that the mainstream, you know, obviously people talk about like QAnon, for example, as like this kind of thing where people just make things up. You know, they just go totally quote supply chain independent from mainstream media. <laughs> and if mainstream media is uh, a distorted gossamer of quasi truth, mm -hmm. these guys go to just total fiction as opposed to like, right. The alternative to QAnon is not blue anon mainstream media. But Satoshi Anon, 
okay, which is an upward deviation, okay, not a downward deviation to say there is no such thing as truth, but rather the upward deviation is decentralized cryptographic truth, not centralized corporate or government truth. Okay. So how does the decentralization of Wikipedia look like? Great question. It's this concept of the ledger of record. First, whether you're Israeli or Palestinian, Japanese or Chinese, Democrat or Republican, those people agree on the state of the Bitcoin blockchain. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of billions of dollars is managed without weapons, okay, um, across tribes with wildly varying ideologies, right? And what that means is that is a mechanism for getting literally consensus. It's called consensus, cryptographic consensus, proof of work. And when people can get consensus on this, what they're getting consensus on are basically bytes that determine who holds what Bitcoin. This is exactly the kind of thing people would fight wars over. You know, for hundreds of billions of dollars, let alone millions of dollars, people will, will kill each other over that in the past, right? So for hundreds of billions of dollars, people can get consensus truth on this in this highly adversarial environment, right? So the first generalization of that is it says you can go from bytes that reflect what Bitcoin somebody has to bytes that reflect what stocks, bonds, other kinds of assets people have. That's the entire DeFi, Ethereum, that whole space, okay? Basically, the premise is if you go from consensus on one byte by induction, you can go to consensus on n bytes, depending on the cost of getting that consensus, right? And almost anything digital can be represented, you know, or every, everything digital can be represented as bytes, right? So now you can get consensus on certain kinds of digital information, Bitcoin, but then also any kind of financial instrument. And then the next generalization is what I call the ledger of record. Many kinds of facts can be put partially or completely on chain. It's not just proof of work and proof of stake. There's things like proof of location, proof of human, proof of this, proof of that. The auditable oracles I talked about extend it further. Mm -hmm. Lots and lots of people are working on this, right? Proof of solvency, seeing that some actor has um, enough of a bank balance to accommodate what they say they accommodate. You can imagine many kinds of digital assertions can be turned into proof of X and proof of Y. Mm -hmm. You start putting those on chain, you now have a library of partially or completely provable facts, okay? Western Wikipedia editor or mostly white Western US media corporation or the US government when you election rigged or not. Is the earth flat or not? That's a scientific one. That's why this is my technical versus political truth spectrum. Yeah. But even the earth, like, <laughs> well, that, that one is, yeah, n never mind. That's a bad example because that is very, uh, you can rigorously show that the earth is not flat. But um, what there's some social phenomena, political phenomena, philosophical one that, that will have a lot of debates, historical stuff about, uh, uh, about the different forces operating within Nazi Germany and uh, Stalinist Soviet Union. I, I think there's probably a lot of, the, yeah, the, like the historians debate about a lot of stuff like uh, uh, Blitz, the book that talks about the influence of drugs in the Third right. Reich. Right? Right. Were, were they on math or something? Yeah, yeah, they all. There's a lot of debates about how how truth. How, what, what is the significance of meth on the actual behavior and decisions of Hitler and so on? So th there's still a lot of debates. I, is it so easy to fix with um, decentralization? I guess is the question. So I actually have like basically chapter two of the Network State book is on essentially this topic, and so. It's like 70 pages or something like that. So let me try to summarize what I think about on this. The first is that there was an Onion article that came out. I, I can't find it now anymore, but it was about historians in the year 3000 writing about the late 90s and early 2000s. And they're like, yeah. clearly, Queen Brittany was a very powerful monarch. We can see um, how many girls around the world worshipped her like a god. And so and it was very funny because it was a plausible distortion mm -hmm. of 
you know, the current society by, you know, a human civilization picking through the rubble a thousand years later, yeah. having no context on anything, right? And it's a very thought-provoking article because it says, well, to what extent is that us picking over Pompeii or the pyramids or even like, you know, the 1600s or the 1700s, like a few hundred years ago, we're basically sifting through artifacts and, um, you know, uh, Selma Berger actually has this concept of like, uh, which is is obvious, but it's also useful to have a name for it. It's like, I think he calls it like dark history, which is, and again, I might be getting this wrong, but it's like only a small percentage of what the Greeks wrote down, you know, has come to us to the present day, right? So perhaps it's not just the winners who write history, it's like the surviving records. We have this extremely partial, fragmentary record of history. And sometimes there's some discovery that rewrites the whole thing. Do you know what like Gobekli Tepe is? Everything I know about that is is from Rogan because he's a huge fan of that that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, so uh, that like rewrites. The, and, and then there's a lot of debates there. There's a lot of debates. So basically, it's like the discovery of this site in northern Turkey that totally shifts our estimate of like when civilization started, maybe yes. pushing it back many thousands of years further in the past, right? You know, the past, it's like an inverse problem in physics, right? We're trying to reconstruct this from limited information, right? It's like X-ray crystallography. It's an inverse problem, right? Um, it's it's Plato's cave. You know, we're trying to reconstruct what the world looks like outside from these shadows, these, these fragments that have been um, given to us, right? Or that we've found. And um, so in that sense, as you find more information, your estimate of the past changes, right? Oh, wow. Okay. That pushes back civilization farther than we thought. That one discovery just changes it. So you want to try to given all the gaps in the data we have, you want to try to remove bias from the process of trying to fill the gaps. Well, so here's the thing. Um, I think we're very close to the moment of it. And so that's why it'll sound crazy when I say it now. But our descendants, I, I really do think of what the blockchain is and cryptographically verifiable history as being the next step after written history. It's like on par with that. Because anybody who has the record, the math is not going to change, right? Math is constant across human time and space, right? So, you know, the value of pi is constant. That's one of the few constants across all these different human civilizations, okay? Um, so somebody in the future, assuming, of course, the digital record is actually intact to that point because, you know, the... Uh, in theory, digital stuff will persist. In practice, you have lost data and floppy drives and stuff like that. In a sense, in some ways, digital is more persistent. In some ways, physical is more persistent, okay? But assuming we can figure out the, the archival problem somehow, then this future record, at least it's internally consistent, mm -hmm. right? You can run a bunch of the equivalents of checksums, right? The Bitcoin verification process, just sum it all up and see that, okay, it's F of G of H of X, and boom, that that at least is internally consistent, okay? Again, it doesn't say that all the people who reported it were, uh, you know, they, they could have put something on chain that's false, but at least you know the metadata is likely to be very difficult to falsify. And this is a new tool. It's a really a new tool in terms of a robust um, history that is expensive and technically challenging to edit and alter. Mm -hmm. And that is the alternative to the Stalin-esque rewriting of history by centralized power. Yeah, I'm gonna have to do a lot of actually reading and thinking about. Um, I'm actually as as you're talking, I'm also thinking about the fact that I think 99 percent of my access to Wikipedia is is on technical topics because um, I basically use it very similarly to Stack Overflow. And even there, it doesn't have unit tests. For example, one thing. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. <laughs> right. So one thing I remember. I'm I, again, I might be wrong on this, but I recall that the Kelly Criterion is a it's actually quite a useful thing to know. It's like how to optimally size your bets, okay? And you can have, um, given your kind of probability that some investment pays off or assume probability, you can have bets that are too large, bets that are too small. Sometimes the Kelly criterion, it goes negative and actually it says you should actually take leverage. You're so sure this is a good outcome that you should actually spend more than your current bankroll because you're going to get a good result, right? Yes. So it's a very sophisticated thing. And as I recall, many sites on the internet have the wrong equation. Mm -hmm. And I believe that was reprinted on Wikipedia. The wrong equation was put on Wikipedia as a Kelly criterion for a while. It's funny. 
Okay. And so without unit tests, see, math is actually the kind of thing that you could unit test, right? You could literally have the assert on the right-hand side today, right? The modern version, we've got Jupiter, we've got Replit, we've got all these things. The modern version of Wikipedia, um, there's sites like golden.com, for example, like, um, you know, the... Um, there's there's a bunch of things I'm, I'm funding lots of stuff across the board you know on on this, um, and you know I'm not capitalizing these companies or capitalized independently, but I'm trying to see if you know not just talk about a better version. It's hard to build something better, so actually go and build it. And what you want is assertions that are actually reproduced. You 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 don't just have the equation there. You have it written down in code. You can hit enter. You can download the page. You can rerun it. It's reproducible. Right? So the, the problem with that kind of reproducibility is that it adds friction. It's hard to put together articles that do that kind of stuff, unless you do an incredible job with UX and so on. I, the the thing that I think is interesting about Wikipedia on the technical side is that without the unit tests, without the assertions, it still often does an incredible job because the reason it's the, the people that write those articles, and I've seen this also in Stack Overflow, is are the people that care about this most and there's a pride to getting it right okay so let me uh, agree and disagree with that right so absolutely there's there's some good there there's um uh, i mean again do i think we could be as a huge step up from what preceded it in some ways on the technical topics yes however you talk about the editing environment right like the markup for wikipedia it's very you know, mid two thousands, right? Yeah. It is not it's a Craigslist. Yeah, exactly. If for, at a minimum, for example, it's not WYSIWYG, right? right. So, uh, like Medium or something like that. You, you know, or Ghost. Um, you can just go in and type, and it looks exactly like it looks on the page. Here, you have to go yeah. to a uh, a markup language where there can be editor conflicts, and you hit enter, and someone is over in your edit or something like that. And you don't know how it looks on the page, and you might have to do a few, you know, previews or what have you. So number one, so editing, uh, you talk about bearish editing. That's that's the thing. Um, number two is, given that it might be read a thousand times for every one time it's written, it is important to actually have the mathematical things unit tested if they can be, given that we've got modern technology, and that's something that's hard to like retrofit into this because it's so kind of ossified, right? Right. There's the, yeah the interface on every side for the editor. Even just for the editor to check that they're, for, say the editor wants to get it right, make it, you want to make it really, uh, or not really so, easy, but easier to check their work. That's like right. Like debugging, like a nice ID for the, for the. <laughs> that's exactly right. For the editing experience. That's right. And the thing about this is, um, as I said, because the truth is a global constant, but like incorrectness, you know. Right. Go ahead. Every uh, happy family. No, I, I, I love I love to think that uh, like truth will have a nice debugger. <laughs> well, so here's here's right. <laughs> yeah. So the thing is that what you can do is uh, it, let's say you did have like a unit tested page for everything that. Quality and page rank was a pretty good uh, approximation for quality. Yes, such but, a fascinating thing, by the way. But yeah, it's a fascinating thing. We can talk about that, yeah. but. Basically, once people know that you're using this as a measure, they will start to game it. And uh, so then you have this cycle where, you know, sometimes you have a fixed point, like Satoshi with Proof of Work was miraculously able to come up with a game where the gaming of it was difficult without just buying more compute, right? right? So it's actually, it's a rare kind of game where knowledge of the game's rules didn't allow people to game the game. Okay? Yeah. But, or a brilliant way to put it, yeah. It really, Which is one of the reasons it's brilliant is it, that it's it, you can describe the game and you can't mess with it. Exactly, it's very hard to come up with something that's stable in this way. There's actually on the meta point, uh, gosh, there's a game where the rule of the game is to change the rules. Okay, um, <laughs> it is. Uh, you, you mean human civilization or what? Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> gosh, it is called something. Nomic. Okay. N O M I C. Nomic is a game where the rule of the game is to change the rules of the game. Yeah. At first, that seems insane. Then you realize that's Congress. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. But literally, what it is so. So, uh, you know, many games devolve into the metagame of who writes the rules of the game.
right? Become essentially games of Gnomic. Proof of work is so amazing because it, it didn't devolve in such a way, right? Or, or it became very hard to rewrite the rules once they got set up. It's very financially and technically expensive. That's not to say it will always be like that, but it's very hard to change. If we could take a small tangent, we'll mm -hmm. return to academia. I'd love to ask you about how to fix the media as well after we fix academia. Yeah, these are all actually related. Related. Yeah, Wikipedia, media, and academia yes. are all related to the question of independent replication versus prestigious citation. Sure. So the, the problem is authority and prestige as you see it from academia and the media and Wikipedia with the editors. We have to have uh, a mechanism where sort of uh, the data and the reproduci reproducibility is what dominates the discourse. That's right. And so one way of thinking about this is, I've, I've said this in, in um, yeah, I think I tweeted this or something, but Western civilization actually has a break glass of in case of emergency button. It's called decentralization, right? Martin Luther hit it. When the Catholic Church was too ossified and centralized, decentralized with the Protestant Reformation. Okay. He said, you know, at the time, people were able to uh, pay for indulgences, like that is to say, they could sin. They could say, okay, I sinned five times yesterday. Here's, you know, the equivalent of 50 bucks. Okay, I'm done with my sin. I can go and sin some more. Okay, they should really buy their way out of sin, okay? Now, people debate as to how frequent those indulgences were, but these are one of the things he invaded against in the 95 Theses. So decentralization, boom, break away from this ossified church, start something new, right? Mm -hmm. And in theory, the, quote, religious wars of the 1600s that ensued were about things like where, you know, the wafer was the body of Christ or, or what have you. But in part, they were also about power and whether the centralized entity would write all the rules or the decentralized one would. And so what happened was obviously Catholicism still exists, but Protestantism also exists, okay? And uh, similarly here, you've got this ossified central institution where, you know, forget about, I mean, there's complicated studies that are difficult to summarize, but when you have the science saying masks don't work and then they do, okay, which everybody saw, and this is not like, you know, everybody knew that there was not like some massive study that came out that changed our perspective on mask wearing. It was something that was just insistently asserted as this is what the science says. And then without any acknowledgement, the science said something different, you know, the next day, right? I remember because I was in the middle of this, this debate. Um, and I think you could justify masks early in the pandemic as a useful precaution and then later, you know, post-vaccination, perhaps not necessary. I think that's like the rational way of thinking about it. But the point was that such levels of uncertainty were not acknowledged. Instead, people, you know, were basically lying in the name of science and public policy uh, was, you know, it, was, it was, wasn't uh, public health, it was political health, okay? So something like that, you're just spending down all the credibility of an institution for basically nothing, okay? And so in such a circumstance, what do you do? Break glass. Decentralize. What does that look like? Okay. So let me describe what I call crypto science uh, by analogy to, you know, crypto, just like there's fiat science, crypto science, right? Fiat economics. Nice. Okay. So um, in any experiment, any paper when it comes out, right? It's, you can sort of divide it into the analog to digital and the purely digital. Okay. So the analog to digital is you're running some instruments, you're getting some data. Okay. And then once you've got the data, you're generating figures and tables and text and a PDF from that data, right? Leave aside the data collection step for now. I'll come back to that, right? Just the purely digital part. What does the ideal quote academic paper look like in 2022, 2023? First, uh, there's this concept called truly uh, called reproducible research. Okay. Reproducible research is the idea that the PDF should be regenerated from the data and code. Okay, so you should be able to hit enter and regenerate it. Mm -hmm. Why is this really important as a concept? John Claire Boo and David Donahoe at Stanford 20 years ago pioneered this in stats because the text alone often doesn't describe every parameter that goes into a figure or something, right? You kind of sometimes just need to look at the code and then it's easy. And without that, it's hard, okay? So reproducible research means you regenerate the PDF, from the code and, and the data, you hit enter, okay? Now, 
One issue is that many papers out there, science, nature, et cetera, are not reproducible research. Moreover, the data isn't even public. Uh, moreover, sometimes the paper isn't even public. Mm -hmm. The open access movement has been fighting this for the last 20 something years. There's various levels of this, like green and gold, open access, okay? So. You can have uh, citations between two papers turn into import statements. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. That's cool, right? Yeah, so cool. now you're not just getting composable finance, like DeFi, where you have like one interest rate calculator calling another. You have composable science. And now you can say this paper on this, especially in ML, right? You'll often cite a previous paper and its benchmark or its method, yeah. right? You're gonna you're gonna wanna scatter plot sometimes your paper, your algorithm versus theirs on the same data set. That is facilitated if their entire paper is reproducible research that is generated. You can just literally import that Python and you know then you can you can generate your figure off of it, right? Moreover, think about how that aids reproducibility. <laughs> of citations that are import statements on chain. In theory, you could track back a paper all the way back to its antecedents, okay? So if it's citing something, you can now look it up and look it up and look it up. And a surprising number of papers actually, um, you know, their antecedents don't terminate or the, the original source says something different or it just kind of got garbled like a telephone game. And, uh, you know, there's this famous thing on like uh, the spinach, um, it, like a, is, it does actually have iron in it or, or something like that. I, I forget the details on this story, but it was something where you track back the citations and people are contradicting each other, okay? But it's just something that just gets copy pasted and it's a fact that's not actually a fact because it's not audited properly. This allows you to cheaply audit, in theory, all the way back to Maxwell or Newton or something like that, yes. okay? Now, what I'm describing is a big problem, but it's a finite problem. It's essentially taking all the important papers and putting them on chain. It's about the scale of, let's say, Wikipedia, okay? So it's like, I don't know, a few hundred thousand, a few million papers, I don't know the exact number, but it'll be out of that level, okay. So now you've got, number one, these things that are they're on chain, okay? Number two, they're, you've turned citations into import statements. Number three, anybody can now, at a minimum, download that code, and while they may not have the instruments, and I'll come back to that point, well, they may not have the instruments, they can do internal checks, the Benford's Law stuff we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. You can internally check the consistency of these tables and graphs, and often you'll find fraud or things that don't add up that way, because all the code and the data is, is there, right? And now you've made it so that anybody in Brazil, in India, in Nigeria, they may not have an academic, you know, like a, a library access zone, but they can get into this. All right. Now, how do you fund all of this? Well, Good thing is crypto actually allows tools for that as well. Andrew Huberman and others have started doing things like with NFTs um, to, to fund their lab. I can talk about the funding aspect. There's things like researchhub.com, which are trying to issue tokens for labs. But mm -hmm. a lab isn't that expensive to fund. Maybe it's a few hundred thousand, a few million a year, depending on where you are. Crypto does generate money. And so you can probably imagine various tools, whether it's tokens or NFTs or something like that to fund. To, there's a website called NCBI, National Center for Biotechnology Information. You can see the experiment metadata on various sequencing runs. It'll tell you what instrument and what time it was run and who ran it and so on and so forth, okay? What that does is allows you to correct for things like batch effects. Sometimes you will sequence on this day and the next day and maybe the humidity or something like that makes it look like there's a statistically significant difference between your two results, but it was just actually batch effects, okay? Mm -hmm. What's my point? Point is, if you have a crypto instrument, you can have you know various hashes and stuff of the data as a chain of custody for the data itself that are streamed and written on chain that the manufacturer can program into this. For anything that's really, and you might say, well, boy, boy, that's overkill, right? I'm saying actually not, you know why? If you're doing a study whose results are going to be used to influence a policy that's going to control the lives of millions of people. Every single step has to be totally audible. You need the glass box model. You need to be able to go back to the raw data. You need to be able to interrogate that. Mm -hmm. And again, this is anybody who's a good scientist will embrace this. 
Right. So, yeah. So first of all, that was a brilliant exposition of a future of science that I would love to see. Um, the the pushback I'll provide, which is not really a sure. pushback, is like what you describe is so much better than what, what we currently have that I think a lot of people would say any of the sub steps you suggest are already going to be a huge improvement. So even just sharing the code yes or sharing the data you said like off you it's i think it would surprise people how often it's hard to get data uh it, it is like the actual data or specifics or a large number of the parameters not the, you know you'll share like one or two parameters that were involved with running the experiment you won't mention the machines involved except maybe at a high level, but the versions and so on, the dates when the experiments were run, exactly. you don't mention any of this kind of stuff. Right. So there's there's several ways to fix this. And one of them, I think, implied in what you're describing is a culture that says it's not okay. Exactly. To like, so, so first of all, there should be, even if it's not perfectly unchained to where you can automatically import all the way to Newton, it, it, it just just even the, um, the act of sharing the code, sharing the data, maybe in a way that's not uh, perfectly integrated into a larger structure is already a very big positive step. Yeah. Of saying, like, if you don't do this, then uh, this doesn't count. And because in general, I think my worry, uh, I, you know, as somebody who's a programmer, who's OCD, I love the, the picture you paint that you can just import everything and it all, all automatically checks everything. My, my problem is, is that makes incremental science easier and revolutionary science harder. Oh, I actually very much disagree with that. I would love to hear your argument because let me just kind of sure. elaborate. Sure. Um, why th th sometimes you have to think in this gray area of fuzziness mm -hmm. when you're thinking on totally novel ideas and when you have to concretize in data, like some of the greatest papers I've ever written are to don't have data. They're in the space of ideas almost. Mm -hmm. Like you, you're kind of sketching stuff and there could be errors, but like Einstein himself with the famous five papers, I mean, they're, they're, they're really strong, but they're, they're fuzzy. Mm -hmm. They're 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 a little bit fuzzy, and so I, I think uh, you know even like the GAN GAN paper, you're often thinking of like new data sets, new ideas, and I think maybe as a step after the paper is written, you could probably. Then you have the citations as import statements. Then you have the full citation graph as an import statement. So you just follow it all the way back, right? And uh, and now you have that gives you audibility. Then you have the off chain, you know, the the analog digital crypto custody, right? Like where you're hashing things and streaming things. So you have the chain of custody. Each of those is kind of like a level up and adds to complexity, but it also adds to the audibility and the verifiability and the reproducibility. But you know, one thing I'd say I wanted to respond to that you said was uh, that you think that this would be good for incremental but not innovative. I actually think it's quite the opposite. I think academia is institutional and it's not innovative. For example, NIH has this graph, which is like, I think it's age of recipients of R01 grants, okay? Mm -hmm. And what it shows is basically it's like a hump that moves over time, roughly plus one year forward for the average age as the year moves on, mm -hmm. okay? And I'll see if I can find the GIF. What this, wh why is this, let me see if I can find it actually. Look at this movie just for a second. It's a, it's a ridiculously powerful movie and it's 30 seconds. What's that? I just sent it in WhatsApp. The name of the video is Age Distribution of NIH Principal Investigators and Medical School Faculty. And it starts out on the X axis is age with the distribution and percent of PIs and from 19, early 1980s, moving one year at a time. And the mean of the distribution is moving slowly, approximately as Bellagia said, about one year. Per year. Uh, per year. Now this is in, 10 years ago. But one year in age per year of time. 
And notice how, first of all, the average age is moving way upward before mm -hmm. you, you know, become an NH NHPI. Second is, it's a cohort of guys, people, who are just awarding grants to each other. Yeah. That's clearly what's happening. You know, that's, that's the underlying dynamic. They're not awarding grants to folks who are much younger, okay, because those folks haven't proven themselves yet, right? Mm -hmm. So it is this, this is what happens when you get prestigious cita citation rather than independent replication. The age just keeps creeping up. And this was 10 years ago, and it's gotten even worse. It's become even more gerontocratic, even more hidebound, right? And so the thing is, the, the, the structures that Vannevar Bush and others set up, the entire post-war science establishment, one thing I'll often find is people will say, Balji, the government hath granted us the internet and uh, you know, self-driving cars and space flight and so on. How can you possibly be against the U.S. government, kneel and repent for its bounty, you know? And really what they are, the reason they, they kind of, they don't say it quite in that way, but that's really the underpinning kind of thing because they've replaced G-O-D with G-O-V. They really think of the U.S. government as God. You know, the conservative will think of the U.S. government as like the all-powerful military abroad and the progressive will think of it as the benign, all-powerful, you know, like nurturing parent at home, okay? But uh, in this context, they're like, how come you as, you know, some tech bro could possibly think you could ever do basic science without the funding of the U.S. government? Has it not developed all basic science, right? Mm -hmm. And the answer to this is actually to say, well, what if we go further back than 1950? Did science happen before 1950? Well, I think it did. Bernoulli and, you know, Maxwell and Newton, were they funded by NSF? You know, no, they weren't, right? Were, were aviation, railroads, automobiles, gigantic, you know, industries that arose and that both were, were stimulated by and stimulated development of pure science? Did they, were they funded by NSF? No, they were not, right? Therefore, NSF is not a necessary condition for the presence of science. Neither is even the United States. Obviously, a lot of these discoveries, Newton was before, you know, like uh, the, I, I believe he's before the American, hold on, let me find the exact, it's actually less old than people think. Okay, so Newton died 1727, right? So I knew that, um, you know, it was like in the 1700s. So Newton was before the American Revolution, right? Obviously, that meant huge innovations could happen before the U.S. government, before NIH, before NSF, right? Which means they are not a necessary condition, number one. That itself is crucial because a lot of people say the government is necessary for, the, for basic science. It is not necessary for basic science. Mm -hmm. It is one possible catalyst. And I would argue that mid-century, it was okay because mid-century was the time when you, the middle of the centralized century. Uh, 1933, 1945, 1969, you have Hoover Dam, you have the Manhattan Project, you have Apollo. That generation was acclimatized to a centralized U.S. government that could accomplish great things, partly because technology favored centralization going into 1950 and then started favoring decentralization going out of it. I've talked about this in the book. Sovereign Individual has talked about this, but very roughly, you know, you go up into 1950 and you have mass media and mass production um, and just centralization of all kinds, giant nation states slugging it out on the world stage. And you go out in 1950 and you get cable news and personal computers and the internet and mobile phones and cryptocurrency, and you have the decentralization. And so this entire centralized scientific establishment was set up at the peak of the centralized century. And it might've been the right thing to do at that time, but is now showing its age. And it's no longer actually geared up for what we have. Where are the huge innovations coming out? Well, Satoshi Nakamoto was not, to our to our knowledge, a professor, right? Mm -hmm. That's this revolutionary thing that came outside of it. Um, early in the pandemic, there was something called project-evidence.github.io, which accumulated all of the evidence for the coronavirus possibly having been a lab leak, when that was a very controversial thing to discuss, right? Alina Chan, to her credit, you know, Matt, Matt Ridley and Alina Chan have written this book, you know, on um, whether uh, the coronavirus was a lab leak or not. I think it's plausible that it was. Um, I, I can't say I'm 100% sure, but I think it's at least it's certainly. Someone said, I know the lion by his claw or something like that, right? 
people used to do pseudonymous publication in the past so that they would be judged on part by their scientific ideas and not the person themselves, right? And so um, so I, I do disagree that uh, this is the incremental stuff. This is actually the innovative stuff. The incremental stuff is going to be the institutional gerontocracy the, that's academia, where it's like, you know, do you know who I am? I'm a, I'm a Harvard professor. They're yeah, I don't, science. I don't, I, uh, I think I agree with everything you said, but I, I um, I'm not, I'm going, I'm not going to get stuck on technicalities sure, sure, sure. B- because I think I was referring to your vision of data sets and importing uh, code. Uh, sure. And so that forces just knowing how code works, it forces a structure and structure usually favors incremental progress. Like if you fork code, you're not going to, uh, it decentivizes revolution. You want to go from scratch. Okay, so I I understand your point there, okay. Um, and I also agree that some papers like Francis Crick on the Klaustrum or others are theoretical. They're more about like where to dig than the data itself and so on and so forth, right? So I agree with that. Still, I don't um, – the counter argument is rather than a thousand people reading this paper to try to rebuild the whole thing and uh, do it with errors, when they can just import – they can more easily build upon what others have done, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the the paper should be – Forkable. Well, yeah, yeah. So here's why. You know, like uh, you know, Python has this concept of batteries included for the standard library, right? Because it lets you just import, 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 and just get to work, right? That means you can fly. Whereas if you couldn't do all those things and you had to rewrite string handling, you would only be able to do incremental things. Libraries actually allow for greater innovation. That's my counter. I, I think you create, I, I think that paints a picture. I hope that's a, a picture that fits with science. It certainly does. It fits with code very well. I just wonder how much of science can be that, which is you, you import. <laughs> uh, uh, how much of it is possible to do that? Certainly for the things I work on, you can, which is the machine learning world, the uh, all the computer science world. But whether you can do that for, all right, you can think so, biology. It seems to, yes, I think so. Chemistry. I think so, and then you start getting into weird stuff like psychology, which some people don't even think is a science. No, um, just love for my psychology friends. I I think as you get farther and farther away from things that are like hard technical fields, it starts getting tougher and tougher and tougher to have like well, importable code. Okay, so let me give the strong form version, right? Mm-hmm. So there's a guy who I think is, is a you know, great machine learning guy, uh, creator of actually Keras, um, who he, yeah. disagree, he disagrees with me on Francois Schiller. Yeah, he's been on his podcast twice, yeah. Okay, great. So he disagrees- I disagree with him on a lot of stuff. Yes, me too. I think we have mutual respect, you know, may, uh, follow each other on Twitter or whatever, I right? Th- think, yes, I think he does respect and like you. Here is something which I totally agree with him on, and he actually got like trolled or attacked for this, but I completely agree. Within 10, 20 years, nearly every branch of science will be, for all intents and purposes, a branch of computer science. Computational physics, computational chemistry, computational biology, computational medicine, even computational archaeology, realistic simulations, big data analysis, and ML everywhere. That to me is incredibly obvious why. First of all, all we're doing every day is PDFs and data analysis on a computer, right? And so every single one of those areas can be reduced to the analog to digital step, and then it's all digital. Then you're yeah. flying, you're in the cloud, right? Do you put a date, do you say how long or? 10 eventually? to 20 years, you say. 10 to 20 years. I mean, I, I think yeah. arguably it's already there, right? And here's the thing, you, you, you were saying, well, you know, you might drop off when you hit psychology or history. Actually, um, I think it's the softer sciences that are gonna harden up. Why? Um, one of the things I talk about a lot in the book is, for example, with history, the concept of crypto history makes history computable. One way of thinking about it is, remember my Britney Spears example, right? Mm-hmm. Where Queen mm-hmm. Britney, right? Yeah. Okay. So at first, it's kind of a funny thing to say a computer scientist's term for history is the log files. Mm-hmm. Until we realized that, what would a future historian, how would they write about the history of the 2010s? Well, a huge part of that history occurred on the servers of Twitter and Facebook. 
So now you go from like a log file, which is just the individual record of like one server's action, to decade a decade worth of data on literally billions of people. All of their online lives, like arguably, that's why I say that's like actually what the written history was mm -hmm. of the 2010s was this giant digital history. As you go to the 2020s and the 2030s, more of that is going to move from merely online to on-chain and then cryptographically verifiable. So that soft subject of history becomes something that you can calculate things like Google Trends and Ngrams and stuff like that. Yes, beautifully put. Then I would venture to say that Donald Trump was erased from history uh, when he was removed the, from Twitter yeah. and many social platforms and all his tweets were gone. I think as someone who has an archive of it, but yeah, I understand your point. Yeah, well, as the flood of data about each individual increases, censorship, it, it becomes much more difficult to actually have an archive of stuff. But yes, for important people like a president of the United States, yes. Uh, let me on that uh, topic ask you about uh, Trump. You were considered for a position as FDA commissioner in the Trump administration. And... I think one of, in terms of the network state, in terms of the digital world, one of the seminal acts in the history of that was the banning of Trump from Twitter. Can you make the case for it and against it? Sure. So first, let me, let me talk about the FDA thing. Sure. So I was considered for a senior role at FDA, but I do believe that, and this is a whole topic, we can talk about the FDA. Um, I do believe that just as it was easier to create Bitcoin than to form the Fed, right? Reforming the Fed basically still hasn't happened, right? So just as it was easier to create Bitcoin than to reform the Fed, it will literally be easier to start a new country than to reform the FDA. Mm -hmm. It may take 10 or 20 years. I mean, think about Bitcoin, it's only about 13 years old, right? It may take 10 or 20 years to start a new network state with a different biomedical policy. But that is how we get out from this, perhaps the single worst thing in the world, which is harmonization, regulatory harmonization. Can you describe sure. uh, regulatory harmonization? Regulatory harmonization is the mechanism by which US regulators impose their regulations on the entire world. Mm -hmm. So they basically have a monopoly by US regulators. Uh, this is not just the FDA, it is SEC and FAA and so on and so forth. There's their regulation to the USA, okay, with all the attendant issues. Because, I mean, uh, you, you know the names of some politicians. Can you name a single regulator at the FDA? No. no, right? Yet they will brag on their website that they regulate, I forget the exact numbers, I think it's like 25 cents out of every dollar, something along those lines, okay? It's like double digits, okay? That's a pretty big deal. And the thing about this is, you know, people will talk about, quote, our democracy and so on. But many of the positions in, quote, our democracy are actually not subject to democratic accountability. Uh, you have tenured professors and you have tax exempt colleges. You have the Salzburgers, the New York Times, who have dual class stock. You have, um, you know, a, a bunch of positions that are out of the reach of the electorate, and that includes regulators. <laughs> It's not just a government thing. It's a regulatory capture thing. Big pharma companies like this as well. Why? Because they can just get their approval in the US and then they can export to the rest of the world, right? I understand where that comes from as a corporate executive. It's such a pain to get you know access in one place. So there's a team up though between the giant company and the giant government to box out all the small startups and all the small countries and lots of small innovation, right? There are cracks in this now, right? Mm -hmm. The FDA did not acquit itself well during the pandemic. For example, it denied, I mean, there's so many issues, but one of the things that even actually the New York Times uh, reported, the and the emergency use authorization was, you know, emergency should mean like right now, right? Mm -hmm. But it was not, it was just taking forever. And so some labs did civil disobedience and they just disobeyed the FDA and just went and tested uh, academic labs with threat of federal penalties because that's what they are. They're like, they're, they're like the police, okay? 
and uh, and so we're sort of retroactively granted immunity because NYT went and ran a positive story on them. So NYT's authority is usually greater than that of FDA. If they come into a conflict and NYT runs stories, then FDA kind of gets spanked, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, you know, probably neither party would normally think of themselves that way. But if you look at it, when NYT goes and runs stories on a company, it names all the executives and they get all hit. When it runs stories on a regulator, it just treats the regulator usually as if it was just some abstract entity. It's Zuckerberg's Facebook, but you can't name, you know, the people who the career bureaucrats mm -hmm. at FDA. Interesting, right? It's There's, very interesting. It's a very important point. Like that person who's like named and their face is is known. Like you, just as an example, you know Zuckerberg's face and name. Most people don't know Arthur G. Salzberger. They couldn't recognize him. Right, yet he's a guy who's inherited the New York Times company from his father's father's father. That is unaccountable power. It's not that they get great coverage; it's that they get no coverage. You don't even think about them, right? And uh, so it's invisibility, right? There's some aspect why Fauci was very interesting because he was me, a public in, face. In my yes. recent memory, there's not been many faces of scientific policy, of science policy. Yeah, and he became the face of that, and you know, as as uh, there's some of it is meme, which is, uh, uh, you know, basically saying that he is science, or to some people represents science. But the, in in the or, or quote the, unquote science, or the, whatever, yeah, yeah. The the positive aspect of that is that there is accountability when there's a face like that, right? But you can also see the Fauci died faster earlier. It's as if you can imagine a model where those who were exposed and had the lowest susceptibility, also had the highest severity, and died in greater numbers early on. If you look at the graph, like deaths from COVID were exponential going into about April 2020, and then leveled off to about 7,500, 10,000 a day, and then kind of fell, right? But it could have gone to 75,000 at the beginning, so we didn't know how serious it was. So this would have been a real risk that these people would have been taking, but here's what they would have gotten for that. Basically, in a challenge trial, somebody would have been given the vaccine, and then exposed to the virus, and then put under observation. Mm -hmm. And then that would have given you all the data because ultimately the, the synthesis of the thing, I mean, yes, you do need to scale up synthesis and manufacturing and what have you, but the information of whether it worked or not and was safe and effective and so, like that could have been gathered expeditiously with volunteers for challenge trials. And you think there would be a large number of volunteers? Absolutely. What's the concern there? What's, is there an ethical concern of taking on uh, volunteers? Well, so let me put it like this. Had we done that, we could have had vaccines early enough to save the lives of like a million Americans, especially seniors and so on, okay? Soldiers and more generally first responders and others um, you know, I, I do believe there's folks who would have stepped up, um, you know, to to take that risk. The that's heroes what, walk among us. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Like if military service is something which is it's a ritualized thing, um, people are paid for it, but they're not paid that much. They're really paid in honor, you know, and in, in duty and, and patriotism. That is actually the kind of thing where um, I do believe some some fraction of those folks would have raised their hand for this important, you know, task. I don't know how many of them, but I, I do think that we the volunteers would have been there. There's probably some empirical test of that, which is a there's a challenge trials website. There's a Harvard prof who put out this proposal early in the pandemic, and a, he could tell you how many volunteers. Warming and centralization accelerated. Pandemic means emergency powers for the state, even more than terrorism or crime. And sometimes a solution creates the next problem. My rough forecast of the future, the coronavirus results in quarantines, nationalism, centralization. And this may actually work to stop the spread, but once under control, states will not see their powers, so we decentralize. And I didn't know whether it was going to stop the spread, but I knew that, that they were going to try to do it, right? And, you know, look, it's it's hard to call every single thing right. And, you know, I'm sure, you know, someone will find some errors, but in general, I think that was that was actually pretty good for like early February of 2020, right? So it's my point though. The point is, rather than copying Chinese lockdown, what we should have had were different regimes around the world. To some extent, Sweden defected, you know, from this, right? They had like no lockdowns or what have you. But really, the 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 axis that people were talking about was lockdown versus no lockdown. Um, the real axis should have been challenge trials versus no challenge trials. We could have had that in days. Okay. And 
that those are two examples on both vaccines and testing. There's so many more that I can point to. So th those are kind of decentralized innovations, and that's what FDA should stand for. FDA can stand for it. Or something like FDA, right? Ah, so let's talk about that, right? All something right. like FDA. So this is very important. In general, the way I try to think about things is V1, V2, V3, as we've talked about a few right. times. So before. FDA, V... Well, right. So what, what was before FDA, right? So there was both good and bad before FDA because people don't necessarily have a, the right model of the past, okay? So, you know, if, if you ask people what, what was there before the FDA, they'll say, um, and by the FDA itself omits the, right? Their pronouns are just FDA, FDA, okay? Um, so, but basically- uh, uh, Why is that important? It's just something where- why, why is that either humorous or interesting to you? They have a sort of in-group lingo where when you when you are kind of talking about them the way that they talk about themselves, it is something that kind of piques interest. It's kind of like, uh, you know, in in LA, people say the 101 or the, yeah. you know, right? Whereas in Northern California, they'll say 101 uh, or people from Nevada will say Nevada, yeah. right? It just instantly marks you as like insider or outsider, okay? In terms of how the language works, right? And that's, go ahead. That I means just makes me sad because that lingo is part of the mechanism which creates the silo, the bubble of particular thoughts, and that ultimately deviates from the truth because you're not open to new ideas. I, th I think it's actually like, uh, you know, in Glorious Bastards, there's a scene in the bar. Do you know what I'm talking about? No, but <laughs> it's good. Uh, you can't, uh, just, just to censor you, this is like a Wikipedia podcast, like Wikipedia, you can't cite um quentin tarantino films no I'm okay 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 good. sorry so back there. Ba basically like english start going like one two three four yeah. five and i believe it's like the germans start with like the thumb <laughs> something that you'd never know yeah. right yes, yes, yes. Uh, i may be misremembering there but i think that's right okay yeah. so uh so that's so fda's like, got the lingo all right right yes. so fda's got the lingo. so coming back up basically just talk about FDA and then come back to your question on on the yeah, deplatforming. So thing. V, uh, what was V zero FDA? What's yeah, so, V one. What's so what does the future look like? V one V one was quote patent medicines. Okay, that's something some people say. But V one was also Banting and Best. Okay, Banting and Best. They won the Nobel Prize in the early nineteen twenties. Right? Why? Um, they came up with the idea for um, insulin supplementation to treat diabetes. And uh, they came up with a concept. They experimented on dogs. They did self-experimentation. They had healthy volunteers. They m experimented with the formulation as well, right? Because just like you'd have like a web app and a mobile app, maybe a command line app, you could have, you know, a drug that's administered orally or via injection or cream or, you know, so there's different formulations, right? Dosage, all that stuff they could just like iterate on, okay, with willing doctor, willing patient, these uh, you know, these uh, these folks who were affected uh, just sprang out of bed. The insulin supplementation was working for them. And within a couple of years, they had won the Nobel Prize and Eli Lilly had scaled production for the entire North American continent, mm -hmm. okay? So that was a time when pharma moved at the speed of software, when it was willing buyer, willing seller, okay? Because the past is demonized as something that our glorious regulatory agency is protecting us from, okay? But there's so many ways in which what it's really protecting you from is being healthy, okay? As, you know. PDF, okay. Um, this lecture, uh, which I'll, I'll kind of link it here so you can maybe put in the show notes if you want. Um, this goes through like a dozen different examples of crazy things the FDA did from the kind of stuff that was dramatized in Dallas Buyers Club, where they were preventing people from getting AIDS drugs, to you know their uh, you know various uh, attacks in physical health. There's no right to consume or feed children any particular food. There's no fundamental right to freedom of contract. They basically feel like they own you. You're not allowed to make your own decisions about your food. There's no generalized right to bodily and physical health. Direct quote from their like written kind of thing, okay? The, the general frame um, you're gonna need a 
better version of them? And how would you actually build something like that? So with the Fed and with, you know, SEC and, and, and the entire, you know, the banks and whatnot, crypto has a pretty good set of answers for these things. And over time, all the countries that are not, or all, all the groups that are not the US establishment or the CCP will find more and more to their liking in the crypto economy. So that part I think is going, okay? We can talk about that. What does that look like for biomedicine? Well, first, what does exit the FDA look like, right? So there actually are a bunch of exits from the FDA already, um, which is uh, things like right to try laws, okay? CLIA labs and laboratory developed tests, compounding pharmacies, off-label prescription by doctors, and countries that aren't fully harmonized with FDA. For example, you you know Kobe Kobe Bryant before he passed away went and did uh, stem cell treatments in in Germany. Okay, stem cells had been pushed out. You know, I think in part by the Bush administration, but by other things. So um, those are different kinds of exits. Right to try basically means you know at the state level you can just try the drug. Okay, um, CLIA labs and LDTs. That means that's a path where you don't have to go through FDA to get a new device approved. You can just run, run it in a lab, okay? Compounding pharmacies, these were under attack. I'm not sure actually where the current you know, statute is on this, but this is the idea that a pharmacist has some discretion in how they you know, prepare mixtures of, of, of drugs. Um, Off-label prescription by MDs. So MDs have enough like weight in the system that they can kind of push back on FDA. And off-label prescription is the concept that a drug that's approved for purpose A can be prescribed for purpose B or C or D without going through another, you know, whole new drug approval process. Um, and then countries that aren't harmonized, right? So those are like five different kinds of exits from the FDA on different directions. Um, so first, those exits exist. So for those people who are like, oh my God, we're all going to die or he's going to poison us with you know, non-FDA approved things or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Like, uh, those exits exist. You, you probably actually use tests or treatments from those. You don't even realize that you have, right? So it's, it hasn't killed you, number one. Number two is actually testing for safety. Um, you know, there's safety, efficacy, and like comparative. Safety is uh, it's actually relatively easy to test for. There's very few drugs that are like, um, there's TGN1412. That's a famous example of something that was actually really dangerous to people, right, with, with an early test. So the, the, those do exist, just acknowledge they do exist. But in general, testing for safety is actually not that hard to do, okay? And if something is safe, then you should be able to try it, usually, okay? Now, what does that decentralized FDA look like? Well, basically, you take individual pieces of it, and you can often turn them into vehicles. And um, this is like 50 different startups, but let me describe some of them. First, have you gotten any drugs or something like that recently? No, I mean, like prescribed drugs, prescription drugs. And it was like oh, now that you clarify, the answer is no. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, prescribed drugs, uh, no. Okay, so not you, not long. Me antibiotics a long time ago, maybe, but right. no. So you you know how you have like a sort of like a wadded up chemistry textbook, the package insert that goes in yes, the yes, yes, right. Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's wadded up chemistry textbook. I love it. That's what yeah. it is, right? That's yeah. what a terrible user interface. We don't usually think of it that yes. way. Why is user interface so terrible? That's a web of regulation that makes it so terrible. And, uh, you know, there's actually guys who tried to innovate just on user interface called, uh, like, Help, I Need Help. That was, like, the name of the, <laughs> the nice. company a while back. And it was, it, it was trying to explain the stuff in plain language, okay? Just on user interface, you can innovate. And why is that important? Well, um, you know, there's a company called uh, PillPack which innovated on, quote, the user interface for drugs by giving people a thing which had like a daily blister pack. Mm -hmm. So it's like, here is, here's your prescription and you're supposed to take all these pills on the first and second. And basically, whether you had taken them on a given day was manifest by whether you had opened it for that specific day, okay? This is way better than other kinds of so-called compliance methodologies. Like there are guys who try to do like an IOT pill where when you swallow it, it like gives you measurements. This was just a simple innovation on user interface mm -hmm. that boosted compliance in the sense of compliance with the drug regimen dramatically, right? Um, and I think they got acquired or would have you for a lot of money. And hopefully utilized effectively. Utilize effect, right? Well, so, sometimes, sometimes these companies that do incredible innovation it really makes you sad when they get acquired. That that leads to their death, not their scaling. Sure, I mean they did a lot of other good things, but this was one thing that they they did well, right? So PillPack just shows what you can get with improving on user interface. 
why can't, I mean, we get reviews for everything, right? One thing that, you know, like people have sort of, in my view, somewhat quoted out of context, they're like, oh, biology thinks you should replace the FDA with the help for drugs. Actually, there's something called phase four, okay, of the FDA, which is so-called post-market surveillance. Do you know that that's actually something where, in theory, you can go and fill out a form on the FDA website, which basically says, I've had, you know, a bad experience with a drug. Um, well, like VAERS, but for drugs. Yeah. Like upload it, right? Is this a government, uh, like, is this the .gov? Yeah, it's form 3500B. Well, I okay. love it. It's HTML, it's gonna be like from the 90s, or it's gonna have an interface yeah, designed by somebody who's a COBOL slash Fortran programmer. Right, here we go, so here we go. So basically, the 3500B. I hope to be proven wrong on that, by the way. But. So 3500B, consumer voluntary reporting. When do I use this form? You were hurt or had a bad side effect. Use a drug which lets unsafe use, et cetera. Yeah. The point is, FDA already has a terrible Yelp for drugs. Yeah. It has a terrible version of it. Yeah. What would the good version look like? The fact that you've never, I mean, this fact you have to fill out a PDF to go and submit a report. How do you submit a report at Yelp or Uber or Airbnb or Amazon? You tap and there's star ratings, right? So just modernizing FDA 3500B. Mm -hmm. Go to the drug, okay? What does you see? Instantly you see global reports, right? By the way, because your biology, your physiology, that's global, right? Information from Brazil, or from Germany or uh, Japan on their physiological reaction to your the same drug you're taking is useful to you. It's not like a national boundaries thing. So the whole nation state model of only collecting information on by other Americans. So really you want a global kind of thing, just like, you know, Amazon book reviews, that's like, that's a global thing. Other things are aggregate at the global level, okay? So what you want is to see every patient report and every doctor around the world on this drug. Yeah. That might be really important to your rare or semi-rare condition. Just that alone would be a valuable site. Who builds that site? It, uh, it's, it sounds like something created by capitalism. It sounds like- You could it, do it by capitalism. It would have yeah. to be a company. Yeah, you can definitely do it. See, these but are- But we don't have a world where a company is allowed to be in charge of that kind of thing. Well, I don't Google know about health that. health went down. It just seems like a lot of the- so it depends, right? Yeah. Basically, this is why you have to pick off individual elements, right? right? There's essentially a combination of first recognizing that um, the FDA is actually bad. Even be able to say that, that we're, let me put it like this. It does a lot of bad things. It is something which you need to be able to criticize. I, you, you might be like, well, that's obvious, right? Well, in 2010, for example, there's a book that came out, if anybody wants to understand FDA, it's called Reputation and Power. Yeah. A lot of people don't want to criticize FDA. Yeah, because they will retaliate against your biotech or pharma company. Yeah, okay? and that retaliation can be initiated by a single human being. Absolutely. The best analogy is, you think about the TSA, okay? Have you flown recently? Yeah. Okay. Do you make any jokes about the TSA when you're in the TSA line? Uh, usually you don't want to, but they're a little more flexible. Okay. You know what? Can, can I tell a story? <laughs> sure. Which is... It's, it was similar to this. I was uh, in Vegas at a club. I don't go to clubs. Okay. I got kicked out for the, I think the first time in my life for making a joke with a bouncer. And because um, I had a camera with me and you're not allowed to have a, cam a camera. And, I, and, I, and I'm, I said, okay, cool. Like I'll, I'll, I'll take it out. But I made a, a funny joke that I don't care to retell. But he was just a little offended. He was like, you're, you're out. I don't care who you are. I don't care who you're with. Uh, and then he proceeded to list me the the famous people he has kicked off. From that <laughs> but there is, I mean, all of those, I, uh, the reason I made the joke is I sensed that there was a, an entitlement to this particular individual, mm -hmm. like uh, where the authority has gone to Respect his head. Respect my authority. Yeah. Right. I almost wanted to poke at that. Right. And I think the poking the authority, I quickly learned the lesson. Well, no, you, I have now been rewarded with the pride I feel for having poked authority, but now I'm kicked out of the club that would have resulted 
in a fun night with friends and so on. Instead, I'm standing alone crying in Vegas, which is not a unique Vegas experience. Sure. It's actually a fundamental Vegas experience. But that, I'm sure that basic human nature happens in the FDA that's as well. E that's exactly right. So just like with the TSA, you know, just to extend the analogy, when you're in line at the TSA, yes. right, you don't want to miss your flight. That could cost you hundreds of dollars. And so you comply with absolutely ludicrous regulations like, oh, three ounce bottles. Well, you know what? You can take an unlimited number of three ounce bottles and you can combine them into a six ounce bottle through the terrorist technology called mixing. Yep. Okay. Yep. Advanced, yes. right? And uh, the thing about this is everybody in line, actually some fairly high, you know, let's say call it influence or net worth or whatever people fly, right? Mm -hmm. Millions and millions and millions of people are subject to these absolutely moronic regulations. It's all what, you know, I think uh, uh, security theater is, is, is Schreier's term, right? A lot of people know this term. So millions of people are subject to it. It costs untold billions of dollars in terms of delays and what if you could just walk up to, right? It, um, it irradiates people. And this is another FDA thing, by the way, this is an FDA TSA team up. Okay. In 2010, the TSA body scanners, there were concerns expressed, but when it's a government to government thing, see a .com is treated with extreme scrutiny by FDA. But when it's another .gov, well, they're not trying to make a profit. So they kind of just wave them on through, okay? So these body scanners were basically like applied to millions and millions of people and this huge kind of opt-in experiment. It's almost, I think it's quite likely, by the way, that if there was even a slightly increased cancer risk, that the net you know, morbidity and mortality from those would have outweighed the deaths from terrorism or whatever that were prevented, right? Uh, you, you can work out the numbers, but under you can just get the math under reasonable assumptions. It's probably true. Um, if it if it had any increased morbidity and mortality, I've not seen the recent things, but I've seen that concern expressed, you know, twelve years ago. Point being that despite the cost, despite how many people are exposed to it, despite how obviously patently ludicrous it is. You don't make any trouble, nor do people organize protests or whatever about this, because it's something where um, people, the, the security theater of the whole thing is, is part of it. Oh, well, if we took them away, there'd be more terrorism or something like that. People think, right? But and, there, it is fascinating to see that the populace puts up with it because it doesn't, my, one of my favorite things is to listen to Jordan Peterson, who um, I think offline, but I think also on the podcast, you know, he's somebody who resists authority in every way. And even he goes to TSA with a kind of suppressed, like all the instructions, everything down to when the, when the, whenever you have like the yellow thing for your feet, they, they force you to adjust it even slightly yeah. if you're off. Just even, I mean, it's like... Uh, it's a Kafka. It's a Kafka novel. We're living like TSA. It makes me smile. It brings joy to my heart because I imagine uh, Franz Kafka and I just walking through there because it's 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 it really is just deeply absurd. But and then the the the, the whole motivation of the mechanism becomes distorted by the individuals involved. The initial one was to reduce the number of terrorist attacks, I suppose. Right. Now it's guns and drugs. Basically, it's like, what they, essentially what they've done is they've repealed the Fourth Amendment, right? Search and seizure, they can do it without probable cause. Everybody is being searched. Everybody's a potential terrorist. So they've got probable cause for everybody, in theory. And so what they do, they'll post on their website the guns and drugs or whatever that they seized in these scanners. Well, of course, if you search everybody, you're gonna you're gonna find some criminals or whatever, but the cost of doing that is dramatic. Moreover, the fact that people have sure been trained to have, you know, compliance. It's like the Soviet Union, right? Where, um, you know, just grudgingly, all right, go along with this extremely stupid thing. What's my point? The point is, this is a really stupid regulation that has existed in plain sight of everybody for 20 years. We're still taking off our shoes, okay? Because some shoe bomber, whatever number of years ago, okay. All of this stuff is there as opposed to there's a zillion other things you could potentially do, different paradigms for, quote, airport security. But now apply that to FDA. Just like T a lot of what TSA does is security theater, arguably all of it. A lot of what FDA does is safety theater. The difference is there's far fewer people who go through the aperture. They're the biotech and pharma CEOs, okay? So you don't have, a, you don't have an understanding of what it is to deal with them, number one. Number two is the penalty is not a few hundred dollars of missing your flight 
It is a few million dollars or tens or hundreds of millions of dollars for getting your company subject to the equivalent of a retaliatory wait time. Just like that bouncer threw you out, just like the TSA officer, if you make a joke or, you know, they can just sit you down and make you lose your flight, right? So too, can the FDA just silently impede the approval of something and choke you out financially because you don't have enough runway to get funded, right? So it's just impose more wait time. Guess what? We want another six months. You know, data is going to take you another six months. Your company doesn't have the time. You die, right? If you live, you have to raise a round at some dilutive valuation. And now the price gets jacked up on the other side. That's the one thing that can give, by the way, in this whole process. When, when you push out timelines from days to get a vaccine approved with, or a vaccine evaluated rather via challenge trials to months or years, the cost during that time, when you when you it just increases nonlinearly, right? Because you can't iterate on the product. It, all the normal observations: if it takes you ten years to launch a product versus ten days, what's the difference in terms of your speed of iteration, your cost, et cetera, right? So this is part of what. It's not the only thing. There's other things. There's AMA and CPT. There's other things. But um, this is one of the things that jacks up prices in the U.S. medical system. Okay. So now you have something where these CEOs. They're going through this aperture. They are. Uh, they can't tell anybody about it because if you read Reputation and Power, okay, I'm going to just quote this because it's an amazing, amazing book, right? It's written by a guy, you know, Daniel Carpenter, who's a smart guy, but he's an FDA sympathizer. He fundamentally thinks it's like a good thing or what have you. Nevertheless, I respect Carpenter's intellectual honesty because he quotes the CEOs in the book you know, verbatim, and he gives some paragraphs. And essentially from their descriptions, it's like, um, think about like a Vietnam War thing where you've got a POW and they're like blinking through their eyes, I'm being tortured, mm -hmm. okay? That is the style. When you read Carpenter's book, you read the quotes from these um, from these CEOs. Oh, let me see if I can find it. Do you recommend the book? It's a good book, yeah. Or it's it's now a little bit outdated, okay? because it's it's like, you know, almost 10 years old. Still, as a history of the FDA, it is well worth reading. And by the way, the reason I say it, like the FDA is so insanely important. It's so much more important than many other things that people talk about, but they don't talk about it, right? I just want to read his little blurb for it, right? This is 2010. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration is the most powerful regulatory agency in the world. How did the FDA become so influential? And how does it wield its extraordinary power Reputation power traces the history of FDA regulation of pharmaceuticals, uh, revealing how the agency's organizational reputation has been the primary source of its power is also one of uh, its ultimate constraints. Carpenter describes how the FDA cultivated a reputation for competence and vigilance throughout the last century and how this organizational image has enabled the agency to regulate while resisting efforts to curb its own authority. First of all, just that description alone, you're like, wait a second. He is describing this as an active player. Mm -hmm. It's not like a DMV kind of thing, which is passed through. It's it's talking about cultivating a reputation, its power, resisting efforts to curb its own authority, right? The thing is, now you're kind of through the looking glass. You're like, wait a second, this is kind of language I don't usually hear for regulate, regulatory agencies. The thing is, the kind of person who becomes the CEO of a giant company, what do they want to do? They want to expand that company. They want to make more profit. Similarly, the kind of person who comes to run a regulatory agency or one of the subunits, or, that person wants to expand its ambit. Okay. But is that always obvious? And sorry to interrupt, but right. for the CEO of the company, I know that the philosophical ideal of capitalism is you want to make the thing more profitable, but we're also human beings. Do you think there's some fundamental aspect to which we want to do a lot of good in the world? Sure, and but the fiduciary duty will push people to get the ambitious, you know, the, the profit maximizing expansionist CEO is selected for, right? Basically, they, they believe, crucially, they're not just, this is important, they're not just I mean, some of them are Grand Theft Auto, make as much money as possible, but they believe in the mission, okay? They've come to believe in the mission, and that is the person who's selected. Chomsky actually had this good thing, which is like, I believe that you believe what you believe, but if you didn't believe what you believe, you wouldn't be sitting here. Right. So right? they select for the kind of people that are able to make a lot of money, 
And in that process, uh, those people are able to have construct a narrative that they're doing good, even though what they were selected for is the fact that they can make a lot of money. Yeah, and, and they may actually be doing good. But the thing is, with CEOs, we have a zillion images in television and media movies of the evil corporation and the greedy CEO. We have some concept of what CEO failure modes are like, okay? Now, when have you ever seen an evil regulator? Have you, can you name a fictional portrayal of an evil regulator? Can you name an evil CEO? Z yeah, tons. a lot, a lot, a right. lot, a lot. But it, that's so interesting. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm searching for a deeper lesson here. You're right. You're right. I mean, there is, there is of portrayals, especially in sort of authoritarian regimes or of the Soviet Union, where there's bureaucracy, you know, Chernobyl, you can kind of see within that there's a, the reg the story of the regulator, but um, yeah, it's it's not as plentiful, and it also doesn't have, often doesn't have a face to it. It's almost yes. like bureaucracy is this amorphous thing that results any one individual you see they're just obeying somebody else there's not a face to it of evil that's the, right. the evil is the entire machine that's right that's what i call the school of fish strategy by the way it's something where you are an individual and you can be signaled out but there's more accountability for one person's bad tweets than all the wars in the middle east right because it's a school of fish yeah right so if the establishment is wrong if the bureaucracy is wrong, they're all wrong at the same time. Who could have known? Whereas if you deviate, then you are a deviation who can be hammered down, okay? Now, the school fish strategy is unfortunately very successful because, uh, you know, truth is whatever. If you just always ride with the school of fish and turn when they turn and so on, uh, unless there's a bigger school of fish that comes in, you basically can never be proven wrong, right? And this is actually, you know, of course, someone who believes in truth and believes in, you know, innovation and so on, just physiologically can't ride with the school of fish. You just have to say what is true or do what is true, right? Still, you've described correctly, you know, how it's faceless, right? So I will give two examples of fictional portrayals of evil regulators. One is actually the original Ghostbusters. Okay. <laughs> Did not expect that one, but yes. Yeah. So the EPA is actually the villain in that, where they flip a switch that lets out all the ghosts in the city. And essentially the guy is coming in with a head of steam as this evil regulator that's just totally arrogant, doesn't actually understand the private sector or, or the consequences of their actions. And they force the, and, and crucially, they bring a cop with them with a gun. So it shows that a regulator is not simply, you know, some piece of paper, but it is the police, Right. And that cop with the gun forces the Ghostbusters to like release the containment and the whole thing spreads. Yeah. The second example is Dallas Buyers Club, which is more recent. And that actually shows the FDA blocking a guy who, with a life-threatening illness, uh, you know, with AIDS, from getting the drugs to treat his condition and from getting it to other people, right? Those are just two portrayals. But in general, what you find is when you talk about FDA with people, one thing I'll often hear from folks is like, why would they do that? It's an FDA being targeted the personal genomics companies, but those conflicted, right? Um, it's a little bit like CFTC and SEC have a door jam over who will regulate cryptocurrency, right? Sometimes regulators fight each other, but they fight each other. They are, they fight companies. They are, they are active players. This reputation and power book, the reason I mention it is um, I'm going to see if I can find this quote. So let me see if I can find this quote. Reputation and power, organizational image, and pharmaceutical regulation at the FDA. So Genentech's executive, G. Kirk Robb, right? Robb would describe regulatory approval for his products as a fundamental challenge facing his company. And he would depict the administration in a particularly vivid metaphor. I've told the story hundreds of times to help people understand the FDA. When I was in Brazil, I worked on the Amazon River for many months selling teramycin for Pfizer. I hadn't seen my family for eight or nine months. They were flying into Sao Paulo, as I and I was flying down from some little village on the Amazon to Manus and then to Sao Paulo. I was a young guy in his 20s. I couldn't wait to see the kids. One of them was a year-old baby. The other was three. I missed my wife. There was a Quonset hut in front of just a little dirt strip with a single-engine plane to fly me to Manus. I roll up, and there's a Brazilian soldier there. 
The military revolution had happened literally the week before. So this soldier is standing there with his machine gun and he said to me, you can't come in. I speak in pr pretty good Portuguese by that time. I said, my God, my plane, my family, I got to come in. He said again, you can't come in. I said, I got to come in. And he took his machine gun, took the safety off and pointed at me and said, you can't come in. And I said, oh, now I got it. I can't go in there. And that's the way I always describe the FDA. The FDA is standing there with a machine gun again. Your primary customer. If they cut the cord on you, you have no other customers. And in fact, until very recently with the advent of social media, no one would even tell your story. It was assumed that you were some sort of, you know, corporate criminal that they were protecting the public from, that you were going to put poison in milk you know, like the melamine scandal in China. I'm not saying those things don't exist, by the way. They do exist. That's why people are like, they can immediately summon to mind all the examples of corporate criminals, right? That's why I mentioned those fictional stories, those templates. Even if Star Wars doesn't exist, how many times have you heard a Star Wars metaphor or whatever for something, right? Breaking Bad, you know, go ahead. Yeah, but the, by, <laughs> the pharmaceutical companies are stu stuck between a rock and a hard place because the reputation, if they go to Twitter, or they go to social media, they have horrible reputation. So it's like they don't yes. know. But why is that? Because reputation and power. FDA beat down the reputation of pharma companies, just like EPA helped beat down the reputation of oil companies. And as it says over here, right? In practice, dealing with the fact of FDA power meant a fundamental change in corporate structure and culture. At Abbott and at Genentech, Rob's most central transformation was in creating a culture of acquiescence towards a government agency. As was done at other drug companies in the late 20th century, Rob essentially fired officials at Abbott who were insufficiently compliant with the FDA. Mm -hmm. What that means is de facto nationalization of the industry via regulation. Just to hover on that, that's a really big deal. Because if their primary customer is this government agency, then it has nationalized it just indirectly, right? This is partially what's just happened with... Um, Microsoft, Apple, Google, Amazon, the other MAGA, okay? They have been, uh, well, that's nice. funny. Right? Well, well done. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even think about that. It's well done. It was, right, so it's uh, so the, you know, like I have this tweet, it's like MAGA Republicans and MAGA Democrats, right? Uh, okay. Oh, damn it. So many things you've said today will just get stuck in my head. Um, it changes the way you think. Ke catchy. Something about catchy phrasing of ideas is, makes me even more powerful. Uh, so yeah, okay. So that's happening in the tech. Sector. It's happening in tech. So Facebook is the outlier because Zuck still controls the company. But just like, I mean, why had tech had a good reputation for a while? Because there wasn't a regulatory agency whose justification was regulating these corporate criminals. Mm -hmm. Right. Once that is the case, the regulatory agency basically comes back to Congress each year. And if you look at its budget approvals, it's saying, we find this many guys, we found this many violations, right? They have an incentive to exaggerate the threat in the same way that a prosecutor or, you know, a policeman has a quota, right? Like these are the police. You know, one way I describe it also is like, um, you, you know, like a step down transformers, you have, you have high voltage electricity is generated at the uh, power plant. And it comes over the wires and then there's step down transformers that turn it into a lower voltage that you can just deal with out of your appliances, right? Similarly, you have something where the high voltage of like the US military or the police, and that is transmitted down into a little letter that comes in your mailbox saying, pay your $50 parking ticket, where it's a piece of paper. So you don't see the gun attached to it. But if you were to defy that, it's like Grand Theft Auto, where you get one star, two star, three stars, four stars, five stars, and eventually, you know, you have some, some serious stuff on your hands, okay? So once you understand that, you know, every law is backed by force, like that Brazilian guy with the machine gun that uh, Rob mentioned, these guys are the regulatory police, okay? Now, see, for a time, what happened was you had the captured industry because all of the folks who were in pharmaceuticals were, as Carpenter said, um, 
the, the, a culture of acquiescence towards the FDA. The FDA was their primary customer. So just like in a sense, it's rational, you know, Amazon talks about being customer obsessed, mm-hmm. right? What Rob did was rational for that time, mm-hmm. right? What G Kerp Rob did was uh, saying our customer is the FDA. That's our primary customer. Nobody else matters. They are satisfied first. Every single trade-off that has to be made is FDA, right? And, uh, you know, really that's why the two most important departments at many pharmaceutical companies, arguably all, are regulatory affairs and IP, not R&D, right? Because one is artificial scarcity of regulation, which jacks up the price, and the other is artificial scarcity of the patent, which allows people to maintain the high price, right? So this entire thing is just like, you know, college education. These things may at some point have been a, a good concept, but the price has just risen and risen and risen until it's at the limit price and beyond, okay? Mm-hmm. So- What has changed? What's changed is in the 2010s, uh, the late 2000s and 2010s and so on, with the advent of social media, with the advent of a bunch of millionaires um, like who are are independent, uh, with the advent of um, Uber and Airbnb, right? With the advent of cryptocurrency, with the diminution of trust in institutions, it used to be really taboo to even talk about the FDA as potentially bad in like you know, 2010, 2009. Okay. But now people have just seen face plant after face plant by the institutions and people are much more open to the concept that they may actually not have it all together. And I think it's a, you know, you, you could probably see some tracking poll or something like that, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's like a 20 or 30 point drop after the CDC failed to control disease and the FDA failed and the entire biomedical regulatory establishment and scientific establishment was saying masks don't work before they do. This was just a train crash of all the things that you're paying for that you, you supposedly think are good. As I mentioned, one response is to go QAnon and people say, oh, don't trust anything. But the better response is decentralizing FDA. Okay. So I will say one other thing, which is I mentioned um, you know, this concept of improving the Form 3500B where you like scan... Go ahead. No, yeah, yeah, right. That just makes me laugh. The I could just tell the form sucks by the fact that it has that code name. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Right. UX is broken at every layer. Yeah. yeah. So, so they have a bad Yelp for drugs. Could we make a better one? We could make a better one. Just modern UX. Mm-hmm. The key insight here, by the way, which is a non-obvious point, and I've got a whole talk on this actually uh, that I should probably release. I actually did like almost eight, nine years ago. It's called Regulation is Information. Product quality is a digital signal. Okay, what do I mean by that? Basically, when I talk about exit, you know, exit the the Fed, that's the crypto economy, right? What does exit the FDA look like? Well, one key insight is that many of the big scale tech companies can be thought of as cloud regulators rather than land regulators. What do I mean by that? Well, first, what is regulation? People do want a regulated marketplace. They want A, quality ratings, like on a one to five star scale, and B, bands of bad actors, like the zero star frauds and scammers and so on. And these are distinct, right? Somebody who's like a low quality but well-intentioned person is different than a smart and evil person. Those are two different kinds of failure modes you could have in a marketplace, right? Why is it rational for people to want a regulated marketplace, especially for health? Because they want to pay essentially one entry cost, and then they don't have to evaluate everything separately where they may not have the technical information to do that, right? You don't want to go to Starbucks and put a dipstick into every um, coffee to see if it's poisoned or something like that. You sort of want to enter a zone where you know things are basically good and you pay that one diligence cost on the zone itself, right? Whether it's a digital or physical zone, and then the regulator's taking care of it and they've baked in the regulatory cost into, you know, some subscription fee of some kind, right? Mm -hmm. So the thing is, the model we've talked about is the land regulator of a nation. eBay, that is Airbnb, that is Uber and Lyft and, and so on and so forth. It's also actually Gmail and Google. Why? Because you're doing spam filtering and uh, you are doing ranking of, of mails with a priority inbox, right? Uh, with Google itself, they ban malware links right? So the bad actors are out and they're ranking them, right? How about Apple, the app store, right? They ban bad actors and they do star ratings. When you start actually applying this lens, PayPal, you know, they've got a reputation store. Every single web service 
that's at the scale of like tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people has had to build a cloud regulator. And the crucial thing is it scales across borders. So you can use the data from Mexico to help somebody in Moldova or vice versa, right? Because it's fundamentally international, right? Those ratings, you have a network effect. And um, there's another aspect to it, which is these are better regulators than the land regulators. For example, Uber is a better regulator than the taxi medallions. Why? Every ride is GPS tracked. There's ratings on both the driver and the passenger side. Both parties, you know, know that payment can be rendered in a, in a standard currency, right? If you have below a certain star rating on either side, you get deplatformed and, and so on to protect either a rider or a driver and on and on, right? Mm -hmm. What does that do? Think about how much better that is than taxi medallions rather than a six month or annual inspection. Um, you have reports from every single rider, okay? Before Uber, it was the, you know, the taxi drivers and taxi regulators were in a little monopoly locally, mm -hmm. okay? Because they were the persistent actors in the ecosystem. Taxi riders had nothing in common, didn't even know each other. Some, you know, in New York, some guy gets in a taxi, another guy, they had no way to communicate with each other. So the persistent actors in the ecosystem were the, were the regulators and the drivers. And they had this cozy kind of thing and medallion prices just kept going up. And this was this sort of collaboration on artificial scarcity. Afterwards, with Uber and Lyft and other entrants, you had something interesting, a different kind of regulator driver fusion. If you assume regulatory capture exists and lean into it, mm -hmm. Uber is the new regulator and Uber drivers are the drivers. Lyft is the comp competing regulator and Lyft drivers are the new drivers, okay? So you have a regulator driver fusion versus another regulator driver fusion. You no longer have a monopoly. You have multiple parties, okay? You have a competitive market. This is the concept of like polycentric law, right? Where you have multiple different legal regimes in the same jurisdiction overlapping that you can choose between with a tap of a button, right? All these concepts from like libertarian theory, like, you know, polycentric law or catalysis, all these things are becoming more possible now that the internet has increased microeconomic leverage. And um, because that exit is now possible. Now, you may argue, oh, well, Lyft and Uber, they're not profitable anymore. And there's two different criticisms of them. One is, oh, they're not profitable or, oh, they're charging too much. Or, and I think part of this is because of certain kinds of, the, 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 the regulatory state is caught up to try to make them uncompetitive. For example, they don't allow people in some states to identify themselves as independent contractors, even if they are part-time, okay? Um, there's various other kinds of rules and regulations. You know, in Austin for a while, Uber was even banned, what have you, right? Net-net though, like, Uber, Grab, Gojek, Lyft, Didi, like ride sharing as a concept is now out there. And whatever the next version is, whether it's self-driving, like while it's like a very hard fought battle and the regulatory state keeps trying to push things back into the garage, this is a fundamentally better way of just doing regulation of taxis. Similarly, Airbnb for hotels. I mean, I don't even have to, it's basically the same thing. Okay. And, um, now, Airbnb could use competition. I think that it would be good to have, you know, like competition for them. And there are other kinds of sites opening up. But the fundamental concept of the cloud regulator now, let's apply it here. Once you realize regulation is information, the way you would set up a competitor to FDA or SEC or FAA or something like that is you just do better reviews. Mm -hmm. Like you just start with that. That's pure information. You're under free speech. That's like still you know, the most defended thing, literally just publishing reviews and not just reviews by any old person. It turns out that FDA typically will use expert panels where there's expert panels. It's like professors from Harvard or, you know, things like that. Um, so what that is, is this concept of a reputational bridge. What you want to do is you want to have folks who are, let's say, biotech entrepreneurs or they're, you know, uh, profs like Sinclair or what have you. You do want to have the reviews of the crowd. Okay. But you also want to have, especially in medicine, biomedicine, you want to have the reviews of experts mm -hmm. of some kind. So there's going to be defectors from the current establishment. Okay. Just like, you know, there are profs who defected from computer science academia to become Larry and Sergey and whatever, you know, they, or they weren't profs, but they were grad students, right? Um, in the same way, you'll have defectors uh, who have the credentials from the old world, but can build up the new. Just like there's folks from Wall Street who have come into cryptocurrency and helped legitimate it, right? Just like there's folks who left um, Salzberger to come to Substack. Okay. 
Um, you know, mm -hmm. we have we have these folks who by defecting, they help and then they're also supplemented by all this new talent coming in, right? That combination of things is how you build a new system. It's not completely by itself, nor is it trying to reform the old, it's some fusion. Okay. So in this new system, who do you have? You have like the most entrepreneurial and innovative MDs, you have the most entrepreneurial and innovative professors, and you have the founders of actual new products and stuff. And they are giving open source reviews of these products. And they're also building a community that will say, look, we want this new drug or we want this new treatment or we want this new device and we're willing to crowdfund 10,000 units. So please give us the thing and we'll write a very fair review of it and we'll also all evaluate it as a community and so on. So you turn these people from just passive patients into active participants in their health. That's the community part. And they've got the kind of biomedical technical leadership there. Now, what is the kind of prototype of something like this? Something like VitaDAO is very interesting. Things like Molecule DAO are very interesting. It'll start with things like longevity, right? And why is that? Because the entire model of FDA, this 20th century model, um, is wait for somebody to have a disease and then try to cure them, okay? Versus, you know, saying an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? Why are we not actually tracking folks and getting a constant dashboard on yourself so you can see whether things are breaking and then you you deal with it just like you've got server uptime things. You don't wait necessarily for the site to go down. You start seeing, oh, response rates are spiking. We need to add more servers, right? You have some warning, okay? Even 10 years ago, there's this uh, article called uh, The Measured Man in the Atlantic where this guy, physicist Larry Smarr, okay? What he was doing is he was essentially doing a bunch of measurements on himself. And he was finding that uh, there were predictors of inflammation that were spiking. And he went to the doctor, showed the charts, and the doctor was like, I can't do anything with this. Mm -hmm. Then that, that turned out to be an early warning of like a serious condition that he had to, I think, go for like, you know, surgery or, or, or something. And he was starting to think, well, look, the way that we're doing medicine right now is it's not quite um, like pre-germ theory of disease, but it is pre-continuous diagnostics. Okay. Pre continuous diagnostics, just to talk about this for a second, this is, I, I mentioned one angle on which you go after FDA, which is like the, the better phase four, right? I've mentioned the concept of better reviews in general. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mentioned VitaDAO, which is like a community that is going after longevity. Let's talk about continuous diagnostics. So basically we know better what is going on in Bangalore or Budapest than in our own body. That's actually kind of insane to think about. The stuff that, you know, it's all the way on the other side of the world, 10,000 miles away, but, you know, a few millimeters away, you don't really know what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. And that's starting to change with all the quantified self devices, the hundreds of millions of Apple watches and Fitbits and stuff, right? You're also starting to see continuous glucose meters, which is very important. They're starting to give you readouts. People are seeing, wow, this is spiking my insulin um, or, or rather, this is spiking my, my blood sugar. And uh, it might be something you didn't predict. It varies for different people. For some people, you know, banana isn't a big deal. For others, it's actually quite bad for their blood sugar. What happens when you extend that? Well, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, a guy, Mike Snyder, um, professor at Stanford, did something called the Integrome, where he just threw the kitchen sink of all the diagnostics he could at himself over the period of, I think, a few weeks or a few months. I forget the exact duration. And he's able to do things where you could see during that period, he like got a cold or something. And he could see in the expression data, the gene expression data, that he was getting sick before he felt sick. He could also see that something about that like viral infection like uh, made him develop diabetes-like symptoms, if I'm rem remembering it accurately. So you could see, oh, wait a second. These are things that are um, that I can see in my readouts that I would only have the vaguest interpretation of as like a human being, right? And Moreover, he could take, uh, you know, I don't think he did this, but if you took treatments, if you took drugs, right, you could actually show what your steady state was if you tracked over time, show what your disease state or sick state was, and then this drug pushes you back into non-disease state. You can actually get a quantitative readout of what, you know, like steady state was, right? 
So that and and that steady state, you know, your expression levels across all these genes, uh, your small molecules, basically everything you can you you can, you can measure, that's going to vary from person to person, right? What's healthy and natural for you may be a different baseline than for me. For example, people who are small example, people who are South Asian um, or have dark skin tend to have vitamin D deficiency. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we need a lot of sunlight. So often inside you're tapping in your screen. So what do we do? Take like actually significant vitamin D infusions, okay? That's like a small example of where baselines differ between people, okay? So continuous diagnostics, what could that mean? That could mean, you know, it's things like the continuous glucose meter, it's quantified self, it's like continuous blood testing, right? So you have a so-called mobile phlebotomist. This is something which uh, phlebotomist takes blood, right? Mobile phlebotomy would come to your office, come to your remote office. This is a great business for people. I think, you know, you can revisit this in, in 2022. It, people tried this in the 2010s, but I think it's re worth revisiting. Mobile phlebotomist comes every week or every month, mm -hmm. takes blood, runs every test, right? Maybe that's, you know, a few thousand dollars a year, maybe, maybe eventually gets to a few hundred dollars a year. Um, and that's expensive in some ways, but boy, that's better health insurance in other ways. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's amazing. So one, there's a bunch of companies that do this and I actually would love to learn more about them. What, what, one of them is a company called Inside Tracker that sponsors this podcast, they do that. But the, the reason I really appreciate them, they're the first ones that introduced me to like how easy sure. it is, but it's also depressing how little information exactly as you beautifully put once again, how little information we have about our own body in a continuous sense. Yes. And actually also sadly, even with Inside Tracker, as I collect that data, how not integrated that data is with everything else. Right. If I wanted to opt in, I would like, I, I can't just like riffing off the top of my head, but I would like Google Maps to know what's going on inside my body. That's right. Maybe I can't intuit at first why that application is useful, but there could be an incredible, like that's where the entrepreneurial spirit builds, is like, what can I do with that data? Can I make the trip more less stressful for you and adjust the Google Maps and kind of thing? That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things about this, by the way, is because there are so many movies made about Theranos, okay? That's one of the reasons why people have sort of been scared off from doing diagnostics uh, to some extent, okay? Why? Because VCs are like, oh, is this another Theranos? And like the diligence and everything, everyone's looking at it, oh, blood testing, one drop of blood, huh? Help hurts with the recruiting. Essentially, um, a lot of the media and stuff around that basically has pathologized the thing that we want to have a lot more entrance in, right? Now, you know, one way of thinking about it is FDA has killed way more people than Theranos has, mm -hmm. all right? Way more. Just take drug lag alone, okay? Whenever you have a drug that works and reduced morbidity and mortality after it was actually generally available, but was delayed for months or years, the integral under that curve is the excess morbidity and mortality attributable to FDA's drug lag. Mm -hmm. I think that has a total monopoly on global health and... Um, you know, it, it, you, you can't know what it is without that unless you have zones that are FDA free, but that have some form of regulation. As I mentioned, it's a V3. It's not going back to zero regulation, everybody, you know, man for itself, but it's a more reputable regulator, just like, um, you know, Uber is a better regulator than the taxi medallions, right? Yeah, I mean, you're painting such an incredible picture. <laughs> you're making me wish you were FDA commissioner. But I, I there are a bunch of people who tweeted something like that after the, you know, with the pandemic. Um, whatever. Go ahead. Yeah. Is that is that possible? Like, if you were just given, uh, if you became FDA commissioner, could you could you push for those kinds of changes, or is that really something that has to come from the outside? The short answer is no. And the longer answer, meaning. <laughs> the long, that'd be funny if you're like, the short answer is no, the long answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so basically, see, a CEO of a company, it's, while well, it's very difficult, they can hire and fire, right? Mm -hmm. So in theory, they can do surgery on the organism. And like, you know, Steve Jobs took over Apple and was able to hire and fire, raise money, do this, that. He basically had root over Apple, that he was a system administrator, right? Mm -hmm. He had he had full permissions, okay? 
As FDA commissioner, you do not have full permissions over FDA, let alone like the whole structure around it, right? If you're FDA commissioner, you are not the CEO of the agency, okay? Lots of these folks there uh, have career tenure. They they can't be fired. Um, they can't even really be disciplined. There's something called the Douglas factors. You ever heard the Douglas factors? It's like the Miranda rights for federal employees, okay? You know, the right man says it. So basically... If you've heard that federal employees can't be fired, the Douglas factors are how that's actually operationalized. Mm -hmm. When you try to fire somebody, it's this whole process where they get to appeal it and so on and so forth. And they're sitting in the office while you're trying to fire them. And they're complaining to everybody around them that this guy's trying to fire me, he's such a bad guy, blah, blah, right? And everybody around, even if you know, they may think that guy is doing a bad job. They're like, wait a second, he's trying to fire you. He might try to fire me too. And so anybody who tries to fire somebody at FDA just gets uh, a face full of lead for their troubles. What they instead will do is sometimes they'll just transfer somebody to the basement or something so they don't have to deal with them if they're truly bad, okay? But the thing about this is there is only one caveat, Douglas factor number eight. The notoriety of the offense or its impact upon the reputation of the agency. There's that word again, reputation of reputation and power. Mm -hmm. So the one way you can truly screw up within a regulatory bureaucracy is if you sort of endanger the like annual budget renewal. Think of it as like this mini Death Star that's coming to dock against the max Death Star for its like annual refuel. And it's talking about all the corporate criminals that it's prosecuted, the quotas, like the police quotas, the ticketing, you know, and if they don't have a crisis, they will like invent one. Just again, just like TSA, just like other agencies you're more familiar with, you can kind of map it back. Look at the guns and drugs we've seized. Sorry. And so they have an incentive for, uh, you know, creating these crises or, or manufacturing them or exaggerating them. And if you endanger that refueling, that annual budget renewal or, you know, what have you, then the whole agency will basically be like, okay, you're, you're bad and you can be disciplined or sometimes, you know, with rare except, you know, you can be booted. But what that means is that FDA commissioner is actually a white elephant. It's a ceremonial role, really, right? You know, you know the term white elephant, it's like uh, basically, you know, the Maharaja gives you an el a white elephant as a gift. Seems great. Next day. It's eaten all of your grass. It's pooped on your lawn. It has like just put a foot on your car and smashed it. But you can't give it away. It's a white elephant. The Maharaja gave it to you, mm -hmm. right? That's what being like FDA commissioner is. It's the kind of thing where if, and a lot of people are drawn in like moths to the flame for these titles of the establishment. I want to be head of this. I want to be head of that, right? And really what it is, it's like, I don't know, becoming head of Kazakhstan in the mid-1980s in the Soviet Union, the Kazakhstan SSR, right? Soviet Socialist Republic, before the thing was going to like crumble potentially, right? In, in many ways, it's becoming, you know, folks who are just totally status obsessed getting these positions. But um, like a lot of the merit all, all the folks with merit are kind of leaving the government and going into, you know, tech or crypto or what have you, right? So even if these agencies were hollow before, in some ways they're becoming hollower because they have less talent there, right? So A, you can't hire and fire very easily. You can hire a little bit. You can't really fire. Um, B, a lot of the talent has left the building, but was there. C, we're entering the decentralizing era. And D, you know, like... Be like Satoshi. Satoshi founded Bitcoin because he knew you could not reform the Fed. There's everybody's trying to go and reform, reform, reform. And the reason they're trying to reform is we haven't figured out the mechanism to build something new. And now perhaps we have that. So I've named a few of them, right? I'll name one more. Related to the literance. Fitness is actually the back door to a lot of medicine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why is that? Um, you go to any, you know, conference, it could be neurology, it could be cardiology. You'll find somebody who's giving a talk that says something along the lines of, Fitness is the ultimate drug. Maybe not today when people are saying, oh, fat phobic, whatever, but not too many years ago, you would see somebody 
um, people saying fitness is the ultimate drug. If we could just prescribe fitness in a pill, that would improve your cardiovascular function, your neurological function, yeah. deals with depression. By the way, in that case, the the use of the word drug means medicine. So medicine, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, uh, fitness is the ultimate medicine. Yeah, yeah, the ultimate medicine, right? So if they could just prescribe. Yeah, it's funny because it's true. And so your fitness, your diet, that's your responsibility. But when you go into a doctor's office, suddenly it becomes lie back and think of England. Mm -hmm. Okay, suddenly you become passive. Suddenly, oh, you're doc. I have a medical degree and that doctor, see the thing is if you come in and you, you've self-diagnosed or you've done some of your own research, if you're right, they're, and then if they've got an ego about it, they're undermined. And if you're wrong, they're like, you know, ha ha, you know, arrogant. But either way, they have, if they've got the, this kind of mindset, they have an incentive to resist the patient taking care of themselves. Isn't that the doctor's job, right? And they're kind of taught to behave like this, many of them. So what that means then is that intervention of that 15 or 30 minute appointment with the doctor, whatever drug they prescribe better hit you like Thor's hammer to put you back on the straight and narrow. Because that's only with you for like a few seconds, you know, a few minutes or whatever. The doctor's only with you for a few minutes. The drug is only, you know, some drugs are very powerful. So they actually do work like this. Okay. But your fitness is your own responsibility. And that's a continuing forcing function every day. And again, we get back to decentralization, right? The decentralization of responsibility from somebody thinking of themselves merely as a patient to an active participant in their own health who's doing their own monitoring of their own health, right? And logging all of their stuff, who's eating. Help people get fitter. That will also actually have just general health value, but you're not, quote, marketing them to diagnose or treat, you know, a, a disease. See what I'm saying? Yes. You're marketing them for the purpose of fitness. This is a market. Why? Because psychologically people... They, they don't like paying to get back to normal, but they will absolutely pay tons of money to get better than normal. They'll pay for fitness, they'll pay for makeup, they'll pay for hair, they'll pay for this and that, right? So that's actually the back door and you can do tons of things there where obviously being healthier is also protective. You can actually show the studies on this. So this way you build out all the tooling to get healthier and that actually helps on this axis. Few other things are just kind of a U.S. medical system. While I'm on it, because you got me yeah, on this topic, I okay. love this. Okay, so this is uh, this is the most eloquent exploration of the U.S. medical system and how to improve it, how to fix it, and what the future looks like. Yeah, so I love it. So basically, so part of it is decentralizing control back to the individual, right? Now, I have talked about FDA at length, but let me talk about some other other broken parts of the U.S. system, right? Um, there's like AMA, there's CPT, there's CPOM, there's this, you know, like all these regulations, which see normally in capitalism, you have a, uh, a buyer and a seller, right? Duh. In medicine, you have third party regulation and fourth party pricing. They're being wheeled in. And now somebody at their moment of vulnerability is charging this insane price for their care. And many people in the US have had this horrible experience where they're bankrupted or, or scared of being bankrupted by medical bills. Therefore, the concept of adding more capitalism to medicine scares them and they think it's horrible and you're some like awful, greedy tech bro kind of thing. All right. Let me let me say I understand that concern and let me, you know, kind of let me pull tease that apart a little bit, right? Basically, the most capitalistic areas of medicine are the most functional areas of medicine. So that's say the places where you can walk in and walk out, okay, whether that's dentistry, dermatology, plastic surgery, even veterinary medicine, which is not human, okay, where you can make a conscious decision, say, okay, I want this care or I don't want this. I see a price list. I can pay cash, right? If I don't like it, I go to another dermatologists. There's few dermatological emergencies. That's why dermatologists have a great quality of life. Okay. By contrast, when you're being wheeled in on a gurney, you need it right now. Okay. And you're unconscious or what have you, or you're not in a capacity to deal with it. Right. And so these are the two extremes. It's like ambulatory medicine. You can walk around and pick and like ambulance medicine. 
Okay. And what it, what that means is the more ambulatory the medicine, the more legitimate capitalism is in that situation. People are okay with a dermatologist basically turning you down because you don't have enough money and you go to another dermatologist because you can comparison shop there. It's not usually an emergency, right? Whereas if you're coming in with an ambulance, then people don't want to be turned down and I understand why, okay? What this suggests, by the way, is that you should only have insurance for the edge cases. Insurance should only cover the ambulance, not the ambulatory. I mean, most people are losing money on insurance, right? Because most people are paying more in in premiums than they are getting out. It's just that this huge flight of dollars through the air that no one can make heads or tails out of. Oh, the other aspect that's obviously broken, you know, is employer provided health insurance, which just started after World War II. So, you, you know, auto insurance is in a much more competitive market. You don't whip out your auto insurance card at the gas station to pay for your gas, right? You only whip it out when there's a crash, right? That's what, quote, health insurance should be. And the Singapore model is actually a pretty good one for this, where they have sort of a mandatory HSA. You have to like put some money in that and um, that pays for your healthcare bills, but then it's cash out of that. It's like a separate pocket, sort of forced savings to pay for- Health, health savings insurance. accounts. Health savings account, right? The thing about this is once you realize, well, first, Ambulatory medicine is capitalistic medicine. Ambulance medicine is socialist medicine, okay? You want to shift people more towards ambulatory. Guess what? That's in their interest as well. Now that brings us back to the monitoring, right? The continuous monitoring where whether eventually it's Mike Snyder's Integrome, the V1 is the quantified self and the Apple Watch and the you know continuous glucose meters, and the VN is the Mike Snyder Integrome. There's a, a site called Q.Bio, which is doing this also, right? Eventually, this stuff will hopefully just be in a device that just measures tons and tons of variables on you, right? Mm -hmm. There's ways of measuring some of these metabolites, and uh, you know, without breaking the skin, um, you know. So, so it's like it's not you don't have to keep breaking the skin over and over. There's various various ways of doing that. So now you've got something where you've got the monitoring, you've got the dashboards. You've got the alerts. And just like this Larry Smarr guy that I mentioned, the measured man, you might be able to shift more and more things to ambulatory. And one of the things about this also is the medical system is set up in a bad way where the primary care physician is the one who is like not the top of their class, but the guys who are at the bottom of the pinball machine, the surgeons and the radiologists, once your stuff is already broken, mm -hmm. okay? They're the ones who are paid the most. So a lot of the skill collects at the post-break stage, right? Right, where you actually want Doogie Howser MD is at the, the upstream stage, mm -hmm. okay? So you want this amazing, amazing doctor there, right? How could we get that? I mentioned the app that doesn't exist, which is like a better version of the 3500B, right? Here's another app that doesn't exist, and this is one that FDA has actively quashed. Why can't you just take an image of a mole or something like that you know, with the incredible cameras we have, a huge amount of medical imaging should be able to be done at home. And it goes to doctors, whether it's in the US or the Philippines or India. I mean, teleradiology exists, right? Why can you not do that for dermatology, for everything else? You should be able to literally just hold the thing up and with a combination of both AI and MDs, just diagnose. That should exist, mm -hmm. right? Um, answer is, there's a combination of both American doctors and the FDA that team up to prevent this or slow this. Um, and you know, one argument is, oh, the AI is not better than a human 100% of the time because it's not deployed yet. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it could make an error. Therefore, it's bad. Even if it's better than 99% of doctors, 98% of the time. Uh, another argument is the software has to go through design control. Okay. Now, basically, once you understand how FDA works, Basically, imagine the most Sorry. D talked about how there's lots of things where you could have a combination of doctor and AI and an app um, that you kind of quickly self-diagnose. Some of this is happening now. The the some of the telemedical telemedicine laws were relaxed during COVID, where now people, you know, a doctor from Wyoming can prescribe for somebody in Minnesota. Like some of that stuff was relaxed during COVID. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's other broken things in medical system. I'll just name two more and then kind of move on, okay? Mm. I mentioned like AMA and CPT, okay? 
those are two regulatory bodies. AMA, American Medical Association, CPT, current procedural terminology. Okay. Basically, uh, you know, Marx's labor theory of value, where mm -hmm. people are supposed to be paid on their effort, right? Um, of course, the issue with this is that you'd be paying a physicist to try to dunk and, you know, they'd be trying, but they wouldn't actually probably be able to do it. They'd be trying real hard, whereas you actually want to pay people on the basis of results, right? Cheaply attained results are actually better than expensively attained non-results, perhaps obvious, okay? Yeah. Nevertheless, the way that the US medical system has payouts, it's based on so-called RVUs, relative value units. And this is something where there's a government body that um, sets these prices, uh, and it is in theory only for Medicare, but all the private insurers key off of that. And um, AMA, uh, basically publishes a list of these so-called, um, the CPT codes, which is like the coding, the biomedical coding of this and what each medical process is worth and whatnot. So it's like, I, I don't remember all the numbers, but, um, it's like a five digit code and it's like, okay, I got a, I got a, a test for cystic fibrosis or a test for this or a test for that. God help you if your, um, medical billing is erroneous. Why? The insurance company will reject it because um, it doesn't pay for that. This is this giant process of trying to encode, um, you know, every possible ailment and condition into these CPT codes, and that you can literally get degrees in medical billing just for this. Okay, this enormous, inefficient industry. Yeah. Okay, like literally, medical billing is a whole field. Okay. Yeah. Now, what do you want to do when you grow up? I want to work in medical billing. In medical billing, okay? Where everybody's mad at you at all times. Yeah. Part of what happens is when you give a treatment, when a doctor gives a treatment to a patient, they can't like repo the treatment, okay? Like a car, you sell a car, you can in theory repo the car. So the patient has a treatment. Now, um, what happens? Well, the insurance company... Uh, you know, that, that treatment is perhaps provided, look, it's a lab test provided by a company, right? The company bills the patient. The company is supposed to charge a high price. Why? The insurance company wants it to try to collect from the patient. The patient is scared. Oh my God, they see this huge price. They, um, they sometimes don't pay. Sometimes the insurance company doesn't pay either. And uh, when, when a company is stiffed by an insurance company, uh, when, a, when a diagnostic company is stiffed by, an, uh, stiffed by an insurance company, it has to jack up the price on everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. Everything boils down to the fact that you don't have, you know, a buyer and a seller. The doctor doesn't know the price of what is being sold. Uh, the buyer doesn't know the price of what is being bought at the time it's being bought. Uh, neither party can really even set a free price because there's this RVU system that hovers above. The buyer feels they've already bought it because they bought insurance. The insurance company doesn't want to pay for it. Everybody is trying to like push the price onto somebody else and you know, not actually show the sticker price of anything and hide everything and, and so on and so forth. Oh, the other thing about it is obviously lawsuits are over everything. Everybody's right. mad about everything. It's health, people are dying, okay? So everything is just optimized for optics as opposed to results, right? Similarly, actually many drugs are optimized for minimizing side effects and optics rather than maximizing effects, which are totally different criteria, right? You might have, for example, a drug that um, only cures a thousand people but doesn't have any side effects versus one that cures a million people but that has 10 really serious side effects a year, right? And the second one would probably not happen because those side effects would be so, so big. Okay. How do you attack this? I, I name a few examples, but I actually think the reform is going to come in part from outside the system. In particular, India is coming online. Okay. Why is that important? Well, you may have encountered an Indian doctor or two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe an Indian programmer, one or two. All right. Mm -hmm. And I do think telemedicine could explode, right? Where you could have an Indian doctor, um, you know, in India, and there's a US doctor, okay, who's like a dispatcher. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. They've got all these other Indian doctors behind them. They've got a structure is surprisingly good. It's not as good as China's in some ways, 
but it's like better than the US's, which is like healthier.gov and like non-existent. It's like kind of impressive how good some of India's software is. The fact that it exists is good. So you have all these new doctors coming online. India cranks out generics, right? Telemedicine is now more legal in the US. And you have a uh, cash payment in India, right? And in a lot of other places, you don't have the whole insurance employer health thing. And this market is growing. So you could have a sort of parallel market that starts evolving, right? Which is, and people are already doing some medical tourism. I think that's another exit from the FDA. You have a parallel market that starts evolving that just starts from fundamentally different premises. <laughs> to just let your system fail and then wheel you in, right? Um, there's a reputational bridge because now we've had a couple of generations almost of Indian doctors in the US. So people know that there's, you know, there's some very competent Indian doctors. They're a good chunk of AMA. And so mm -hmm. they, they can sort of lobby for this. And uh, you have plenty of Indian engineers. Now, I'm not saying India alone is a panacea. But I do think that this is a large enough parallel market to start doing interesting things. And you could see uh, sort of medical tourism, medical migration to where it gives India an opportunity to basically uh, let go of the constraints of the FDA. Yeah, because- And innovate yes. aggressively. And, and I mean, it's just such a huge opportunity to define the future of medicine and make a shit ton of money from a market that's desperate for it in the United States because of all the over the regulation. That's right. And I think basically it's something where the reason it, it needs and to And that like, would fix the FDA, sorry to interrupt. Yes, we fix the <laughs> FDA by exiting the FDA, yeah. right? And then the FDA would uh, dry out and then it would hopefully- It might reform, it might dry out, right? And this is you know why people are, for example, they're traveling across borders, you know, they're getting orders from Canadian pharmacies, yeah. you know, a lot of this type of stuff, we can start to build alternatives, right? I mean, India's generic industry is really important because it just doesn't enforce American IP there. So generic drugs are cheaper, right? And it's quite competent, it's been around for a while. So there's enough proof points there where, um, again, I'm not seeing a panacea. It's gonna be something well, which will require like American and Indian collaboration. I think there's gonna be a lot of other countries and so on that are involved. Mm -hmm. But you can start to see another poll getting set up which is a confident enough civilization that is willing to take another regulatory path, right? And that is in some ways doing better on national software than the US is, and it has enough of a bridge to the US that it can be that stimulation which you need, which is kind of something that outside poke, right? I wanna talk about India, but let me just kind of wrap up on this big FDA biomedical kind of thing, right? With the book, The Network State, the purpose of The Network State, you know, is, you know, I, I want people to be able to build different kinds of network states. I want people to build the vegan village. I want people to be able to build a, you know, if they want to do the Bendik option, like a, like a Christian network state. If, if people want to do different kinds of things, I'm open to many different things and I will fund lots of different things. Um, for me, the motivation is just like you needed to start a new currency, Bitcoin, it was easier to do that than reform the Fed. I think it's easier to start a new country than reform the FDA. And so I want to do it to, um, in particular, get to longevity, right? Meaning longevity enhancement, right? And what does that mean? So in an interesting way, and this will sound like a trite statement, but I think it's actually a deep statement, or let me hopefully try to convince you it is. Crypto is to finance sort of what longevity is to, you know, the current state of medicine. Why? It inverts certain fundamental assumptions. Okay, so at first, crypto looks like traditional finance. It's got the charts and the bands and you're buying and selling and so on. But what Satoshi did is he took fundamental premises and flipped them. For example, in the traditional macroeconomic worldview, hyperinflation is bad, but deflation is also bad. So a little inflation is good, right? In the traditional macroeconomic worldview, um, it's good that there are custodians, banks that, you know, kind of intermediate the whole system, right? In the traditional, you know, worldview, um, every transaction needs to be reversible because somebody could make a mistake and, and so on and so forth, right? In the traditional worldview, you don't really have root access over your money. 
Satoshi inverted all of those things. Okay. Obviously, you know, the big one is hyperinflation was bad, but he also thought mild inflation was bad and deflation was good. That's just a fundamental shift. Okay. He gave you root access over your money. You're now a system administrator of your own money. You can room dash RF your entire fortune or send millions with a keystroke. You are now the system administrator of your own money. That alone is why cryptocurrency is important. If you want system administration access at times to computers, you'll want it to currency, right? To be sovereign. Uh, you know, there's other assumptions where like the assumption is every transaction is private in the existing system by default, or it's, it's visible only to the state. Whereas at least the initial, you know, the Bitcoin blockchain, everything is public, right? There are various kinds of things like this where he just inverted fundamental premises. And, um, and then the whole crypto system is in the crypto economy is in many ways a teasing out of what that means. Just to give you one example, the US dollar, people have seen those graphs where it's like inflating. And so it just like loses value over time. And you've seen that. Okay. Whereas, uh, and, and most of the time it's just sort of denied that it's losing any value. The, um, the most highbrow way of defending it is the US dollar trades off temporary short-term price stability for long-term depreciation. Mm -hmm. And Bitcoin makes the opposite trade-off. In theory, at least, long-term appreciation at the expense of short-term price instability. Because like, you know, there's the whole plunge protection team and so on. Basically, th there's, there's various ways in which quote, price stability is tried to be maintained in the medium term at the expense of long-term depreciation. You need to like a reserve of assets to keep, you know, stabilizing the dollar against various things. So what does crypto medicine look like relative to fiat medicine to make the same analogy, right? The existing medical system, it assumes that um, a quick death is, is bad, an early death is bad, but also that living forever is either unrealistic or impossible or undesirable that you should die with dignity or, or something like that. Okay. So a little death is good. Mm -hmm. That's the existing medical system. Whereas the concept of life extension and, you know, David Sinclair and, you know, what you call, you call it health span says, rejects that fundamental premise. And it says, actually, the way to defeat cancer is to defeat aging. Aging is actually a program biomedical but biological process, and we can, we have results that are showing stopping or even reversing aging in some ways. And so now, just like, uh, just like with with, uh, with the other thing, you say a quick death is bad, and so is actually death itself, right? So we actually want significant life extension. This is similar. It's very it's very similar to what uh, you know the the rejection of the the fiat system, right? The fiat system says a little inflation is good. Fiat medicine says a little death is good. Bitcoin says, actually, no inflation, just get more valuable over time. And crypto medicine says, actually, let's you know extend life. This leads to all kinds of new things where you start actually thinking about, all right, how do I maintain my health with, um, you know, diagnostics? How do I, um, you know, take control of my own, own health with the decentralization of medicine? All the stuff that I've been describing sort of fits like longevity is traditional medicine. About death, is that is that an obvious thing? Is longevity obviously good versus, for example, the, the devil's advocate to that would be, what we want is to keep death sure. and maximize the quality of life up until the end. Well, like so that uh, you you ride into the sunset healthy. Somebody who is listening to the whole podcast would say, "Well, Balji, just a few hours ago you were saying this gerontocracy runs the U.S. and they're all old and they don't get it." Blah blah blah. Yeah. And now you're talking about making people live forever. So there's never any new blood to wash about. Ha ha! What a contradiction, right? It's, it's funny that you, <laughs> you're you're so on point across the, all the topics we and uh, all the topics we covered and the possible criticism. I love it. Well, just trying to anticipate, you know, some, oh, some good. right? Well done. So well done, sir. The I think the argument on that is, so long as you have a frontier, mm -hmm. it is okay for someone to live long, okay? So long as people can exit to a new thing, number one. Number two is, 
in order for us to go and, you know, colonize other planets and so on, you know, if you do want to get to Mars, if you want to become, you know, Star Trek and, you know, what have you, um, probably going to need to have, you know, like, uh, you know, just to survive a long flight, so to speak, you know, multiple light year flight, you're, you're going to need to have life extension. So to become a, a pioneering, you know, interstellar kind of thing. I know that's like, it's, it's the kind of thing which sounds like, okay, yeah. And when we're on the moon, we're going to need shovels. You know, it, it's, it sounds like a piling a fantasy on top of a fantasy in that sense. But it's also something where if you're talking about the vector of our civilization, where are we going? Well, I actually do think it's either anarcho-primitivism or optimalism slash transhumanism. Either we are shutting down civilization, it's degrowth, it's, you know, Unabomber, et cetera, or it's the stars and ex escaping the prime number maze. It's like, to me, it's obvious that we're going to, if we're to survive, expand out into space. Yes. And it's obvious that once we do, we'll look back at anyone, which is currently most people, that didn't think of this future, didn't anticipate this future, work towards this future as as Luddites, like as people who did, totally didn't get it. It will become obvious. If, right now it's impossible, and then it will become obvious. So. Yes. It seems form longevity is almost a prerequisite for the expansion out into the cosmos. That's right. Expansion of longevity. There's also like a way to bring it back to Earth to an extent, which is how were societies used to be. And minus means something, but there's no absolute zero. Mm -hmm. Then you have ordinal, where there's only ranks, and plus and minus don't mean anything. And then you have categorical, like. Uh, the Yankees and the, the 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 Braves are categorical variables. They're just different, but you all you have is the comparator operator. Whether you have a quality, you don't have a rank. Okay, so ratio scale data is the best because you can compare it across space and time. If you have a skeleton that is like you know two meters tall, that's from three thousand years ago. You can compare the height of people from many many years ago, different cultures and times, right? Whereas their currency is much harder to value. That's not like a ratio scale variable. Other things are harder to value across space and time, right? So life expectancy is good because as a ratio scale variable, with a very clear definition, right? Like when someone born and died, you know, those are actually relatively clear. Mm -hmm. um, but most other things aren't like that. You know, you, uh, that's why murder or, you know, death that, you know, it, it can be scored. It's unambiguous. You know, it's done when it's done. Whereas when does somebody get sick? Oh, well, they were kind of sick. Were they were sick today? They were sick at this hour. The boundary conditions, many other kinds of things are not like clear cut like that, right? And I should just briefly comment that life expectancy does have this quirk, a dark quirk that it, uh, when you just crudely look at it, is incorporates uh, child mortality, mortality yes. at age of one or age of five. And um, maybe it's better and clearer to look at mortality after after five or whatever. Uh, and that's still, those metrics still hold in interesting ways and measure the progress of human civilization in yes. interesting ways. Yeah. That's right. You actually want longevity biomarkers. A lot of people are working on this. There's this book called The Picture of Dorian Gray, right? And the concept is sell your soul to you know, ensure the picture rather than he will age and fade, right? And uh, so th the concept is that that thing on the wall just reflects his age and you can see it, okay? So there's a premise that's embedded in a lot of Western culture that to gain something you must lose. If, you, if you're Icarus and you try to fly, then you will, you know, you'll fly too high and it'll melt your wings. But guess what? We fly every day, commercial air flight, right? So the opposite of like the Icarus or Picture of Dorian Gray kind of thing is the movie Limitless, which I love because it's so Nietzschean and so unusual relative to the dystopian, you know, sci-fi movies where there's a, without giving, I mean, the movie's kind of old now, but um, there's a drug in it. That's Amazing. Just like, you know, yeah, there are planes that crash and we, we land, right? Okay. So why did I mention the Picture of Dorian Gray? Well, there's another aspect of it, which is Longevity biomarker, the point is to kind of estimate how many years of life you have left 
by um you know that that q.bio or integrome or or the, you you take all these analyses on on somebody right one of the best longevity biomarkers could be um just your face right you image the face and you can sort of tell oh somebody looks like they've aged oh someone looks younger etc cetera, etc cetera. and right and you have photos of them through their life right so just imaging might give a reasonably good longevity biomarker. But then you can supplement that with a lot of other variables. And now you can start benchmarking every treatment by its change in how much time you have left. Mm -hmm. If that treatment, that intervention boosts your estimated life expectancy by five years, you can see that in the data. You can get feedback on whether your longevity is being boosted or not, okay? Um, and so what this does, is it just fundamentally changes the assumptions in the system. Now, with that said, uh, you know, life extension may be the kind of thing, I'm not sure if it'll work for our generation. We may be too late. It may work for the next generation. Wouldn't that make you sad? Well, I've got something. If you're the last generation. Could be, but I've got something for you, mm -hmm. which is, uh, I call it genomic reincarnation. Okay, this one you probably haven't heard before. I've tweeted about it, okay? So, by the way, good uh, time to mention that your Twitter is one of the greatest Twitters of all time, so people should follow you. Well, Lex Friedman has one of the greatest podcasts of all time. You guys should listen to the Lex Friedman podcast, <laughs> which you may be doing, right? <laughs> which you uh, may be doing right now. Yes. Yeah. Uh, DNA, which is like creating strands of DNA. Uh, What's interesting is you can actually also do that at the full uh, chromosome level for bacterial chromosomes. Remember that thing I was saying earlier about the minimum life form, you know, that Craig Venter made? So people have synthesized like entire bacterial chromosomes and they work. Like they can literally essentially print out a living organism, all right? Now, when you go uh, from bacteria to eukaryotes, which are the... the the um, kingdom of life that we're part of, right? Yeast are part of this genome sequence. And just like we can synthesize a bacterial chromosome, we can synthesize not just one eukaryotic chromosome, but your entire complement of chromosomes in the lab, right? Because you have, you know, 23, and, you know, 46, whatever, you take the pairs. What you can do is potentially print somebody out from disk reincarnate them insofar if your sequence determines you and you can argue with this because there's epigenetics and our stuff okay but let's just say at a first order your dna sequence is lex you can sequence that okay you can do full genome sequencing and, and log that to a file then here's the you know the karma part your crypto community where you've built up enough karma among them uh -huh. if when you die, your karma balance is high enough. They will spend the money to reincarnate the next Lex, mm -hmm. who can then watch everything that happened in your past life, and you can tell them something. Mm -hmm. Everything I described there, I mean, if you spot me eukaryotic chromosome synthesis, that's the only part that, like, you know, I, I, think, I think will be possible, right? Folks are working on it. I'm sure someone will, will mess right. it. It'd it's be, essentially a clone. It's like a clone, right? But it is um, it is you in a different time. You in a different time, but you don't unfortunately have the memories. Well, you could probably watch the like the digest of your life, and it would be pretty interesting, right? I mean, yeah, the the you know that's actually a process for psychology to study. If you create a blank mind, what would a, you need to show that mind to align it very well with the experiences, with the fundamental experiences that define the original version, such that the resulting clone would have similar behavior patterns, worldviews, perspectives, feelings, all those kinds of things. Potentially, right? 
inc yeah. including sadly enough traumas and all that or what have you right but basically just like in a very simple version of it you know by the time one is age 20 or 30 or so, something to me in your 20s you'll sort of learn your own personal operating system you'll be like oh alcohol really doesn't agree with me or something like that you just by trial and error you know things that are idiosyncratic to your own physiology you're like oh you know i i'm totally wrecked if i uh get seven hours of sleep versus nine hours or whatever it is right you people will have different kinds of you know things like this that manual can be given to your next self so that you can know don't do this do this don't do this do this right to some extent personal genomics already gives you some of this where you're like oh i'm a caffeine non you know or, or a slow metabolizer oh that explains x or y you know or i i have a weird version of alcohol dehydrogenase oh okay that explains you know my alcohol tolerance so you know this is part of the broader category of what i call practical miracles right so it's longevity it's genomic reincarnation it is restoring sight and it is curing deafness with you know the uh the, you know artificial eyes and artificial ears it is um the super soldier serum did i show you that mm. so like myostatin no i tweet about this basically x-men are real so here is a study from any jam from <laughs> Okay, so it's now 17 years later. It's probably, this is almost certainly a, a teenager by now. So this kid basically was just totally built. Yeah. Okay. Extraordinarily muscular. Like very muscular at a, at, a, at a very young age. Yes. So the child's birth weight was in the 75th percentile. He, he appeared extraordinarily muscular with protruding muscles in his thighs. Motor and mental development has been normal. Now at four and a half years of age, he continues to have increased muscle bulk and strength. And so essentially, myostatin mutation associated with gross muscle hypertrophy in a child. So this is like real life X-Men. Okay. <laughs> and um yeah. there's pictures of animals. Yes. So this is a company called Variant Bio that is looking at people who have exceptional health-related traits mm -hmm. and it is looking for essentially this kind of thing, but maybe more disease or or whatever related, right? For example, people who have natural immunity to COVID understanding how that works, perhaps we can give other people artificial immunity to COVID, right? Um, if you scroll up, you see my kind of tweet, super soldier serum is real, where it's like wild type mouse and a myostatin null. And look at the chest on that thing. Mm -hmm. You see the before and after. Wow. Okay. This is what's possible. You know, this could be us, but you regulating, you know, right? You know, the saying like, this could be us, but you play. This could be us, but the FDA regulating, mm -hmm. right? All this... <laughs> Okay. Oh yeah, on steroids. But it's not. That's the thing. Is but it's not steroids. Well, that's the thing. Is people when you people again, you go back to the Icarus thing. They think, oh, steroids. Well, that's definitely going to give you cancer. Screw up your hormones, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And it could. But you know what? Like, have we actually put in that much effort into figuring out like the the right way of doing testosterone supplementation or the right way of doing this? Uh, obviously we've managed to put a lot of effort into marijuana, increasing the potency of it or what have you. Could we put the effort into these kinds of drugs, right? Or uh, these kinds of compounds? Maybe. I think that would actually be a really good thing. The thing about this is I feel this is just a massively underexplored area. Um, rather than people drinking caffeine all the time, that's like a very mild enhancing drug. Okay. Uh, nicotine is also arguably kind of like that. You know, some people will have it even without the cigarettes, right? Why can't we research this stuff? One way of thinking about it is, you know, Lance Armstrong, the, the cyclist. Yes, he violated all the rules. Um, you know, he shouldn't have won the Tour de France or anything like that. But his chemists, and I say this somewhat tongue in cheek, but also, you know, his chemists are candidates for like the Nobel Prize in chemistry. Because they brought a man back from like testicular cancer to like winning Tour de France's against a bunch of guys who probably, you know, a bunch of them were also juiced or whatever, right? Whatever was done there, take it out of the competition framework. There's a lot of testicular cancer patients or, or cancer patients, period, who would want some of that. And we should take that seriously. We should take that pursuit really, really, really seriously. Yes, except... 
again, just like the Theranos stuff, all this pathologize. Oh, it's a Balco scandal. Oh, it's this. Oh my God. You know, and yes, of course, within the context of that game, they're cheating. When the context of life, you want to be cheating death. Yes. Right. So um, it's just a kind of a reframe on what is good. Right. And it is just taking away these assumptions that mild inflation is good or mild death is good and going towards transcendence. So that gets me done with the giant FDA, biomedical, et cetera, et cetera. Longevity, thing. yeah. Okay. That's beautifully, beautifully done. You have you had two questions. One was on Trump and deplatforming, and the other was on crypto and the state of crypto, and the third is on India. Which one should we do? All right. Since we talked about how to fix government, we talked about how to fix health, medicine, FDA, longevity. And if there's something broken about that, how do we fix it? Steel Man, the case four is kind of obvious in the sense of um, you are seeing a would-be dictator who is trying to run a coup against democracy, who has his um, supporters go and storming the seat of government, who could use his app to whip... <laughs> take actions that, while perhaps controversial, are still within the law. And uh, you'll make sure that you do your part to defend democracy by uh, making sure that at least this guy's megaphone is taken away and that his supporters cannot organize more rights, right? That's basically the case, you know, for the deplatforming. Okay. Um, would you agree with that? That's so it's like really steel manning it. I'm, I'm you asked the steel man, so I'm giving the four case, yeah. Well, I think, I guess I would like to separate the would be dictator. Oh, I guess if you're storming the Capitol, you are a dictator. I, I see, I see. Um, so those are two are interlinked, right? You have to have somehow a personal judgment of the person bad enough to be worth this you know, significant step. Yeah. It's not just their actions or words in a particular situation, but broadly this the context person is of dangerous everything that led up to this moment and so Got it. right. Yeah. So that's that's a four case. Right. Now the against case. There's actually several against cases, right? There's obviously the Trump supporters, you know, against case. There is the um sort of the libertarian slash um left libertarian <laughs> Um, a few weeks after uh, the inauguration, like February 4th, 2021. And essentially, uh, the Trump supporter would read this as basically saying, uh, in the name of defending democracy, they corrupted democracy, um, you know, whether it was actually vote counts or just changes of all the rules for mail-in ballots and stuff. There were regular meetings between the Chamber of Commerce and, you know, AFL or, and, and the unions. And in particular, they admit that the BLM riots of, you know, the mid 2020s were actually on a string and they could say, stand down. Right. So that's actually, that's a quote from this article where it's like, the word went out, stand down, protect the results, announced that it would not be activating the entire national mobilization network today, but remains ready to activate if necessary. Podhoser credits the activists for their restraint. So basically the activists reoriented the protected results protest towards a weekend of celebration. So point being that the fact that the Trump supporter would say the fact that they could tell them to stand down meant that the previous, you know, unrest was in part, you know, coordinated. And so it'd say, okay, so that makes it illegitimate in a different way, right? Mm -hmm. Plus, you know, what is one riot on Jan 6 versus the attacks on the White House and stuff? You know, there's a storming of the White House in mid-2020 and uh, no, didn't actually storm the White House, but they were setting fires outside and it's quite, quite a lot of stuff, right? So the second against case is the, let's say, libertarian slash left libertarian who'd say, um, do we really want uh, giant corporations, regardless of what you think about Trump, and you don't have to be a Trump supporter, do you really want giant corporations to be determining who can say what on the internet? And if they can deplatform a sitting president and the quote, most powerful man in the world, he's not the most powerful man in the world. In fact, um, 
the quote people are electing a figurehead and actually it's the heads of network that are more powerful than the heads of state, right? Mm -hmm. That the fact that the CEOs of Facebook and Twitter and Google and Apple and Amazon all made those decisions at the same time to not just deplatform Trump from Twitter, which literally billions of people around the world saw, but also censor or stop on Facebook and to have Google and Apple pull Parler out of the App Store and Amazon shut down the back end. Is best be thought of as the least bad communist dictator or, or socialist dictator of the 20th century. Why? Because he nationalized the economy, repealed the 10th Amendment, right? Tried to pack the courts. He, you know, sicked the government on all of his enemies from Huey Long to Andrew Mellon. Obviously, he interned the Japanese, which shows that wasn't really totally a good guy, right? We don't usually think of, oh, it's the same guy who did this, did that. Earlier in his life, um, most people don't know this one, he led uh, a whole Navy thing to entrap gay sailors. And do you know about this one? No. Yeah. Google FDR entrapment of gay sailors. Basically, he got young men to try to find folks within the Navy who were gay and then... Um, basically entrap them so that they could be prosecuted and, and what have you, right? FDR did a lot of stuff, but fundamentally nationalized the economy in, and set up the alphabet soup is what they called it at the time. And that's like all these agencies or whatever. And um, in some sense, he's, you know, like continuous, like a, th there's, there'd been a rising trend of centralization. Woodrow Wilson obviously centralized, Lincoln centralized, right? Even actually you know, 1789 was a degree of centralization over the more, you know, like loose thing that was 1776, 1789. So he was on that trend line, but he was definitely a huge kind of dog leg up. So the thing is that because of all the lawsuits that were flying, many, you know, forks like uh, Amy Schley's, you know, has written a book, uh, The Forgotten Man, and essentially her thesis and the thesis of many others at that time, like John T. Flynn, who's this journalist who, you know, was pro FDR and then was against, was that FDR made the Great Depression great. Okay, that it wouldn't have been such a bad thing without him mucking up the entire economy and giving it a sickness. It would have recovered quickly without that, right? This is a counterfactual, which people just argue about it really angrily back and forth. And you can't actually run the experiment unless you could fork the economy, mm. right? Just like were the bailouts good or bad? I think they were bad, but how could I prove it? I'd need to actually be able to fork the economy. Crypto actually allows you in theory to do that like where folks could actually shift balances. This is a whole separate thing where you could actually start to make macroeconomics into more of an experimental science rather than simply arguing from authority, you could argue from experiment. Um, some of the virtual economy stuff that Edward Castronova has done is relevant to this. I, I, we can talk about that. Point is though, with FDR, there's a thing, because he had waged such a war on private industry at that time and justified it with this narrative, quote, bold, persistent experimentation, there was something called the, quote, business plot, where all of these captains of industry that he'd been beating up. And again, Teddy Roosevelt had also been doing this with, you know, the trust buster. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the whole plot was broken up, all right? Now, one way of thinking about today, or the, uh, you know, the whole aftermath of Jan 6 is it's a business plot, but in reverse, because the generals and the CEOs both were against Trump and actually the business plot happened, and now all the CEOs just boop, 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 you know they pulled all the all the push all the buttons that they needed to, and now the network was prime over the state. Okay, now why why is that an interesting way of looking at it? Because one thing I have in the book is you can kind of think of 1950 as like ish as peak centralization. You go forward and backward in time, things decentralize. You know, for example, and and you start getting mirror image events that happen with the opposite outcome. For example, 1890, the frontier closes. 1991, the internet frontier opens. The internet becomes open for commerce, okay? You go backwards in time, you have the Spanish flu, forwards in time, COVID-19, right? Um, backwards in time, you have the uh, captains of industry, the robber barons. Forwards in time, you have the tech billionaires. And there's so many examples of this. Like another one is... Um, backwards in time, the New York Times is allying with Soviet Russia to choke out Ukraine. Now, today, they have reinvented themselves as cheerleaders for Ukraine against, you know, nationalist Russia, right? 
And of course, I think you could absolutely support Ukraine on other measures, but it's pretty hypocritical for the guys who profited from the Haldemar, you know, the Ox Salzburg family literally profited from, you know, denying the Haldemar to now make themselves cheerleaders for Ukraine. It's actually this insane thing, which we can talk about. A tiny tangent on that. Yeah. You put it brilliantly. And a reminder for anyone who listens to me talk about Ukraine, it is possible to have empathy for a nation and not be part of the machine that generates a mainstream narrative. Yes, that's right. Like basically, you know, I, I was actually one of the first three Estonian e, e residents, okay? And I completely understand why Estonia and the Baltics and all these countries, including Ukraine, that just recently, within living memory, got their independence from the Soviet empire, would not want to be forcibly reintegrated into a place that they just escaped from, you know? And so that is something which is sort of outside the American left-right, you know, tired kind of thing, where when you understand it from that point of view, right, then there's like a fourth point of view, which is like India's point of view, or like m much of the developing world, or what I call, you know, parts of it are, are, you know, ascending, parts are descending, whatever. But much of the rest of the world... So we're going to maintain trade. And guess what? Actually, you know, we've got a lot of wars in our neck of the woods and human rights crises that Europe just didn't even care about. So it can't be that Europe's problems are the world's problems, but the world's problems are not Europe's problems, right? So that's like a fourth point of view. Then a fifth point of view is China, which is like, guess what? We're going to be the Iran of the Iraq war, you know, where like who won the Iraq war? Iran, arguably, right? Because they extended their influence into Iraq, right? So China's like, guess what? We're going to turn Russia into our gas station and build a pipeline they're building, there's a power, Siberia is like the name of the Eastern Russia pipeline, just like Nord Stream is, you know, Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. I think they're building a new pipeline, you know, through Mongolia. So Xi Jinping and Putin and the Mongolian head of state were all photographed kind of thumbs upping this pipeline. We'll see if it goes through, but it's ironic that, you know, Russia wanted to make Ukraine their, you know, colony, but the outcome of this war may be that Russia becomes China's colony, you know? So that's at least like five different perspectives, right? There's like the US establishment perspective. There's the, you know, Tucker MAGA perspective. There's the Baltics and Ukrainian perspective. There's like the Indian and like poor countries perspective. And then there's a Chinese perspective. And then of course there's the Russians, right? So um, just respect to that, by the way, that's another example of history happening in reverse. This is the Sino-Soviet partnership, except this time, China's a senior partner and Russia's a junior partner. And this time they're both nationalists rather than communist. And there's so many flips like this. And, you know, there's, there's, I'm going to list a few more actually, because there's so, so, so many of them. Do you have an explanation why that happens? Yes. Let me just list a few of them. This is in the, the Network State book. It's in the chapter called Fragmentation, Frontier, Fourth Turning, Future is Our Past, right? So, um, I give this example of like a fluid unmixing, All right? Just watch this for a second, right? This is um, from Smart Everyday, unmixing color machine, ultra laminar reversible flow, Smart Everyday 217. And so you can mix something and then like this thing that you don't think of as reversible, you can unmix it, which is insane, okay. right? That it works. Okay, the physics of that situation, it just works, right? So uh, for people just listening, that there is whatever the mixture this is, uh, this is ultra laminar reversible flow. So this probably has to do something to do with the material. We're used to mixing not being a reversible process. Ex ex exactly. And that's what that shows. And then he, he then reverses the mixing and is able to do it perfectly. That's right. So that's like the futures are past these. It shows that free will is an illusion. Just kidding. Okay. Well, basically there's, there's, you know, some environments where, you know, the equations are like time symmetrical. So you yeah. can, right. Um, mm -hmm. And this is one model sort of, it's just an interesting visual model for what's happening in the world as we re-decentralize after the centralized century. Right. So um, basically, you know, I mentioned the internet frontier of reopens back then the Western frontier closed. Today, we experienced COVID-19. Back then, we experienced the Spanish flu, tech billionaires, and we have the capital industry, right? Today, founders like Elon and Dorsey are starting to win against establishment journalists. Back then, 
Ida Tarbell demagogued and defeated Rockefeller. I think net net founders win this time versus the journos. Back then, the journos won over the founders. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, today we have cryptocurrencies. Back then we had private banking. Today, this is an amazing one. We have a populist movement movement of digital gold advocates. Back then, because Bitcoin maximalists and so on, mm -hmm. where gold has become populist because it's against the printing money and so on and so forth. Back then, we had a populist movement against gold in the form of William Jennings Bryan in the Cross of Gold speech. Gold was considered a tool of big business. Mm -hmm. Now, gold is the tool against big business and big government, right? Uh, today, digital gold, yeah. Digital gold, right. Today, we have the inflation and cultural conflict of Weimar like America. Back then, we had the inflation and cultural conflict of Weimar Germany. Today, in Weimar America, we have right and left fighting in the streets. Same, unfortunately, in Weimar Germany. Peter Turchin has written about, you know, today we have what Turchin considers antebellum, like polarization, like pre-war polarization. Back then, you know, if you go further back in time, we had what we now know to be antebellum polarization, right? Today we have Airbnb. Back then we had flop houses. Today we have Uber. Back then we had gypsy cabs. Um, you know, so today we see the transition from neutral to yellow journalism. Back then we saw the transition from yellow to, quote, neutral journalism, right? Um, and, you know, today figures like Mike Moritz... <laughs> but I think this is uh, the Indian decade in many ways. We, we can come back to that point. Um, but there's absolutely, you know, sparks of light in Africa. I mean, it's a huge continent. It now, feels like the more behind, sorry to interrupt, the more behind you are, the more opportunity you have to leap for all. Sometimes, that's right. And Peza uh, is a classic example where they did this in, in East Africa. But uh, but I think there's more possibility there. Um, so what is uh, the fact that this... Uh, <laughs> there's a kind of symmetry there's a history, kind of symmetry, right? What is that? Um, how do how did that take do us from uh, uh, Trump? So the, Trump. The, okay. the, the, yeah. the different perspective you took, the libertarian perspective of uh, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, because the libertarian perspective or the le left left libertarian perspective would say, is it really a good idea to have total corporate power against the quote elected? government even if you know you may disagree do you want to open the door to total you know corporate oligarchy and it's like the opposite that's why i mentioned it's like the opposite of business plots and they pulled on that thread okay so um the the macro explanation that i have for this future is our past thesis and there's more it also gives some predictions right if you go backwards in time the us federalizes into many individual states. Like before the Civil War, people said the United States are, and after they said the United States is. Before FDR, the 10th Amendment reserved rights to the states. Afterwards, it was just federal regulation of everything. As we go forwards in time, you're seeing states break away from the feds on uh, gun laws, drug laws, right? Sanctuary cities, okay? Um, many other kinds of things, you know? And now Florida, for example, has its own guard that's like not uh, a national guard, but like a state guard. Other other cities, uh, other states are doing this. And that's a force of decentralization. You're saying that parallels yes. in reverse. In reverse, right? So you're having before. make America states again. Nice. Okay. That's what's, I think, happening, right? I'm not saying I, well, I think there's aspects of that that are good. There's aspects that are bad, but um, just like that's kind of the the angle, right? But then th that's, I mean, in, from your perspective, that's probably not enough, right? That's that's not- that, um, It's part of the future. Let's just say whether I, I think- I think you, to interrupt, you, you suggested all kinds of ways to build different countries. I think that's probably one of them. You yeah. said like start micro micro countries or something like this. I forgot the terminology. You, yeah, micro nations. Yeah, that's not my, no, it's not my, yeah, I actually think of them as, the better term is micro states because they're actually not nations. That's why they don't work. But micro states are better, right? Uh, Coming back to the difference between the nation and the state, the nation is like stood over the Japanese nation in 1946 after the war. Right. right. Oh, so you weren't talking about tradition. You know that that doesn't matter. In terms of like, na I, I thought you meant nation is a thing that carries across the generations. There's a tradition. There's a culture, and so on. And state is just the management. The uh, the layer. I mean, that that's also that's also another way of thinking about it, right? Okay. There's a reversal there as well. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So, so I mean, one way of thinking about it is, um, you know, one nation under God indivisible is no longer true. It is 
America is at least two nations, the Democrat and Republican, in the sense of their own cultures, where I can show you graph after graph. You've seen the polarization graphs. I can show you network diagrams where, you know, like uh, there's this graph of polarization in Congress where there's red and blue, they're separate things. There's this article from 2017 showing um, how, uh, you know, shares on Facebook and Twitter are just separate subgraphs. They're just separate graphs in the social network and they're mm -hmm. pulling apart. Those are two nations. Uh, they're not under God because people... Hudu and Tutsi or Protestant and Catholic, Sunni and Shiite. It's not about ideology. If you think about all the flips during COVID, right, where people were on one side versus the other side, it's tribal. It's just tribe on tribe. And so it's not universalist. The identity of American makes less sense than the identity of Democrat and Republican right now, or perhaps the identity of individual states. Where I think that's a good or bad thing, I think that's unfortunately, you know, whatever it is, the hour of history, right? On the opposite side of things, India is actually, was 562 princely states at the time of Indian unification um, in from 1947 to 19... Unified into a republic only by like 1950. And India is like actually a modern... India is like Europe. It's kind of like the European Union in the sense that it, it, we didn't have a unified India in the past. It was something with a lot of different countries like North and South India or like Gujarat and Tamil Nadu are as different as... Finland and Spain, okay? But India has moved in the direction of much more unification, like much more, you know, um, centralization or what have you, whereas the U.S. is decentralizing. You go, to, okay? A few more things that are flips and I'll, I'll finish this off. Today, we're seeing the rise of the pseudonymous founder and startup societies. Back, all the way back in the 1770s, we saw pseudonymous founders of startup countries, namely the U.S., right? The Federalist Papers. Mm -hmm. um, today, we're seeing so far unsuccessful calls for wealth seizures in the U.S., Back then, we saw FDR's Executive Order 6102, which was a successful seizure of gold. Mm -hmm. I expect we may see something like that, an attempted seizure of digital gold. And I think that'll be one of the things that individual states like Florida or Texas may not enforce that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually the kind of thing where you could see, you know, a, like a breakup potential in the future, right? One other thing that kind of rhymes is in many ways, like the modern U.S. establishment the story that you hear is the victories in 1945 and 1865 legitimate the current establishment. That is being the Nazis, being the Confederates, right? So they beat the ethnic nationalists abroad and they beat the, quote, secessionists at home, right? And uh, the ethnic nationalists were, you know, Aryan Nazis and the secessionists were, you know, slave slave owners and against freedom and so on and so forth, okay? I'm not disputing that. I'm just saying that that's just like the way people think about it. There's a possibility, and I'm not saying it's 100% at all, okay? But if you're a sci-fi writer, there's a possibility that the U.S. loses to the ethnic nationalists abroad, except this time they're Chinese communists, non-white communists, as opposed to Aryan Nazis, which seem like the total opposite, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, there's a possibility that there is a um, financial secession at home where it's, you know, Bitcoin maximalist states that are advocating for freedom, the opposite of slavery. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? <laughs> I, <laughs> oh boy, that's dark. You're uh, you're looking for major things in history that don't yet have a cognate going yeah, forward, right? And that's a nice way to think about the future. It is only one model, and you know any mental model or something like that. That's why I say I'm, as a sci-fi scenario, it's just like a scenario one could contemplate, right? Mm -hmm. Where the new version has, I mean, the Chinese communists do not think of themselves as Aryans, right? Um, but they are ultranationalist, and you know the Hitler comparisons. People talk about Hitler endlessly. You know, like Saddam is the new Hitler. Everybody's the new Hitler, etc. If there is a comparison to, quote, Nazi Germany, it is, you know, CCP China, in a sense. Why? They are non-English speaking, manufacturing powerhouse with a massive military build out under one leader that is a genuine peer competitor to the US on many dimensions. And in fact, you know, exceeding on some dimensions of technology and science, right? That is like it, the problem is it's a boy who cried wolf. People will say this a zillion times, right? Yeah. Um, and you know that is 
like, uh, you know, I, I'm not saying this, by the way, crucially, I, I am, there's like, I think China is uh, very complicated and there's hundreds of millions of people, probably half in China that disagrees with the current ultra-nationalist kind of thing, right? And so I kind of hate it when innocent Chinese people abroad or whatever are just like attacked on this basis or what have you. Plus, the other thing is that many Chinese people will say, well, look, relative to you know, where we were when uh, Deng took over in 1978, we built up the entire country. We're not starving to death anymore. And the West wants to recall them. Huge difference, right? Which is Nazi Germany was like 70 million people. And the US was 150 million and the Soviet Union was 150 million and the UK was like 50 million. So they were outnumbered like five to one. Mm -hmm. But I do think that, you know, the U.S. is like fighting its factory. So one thing, you know, Zion will talk about is how, oh, America has this blue water navy, all the aircraft carriers, and China has nothing, it's got bubkas, et cetera. Well, China ships things all around the world, right? It probably has, you know, one of the most active fleets out there in terms of, you know, its commercial shipping. Um, and uh, in terms of building ships, Here's a quote. China's merchant shipbuilding industry is the world's largest, building more than 23 million gross tons of shipping in 2020. U.S. yards built a mere 70,000 tons the same year, though they typically average somewhere in the 200,000s. That is a 100 to 300x ratio just in shipbuilding. Pretty much everything else you can find in the physical world is like that. Okay, We're not talking like 2x. We're talking they can put together a subway station in nine hours with, with prefab, and the U.S. takes three years. Okay. When you have a thousand X difference in the physical world, the reason the US was won against, you know, Nazi Germany in a serious fight is they had this giant manufacturing plant that was overseas and they just outproduced, right? And they supplied the Soviets also with lend lease. And the Soviets talked about how they would not have won the war without the Americans. People are like, oh, the Russians, you know, fought the Germans. The, the Russians armed by Americans fought the Germans. Like it's a, it's a, a Soviet Union. They're not actually able to make high quality stuff. There, there obviously are individual people in Soviet Russia who were in Of course, is not true. There's yes. A lot so, of brilliant so people wanna... in, and then a lot of even, you know, there, there's a lot of amazing things that have been created. Yeah. So they had some amazing mathematicians, amazing scientists and so on, right? However, great branding on the, you know, red and the yellow. Just, yeah, yeah. The so, branding is stellar. So Nazi Germany to excellent branding <laughs> with the flag and so on, you know. Yeah. So, so it um, ends, and ends there in terms of compliments. <laughs> yeah. Well, they actually, they copied a lot of stuff from each other, you know, like there's this yeah. movie called The Soviet Story. It basically shows a lot of. Nazi and Soviet propaganda things next to each other. And you can see guys almost in like the same pose. It's almost like, uh, you know how AI will do like style transfer? Mm -hmm. You can almost see, because the socialist realism style of like the muscular brawny worker, mm -hmm. very similar to like the style of the Aryan Superman, you know, like pointing at the vermin or whatever. And then there's the crappy open source version that tries to copy, which is Mussolini. Yeah. That just like... <laughs> that does the same exact thing, but does it kind of shittier. So, right. Anyway, so my main thing about this is basically like trying to fight your factory yeah. in the physical world is probably not going to work. People are, I think, overconfident on this stuff. Right. With that said, I think we want to, at all, you know, the future is not yet determined. Right. At all odds, you know, at all, we want to avoid a hot war between, like, I mean, a hot war between the U.S. and China would be. Do you think it's possible that we get a war? We're doing these things like Pelosi going to Taiwan and trying to trying to cause something. Like, look, again, this is one of these things which is complicated because obviously, if you're you, there's more than one perspective on this, right? Again, you've got the U.S. establishment, the U.S. conservative, the Taiwanese perspective, the Chinese perspective, all the bystanders over there. There's more than one perspective on this. Okay, if you're you know China's one of China's many neighbors. You look at China with apprehension, like Vietnam, for example, has sort of fallen into, uh, or not fallen into, is partnering with India 
because they're mutually apprehensive China. China is not making like great friends with its neighbors. It's kind of, you know, it's demonizing Japan. It's it's so ultranationalist uh, nowadays. Um, nuclear war. And that escalates kind of the heat in the room of geopolitics. It escalates the heat in the room, of course, right? And the thing is, People have this belief that because something hasn't happened, it won't happen or it can't happen. But like there were a lot of measures people took during the Cold War to make sure a nuclear exchange didn't happen. The whole mutually assured destruction thing and communicating that out and like the balance of terror. There were smart guys on both sides who thought through this. And there were near near misses, right? There, you know, like there's that story about like the Soviet colonel who didn't order a nuclear strike because he thought it was just like an error in the instruments, right? Okay, what's the point? Point is, you know, for example, Pelosi going to Taiwan, that didn't strengthen Taiwan. That didn't like that. If if you're going to go and provoke China, I thought Scholar Stage, his Twitter account, had a good point, which is you should, if you're actually going to do it, then you strengthen Taiwan with like huge battalions of like arms and material and you make them a porcupine and so on and so forth. Instead, her kind of going and landing there and mooning China and then flying back in the middle of a hot war with Russia, that's absolutely, you know, in the middle of an economic crisis or what happened. At the same time, it's like kind of insane to do that. Okay. Plus even with Ukraine, um, some people were like, oh, this was like a a victory for the US military policy or something. There's a guy who, I'm not trying to beat him up or anything. He's like, this is in March, threat on US security assistance to Ukraine. It's working. Ukraine might be one of the biggest successes of US security assistance. And the reason is, you know, US didn't focus on some high-end shiny objects, but on core military tasks, that focus should remain. And it's like, how is this a success? The West gave massive arms to Ukraine only after the invasion, but not enough before to deter. And now Ukraine is like this Syria-like battleground with, you know, a million refugees or whatever the number is, right? Their country is blown to smithereens, thousands of people dead, whatever thousand dollar gas in, in Europe with like 10x energy, radicalized Russians, the threat of World War III or even nuclear war, you know, shooting somebody isn't that's not like the point of a military. The point is, you know, con there's a million ways to smash Humpty Dumpty into pieces and, you know, unleash the blood drenched tides, right? And have people all shooting each other and killing each other. It's really hard to maintain stability. That's what competence is, is deterrence and stability, mm -hmm. right? There's not like a success in any way. Mission accomplished is what I meant, yeah. Exactly. Mission accomplished was obviously, you know, the thing is, Russia lives next door to Ukraine. And so, just, I mean, just like Iraq lives next door to Iran and Afghanistan is next door to Pakistan and China. And so if the US eventually gets tired of it and leaves, those guys are next door, right? And so, you know, who knows what's gonna happen here, okay? Um, but one of the problems is like, you know, the whole Afghanistan thing or the Iraq thing is the lesson for people was the uncertainty. They're like, is the US gonna fight? Don't know. Is Will the US win if it fights? Don't know. Therefore, roll the dice. That uncertainty is itself like tempting to folks, you know, like, like Putin or whatever, right? So point is, coming all the way back up, we were talking about how history, the futures are past and FDR, like the business plot for FDR failed, but like the tech companies were able to deplatform Trump, right? And the left libertarian would say, do we want that much corporate power, okay? And so that's, so we gave the four case for Trump deplatforming, protecting democracy, the Trump supporter case against, which is on the secret history of the shadow campaign, the save the 2020 election, basically that article, the left libertarian or libertarian case against. And then to me, what is, uh, you know, like I am you know, head of state of Mexico, I think at that time, okay. Um, AMLO, Macron, you know, other folks. Everybody who's watching this around the world basically saw, let's say, U.S. establishment or Democrat-aligned folks just decapitate, you know, the head of state mm -hmm. from digitally, right? Like, just boom, gone, okay? And they're like, well, if they can do that in public 
to the U.S. president, who's ostensibly the most powerful man in the world. What does the Mexican president stand against that? Nothing, right? Like these U.S. media corporations, these U.S. tech companies are so insanely powerful. Everybody's on Twitter or what have you, other than China, leaving them aside. They've got their own root system. If somebody tried to deplatform Xi Jinping off of Sina Weibo, they'd probably just fall through a trap door, <laughs> you know, their whole family, right? But for the rest of the world, it's on the that that is hosting their business, their politics on these U.S. tech companies. They're like, regardless of whether it was justified on this guy, that means they will do it to anybody. Now the seal is broken. Just like the bailouts, as exceptional as they were, and at first everybody was shocked about them, then they became a policy instrument. And now there's bailouts happening. Every single bill is printing another whatever billion dollars or something like that, right? Can I ask on your thoughts and advice on this topic? Um, if if I or anyone were to have a conversation with Donald Trump, first of all, should one do so? And uh, if so, how do you do it? And it may not necessarily be Trump. It could be other people like Putin and Xi Jinping and so on. Let's say people that are censored. Right. Like people that platforms in general see as dangerous. Hitler, you can go, uh, we keep bringing it up. Of course, that's the ultimate edge case, right? Um, in the sense of that saying like something must be done, this is something, therefore this must be done, right? I've heard that one before. <laughs> no. Right? No, but I love it. Yeah. So... This is just, I, can, can I just use that as an explanation with confidence for everything I do? Yeah, sure. There you go, right? Something must be done. This is something, therefore, must be done. Therefore, this must be done. So that is the, like, the two, all kinds of regulations, all kinds of things are kind of justified on that basis, right? And there's a version of that, which is uh, punch a Nazi. I decide who is a Nazi. You're a Nazi. Therefore, I, I punch you, and that's justified, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, like people say, oh, uh, how many people are calling Israelis, you know, like these, these things, right? Um, and so the problem with argumentum ad Hitlerum is it just, I mean, people will say Obama's a Nazi. Everybody will say everybody's a Nazi, right? But there is a social consensus about who, let's, let's set Nazis aside, but who is dangerous for society. Okay, but and, now let's talk about that, all right? Yeah. So basically, I think a more interesting example than Hitler in, in this context is Herbert Matthews. So Fidel Castro, before he became the communist dictator of Cuba, was on the run. He was like Osama bin Laden at the time. He was like a terrorist that the Cuban regime had seemingly defeated. And what Herbert Matthews did is he got an intro to him. He went to the you know, place where he was hiding out. He gave an interview and he printed this hagiography hey in the New York Times with this like, you know, photo of Castro looking all, you know, mighty and so on. And he's like, Castro is still alive and still fighting, okay? And uh, there's this book on this called The Man Who Created Fidel, mm -hmm. okay? Where basically NYT's article was crucial positive press that got Castro's point of view out to the world and helped lead to the communist revolution that actually impoverished Cuba, led to like gay people being, you know, like uh, discriminated against there, led to people fleeing, you know, and drowning, trying to escape, right? That's an example of where platforming somebody led to a very bad outcome. In fact, many of the communist dictators in the 20th century had like their own person. What, what, so, what do you think he was thinking? He's do you like, think he saw the, the psychopathy? You know, sometimes it's not obvious. Like, Well, the French Revolution had already happened. So people kind of knew that this sort of psychopathic, you know, killing in the name of equality could produce bad results, right? And, uh, but, but it's more than that, right? So it's John Reed, it's Herbert Matthews, it's um, Edgar Snow, okay? So these are all people who should be extremely famous, right? Um, so Edgar Snow is Mao's journalist, okay? So he wrote... Um, you know, here's the, there's actually an article in this, how 1930s reporter from Missouri became China's ideal, ideal journalist, okay? And he wrote various books, including like Red Star Over China, okay? And it's just a hagiography of, of Mao, right? Yeah. And uh, then, of course, you've got Durante. And he is like Stalin's biographer, right? 
help Stalin starve out the Ukrainians. Milan's dead. Uh, Edgar Snow uh, was Mao's biographer. Um, and uh, Herbert Matthews was like Castro's. And this guy, David, David Halberstam in Vietnam, who uh, was effectively Ho Chi Minh's. He basically went and uh, took leaks from a communist spy. I'll give you the exact name. Fom, I'm going to mispronounce this, but it's Perfect Spy, The Incredible Double Life of PHAM Pham Zuan On, Time Magazine Reporter and Vietnamese Communist Agent. That guy was the source of many fabricated stories that David Halberstam printed in the New York Times that led to the undermining of the South Vietnamese regime. And, uh, you know, for example, stories of Buddhists being killed and so on. Ashley Rinsberg in The Great Lady Winked writes this whole thing up at length, so you can go and read it for his account. But basically, all of these communist dictators had a journalist right alongside them as their biographer. Yeah. Okay. But those, so, those are tools of the propaganda machine versus... Well, so my point is, mm -hmm. these are five examples that are on the far left that should be balanced also against the Times running profiles of Hitler on the far right. We know that, basically, you know, the Times actually also ran a whole thing, which was, you know, Hitler's like mountain retreat or something like that. Do you know about that story? What year was this? I'll tell you one second. Hitler at home in the clouds. Oh boy, please tell me it's like early 30s. I think it's, um, oh yeah, this is T Otto D. Talishus. This is actually a guy that um, Ashley Rinsberg writes up in The Great right. Lady Winked, right? 1937. 37. There's another one where I think the date is wrong, but it's 39, you know, but essentially uh, these titles are like, where Hitler dreams and plans, he lives simply, you know, right? And uh, there's another one, Herr Hitler at home in the clouds, okay? The thing about this is, absolutely, there are folks who are hagiographers hey, of the far right, but whether you're talking Lenin and John Reed, or uh, Stalin and Walter Durante of the New York Times, or Castro and Herbert Matthews, again, of the New York Times, mm -hmm. or Edgar Snow and Mao, or David Halberstam and uh, you know Ho Chi Minh again of the New York Times, <laughs> like you start to see a pattern here where the guys who are being platformed and given a voice are these guys who end up being like far left, you know, lunatics, right? And I think part of the issue here is you know the saying about how communists don't understand self interest, nationalists don't understand other interest, and so nationalists are more obvious. Isn't that good? I thought it was good. It's pretty good. Right? Pretty good. So the nationalist is very obvious in the sense of like, they're for the Aryans. They're not even for like the Slavs or whatever, right? Like, you know, uh, basically, you know, had Hitler constructed a different ideology, um, you know, then like he, he might've gotten some more support in Eastern Europe or whatever, right? But he also called the Slavs inferior, not just, you know, basically everybody was inferior to the Aryans, okay? Uh, except maybe the English or whatever, but that was it, right? Um, Oh, and the Japanese are honorary Aryans or something. So the nationalist declares the supremacy of their own race or culture or what have you and doesn't understand people's other interest. But he also pumps up his own guys, okay? Same with, you know, in some ways China today, same with Japan back in the day. Whereas the communist has a message that sounds more appealing. It's a universalist message ostensibly, but it's it's actually a faux universalism because it's actually particularism. Like during the Soviet Union, communism, this faux universalism was basically a mask for Russian nationalism, you know, where, you know, the, the, or at least, at least Soviet nationalism, where in particular Russians were pushed into many territories and, you know, Russian speakers were, you know, like privileged in, you know, the uh, Eastern Europe and, and the Baltics. Of course, Russians themselves were oppressed at home as Solzhenitsyn writes, they were both victim and victimizer of the regime. Their churches were crushed and so on. As compensation, they were agents of empire. It's a tragedy all around. Okay? I'm not, you know, I think Russians have been hard done in many ways. They've had a very hard, hard century. They've also done hard by others. Okay, it's complicated. Those journalists you mentioned, just to elaborate, maybe you disagree with me. I wonder what you think. Sure. But I think conversation, like not to... <laughs> serve a purpose in 41 and 42 mid world war ii or mid world war ii a purpose of one which is very important get good information for the future so history can study it 
and to reveal to the world the way a man thinks that is beyond the propaganda. So all this stuff is complicated, but today, so in the specific issue of the folks you were talking about, like Putin, Z, Trump, right? For those folks, they are very clearly outgroup for both the US left and right, which is, you'll know, say the Western left and right, which are your um, uh, your audience. There's folks who are tankies and there are folks who are MAGA, who are sympathetic. And oh, sorry, what are tankies? Tankies are those who are, uh, you know, let's, um, they may call themselves tankies. Let's say they're anti-imperialist left and MAGA right, yeah. okay? For different reasons are um, against the US establishment and for, Putin or Xi or something like that as, you know, um, as an agent against the US establishment, right? So leaving those aside, the point is that most of your audience is sort of on guard, vaccinated in a sense, right? Versus Xi and Putin and Trump, right? Mm -hmm. Like they have, they know the counter arguments and, and so on and so forth, okay? In which case, I wouldn't think interviewing them would be like, that big a deal relatively because there's so much other coverage and so on out there. It, it's, it's, I think it's probably okay. However, for something like, um, you know, when what, what John Reed was doing and so on, when he was the sole source of information about the Russian revolution. Yes. Right. That's different. That's, that's different, different. Right. So, so it's something about, it get, kind of gets back to the, oh, the yeah. competitive environment and so on. There's no dearth of folks who are writing, critical coverage of these these three men, right? And so if I felt that that was insufficient, then you you might need more of it, right? right. Um, just like, you know, for example, nowadays with Stalin, there are a lot of articles and books and PDFs and so on on it. But at Do the I, time, not as much. At the time, not as much, right? That's why I brought those those guys, right? Yeah. Because often it's kind of like, have you, have you ever stocked shelves at a supermarket? And so it seemed totally out of left field. No, but shoes, but the same thing, Sears, I used to work at Sears. The thing that is the most popular is the thing that's not on the shelf because it's being sold out. <laughs> yeah. Right? So in some ways, like, you know, this is the, this is similar to that, you know, famous photo that people have, or not photo, the image that people have on Twitter of the plane and, um, you know, the parts that are shot versus not, right? The, the uh, survivorship bias, right? And one way of kind of thinking about it is, the guys who you think of as bad guys or possible bad guys or controversial guys or whatever are those you've already got some vaccination to. That's why you think of them at all. Whereas the folks that I mentioned, the regulators, invisible. Yeah. You don't, right? Salzberger, you know Zuckerberg, you know his pros and cons, you know who he is as a person. You don't even know Salzberger exists, most people, right? Despite the fact that he's like, certainly is powerful. You know, he owns the New York Times, he inherits it. He also got dual class stock, just like Zuck. Um, but it's invisible, right? Well, that's why I think studying the knowns, the people that are known can help you generalize uh, to the way human nature is. And then you start to question, are the same kind of humans existing in places that uh, wield power? And yeah. you can assume they are, they do exist there, and then you can start to infer that's right. and ask questions. So this is kind of what I try to do is I'm like, what is the dark matter? What is the question that is not being asked or what have yes, you, right? Yes. And so, um, you know, that's not to say that you, you need to be so anti-mimetic that you only do that. Mm -hmm. But I think you need to do that as well as understand what is good about the conventional wisdom. And, you know, for example, if you notice a lot of what I talk about is like the V1, V2, V3, mm -hmm. where as critical as I am of, let's say, the FDA, I recognize that people want a regulated marketplace and how do we do better? As critical as I can be of the Fed, I recognize that some kind of monetary policy is necessary and Satoshi came up with a better one, right? Um, as harsh as one can be a critic of the current system, it is really incumbent, as difficult as that is, upon one to come up with a better version. Just like academia, as much as I think current science is corrupted, what I propose is a way to actually improve on that. And actually, any any true scientist say, yes, I want my work to be reproducible. Yes, I want citations to be important statements and so on and so forth. And we don't have to get everybody to agree with that, but just enough to build that better version and not regress 
Yeah, there's a there's an implied optimism within the V1, V2, V3 yes. framework. Let, let me ask you at a high level about social media because you are one of its prominent users to communicate your wisdom. I use Twitter. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't really think of it as quote communicate my wisdom per se or anything like that. I use Twitter like I might use GitHub as a as a scratch pad for just kind of floating concepts. And, you know, I've got, okay, here's a frame on things. Let me kind of put it out there and see what people think, get some feedback and so on. Don't you think it has lasting impact that the, your scratch book? I think it, it's good, but basically like, um, if I'd say that's, what's my primary thing on Twitter? It's that. It's a, it's a scratch pad for me to kind of put some concepts out there, you know, iterate on them, get feedback on them and so on and so forth. Right? Do you think it's possible that the words you've tweeted on Twitter is the the most impact you will have on the world on the world i don't uh so is that possible is it possible um well my tweets me. is a good question i i think the network state will be i think important uh or i hope it, well the oh, book the book of the concept <laughs> good question Sorry, just to clarify. The, the movement the movement right yeah. uh in the sense that zionism shows that it is possible to have a book and then a conference, and then a fund, and eventually in the fullness of self-determination to have a state, we'd have 600 countries rather than 190. Yeah. Because, you know, the option, one of, there's many opposites of a nation state, but one of the opposites is the stateless nation. Mm -hmm. And so you remember the network state is popular? In places like Catalonia, Catalonia nationalists, in Catalonia, guys who are committed Catalonian nationalists. So Catalonia, you know, this region of Spain, right? Um, the, the they've got a they've got a legitimate claim from history, language, culture, all that stuff, right? The Basques do as well. The Kurds do as well. Okay, lots of ethnic groups around the world do. So in the game of musical chairs, that was the formation of current national borders. They lost out, mm -hmm. right? So what did they do? Well, one answer is they just submit to the Spanish state and they just speak Spanish and their culture is erased and their history is erased and, and so on. The second is they do some sort of Ireland-like insurgency, the troubles to try to get a thing of their own, which is obviously bad for uh, other kinds of reasons, right? You know, violent, et cetera. What this Catalonian nationalist said, he's like, look, while we can't give up on our existing path, the network state is a really interesting third option. I mean, by the way, I didn't, I didn't talk to this guy, V. Partal, okay? And he's got this site called Via Web, and, uh, or V-I-L-A, Villa of Web, sorry. It can be, meaning the network state, can be especially appealing to us. Catalans are now embarking on the task of having a normal and current state in the old way, and this is a project that we cannot give up. But this does not mean that at the same time, we are not also attentive to ideas like this, and we do, do not try to learn and move forward, right? Meaning, you know, the network state, right? Because that's the third way which says, okay, maybe this particular region is not something where you're going to be able to get, you know, a state. But just like there's more Irish people who live outside of Ireland, right? Just like, you know, the Jewish people, you know, didn't actually get a state in Poland or what have you. They, they had one in Palestine. Perhaps the Catalonians could crowdfund territory in other places and have essentially a, a state of their own that's distributed, okay? Now, again, what people are immediately going to say is, well, that's going to lead to conflict with the locals necessarily, and so on and so forth. But if you're parallel processing, you don't have the all-in-one bucket aspect of, I must... Right? Um, just like in, I think there's a, there's a region called New Caledonia, um, and that's in the Southwest Pacific. So maybe maybe New Catalonia is somewhere else, right? So mm -hmm. if you're flexible on that, now, of course, a bunch of people will immediately say, they'll have 50 different ob objections to this. They'll say, oh, you don't get it. The whole point is the land and, you know, so on. They've been there for generations. Sort of say, I, I do get it. Um, but this Catalan nationalist who's like literally ridden in Catalonian for, I don't know how many years, right, uh, is basically saying, this is worth thinking about. Mm -hmm. And so it's a peaceful third way.
Yeah, but it's it's interesting. I mean, it it to it, I mean, it's it's a good question whether Elon Musk, SpaceX, and Tesla will be successful without Twitter. Yeah, I, I don't think as as successful. I mean, uh, I mean, he obviously they were, they existed before Twitter, and a lot of the engineering problems are obviously non Twitter things, right? But Twitter itself has certainly probably helped Musk with Tesla sales. The engineering. No, that's not that's not what I mean. Oh, go ahead. The best people in the world solve the engineering problems. Yes, but he hires the people to solve them, and he knows enough about engineering to that, hire those people. That's the, the point I'm making. Oh, is sure. On Twitter, the legend of Elon Musk is created. The vision is communicated, and the best engineers in the world come to work for the vision. It's an advertisement of a man of a company pursuing a vision. And I think Twitter is a great place to make viral ideas that are compelling to people, whatever those ideas are. And whether that's the network state or whether that's uh, humans becoming a multi-planetary species. Here is a remark I had just before the pandemic related to this, okay? But Twitter helping along, just beyond that for a second. Maybe centralization is actually also underexplored in the design space. For example, today's social networks are essentially governed by a single CEO, but that CEO is a background figure. They aren't leading the users to do anything. What if they did? One example, could Elon Musk's then 30 million followers somehow get us to Mars faster? Tools for directed collaborative work by really large groups on the internet are still in their infancy. You can see pieces of what I was talking about, the scratch pad thing, the network state being a group with which can do collective actions, this is kind of the thing, right? Mm -hmm. So technologies for internet collaboration that could be very useful to the software for future network states, operational transformation, that's how like Google Docs coordinates edits, um, conflict-free replicated data types is another, it's an alternative easier to code in some ways in operational transformation, microtasks like Mechanical Turk, Scale AI, and Earn.com before we sold it, blockchains and crypto, obviously, the Polymath Project, where a bunch of people parallel processed and we're able to solve a, an open math problem by collaborating. Um, Wikipedia, with its flaws that we talked about, social networks and group messaging, all these are ways for collaborating. They're not just simply attacking or, or doing something on the internet. Mm -hmm. This is something that Elon could use, right? What works and what doesn't about Twitter? If there's something that's broken, how would you fix it? A million things I can say here. So a few things. First is fact-checking. I had this kind of fun, I thought it was a funny tweet, to anyone who wants to, quote, ban lying on social media, please write down a function that takes in a statement and returns whether it is true. If you can start with the remand hypothesis, that would be amazing. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Well, now, put, that's kind of funny, right? That's funny. And uh, so now the that thing- jo That joke landed on like five people. <laughs> sure. You want to explain <laughs> but, the joke? Go. Well, no, I, if, there's a lot of problems, decidability, where the truth, that's what proofs in, in math is the truth of the thing is actually exceptionally difficult to determine. And that's just a really nice example. Right. The problems that persist across centuries that have not been solved by the most brilliant minds, they're essentially true or false problems. That's right. And so when people are saying, when they were saying they want to ban lying on social media, fact check social media, the assumption is that they know what is true. And what do they mean by that? They really mean the assertion of political power, right? With that said, do I think it could be useful to have some kind of, quote, fact-checking thing? Yes, but it has to be decentralized and open source. You could imagine an interesting concept of coding Trugal, like a Google, yeah. that returned what was true. Yes. It's like a modified I'll version, like it. right? It's like GPT-3, but the stable diffusion version where it's open. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so now anybody, stable diffusion shows it is possible to take an expensive AI model and put it out there, right? So you have, you know, you know what a knowledge graph is? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. Like basically, you know, uh, you wouldn't actually, uh, whether you have it as RDF or like a like a triple store kind of thing or some other representation, it's like an ontology of A is a B and, you know, B has a C and it's got probabilities on the edges sometimes and other kinds of metadata. And this allows Google to show certain kinds of one box information where it's like, um, what is so? What is Steve Jobs's? Uh, you know, what is what is Lorene Powell Jobs's uh, age or birthday? They can pull that up out of the, out of the um, the knowledge graph, right? And uh, so you could imagine that Trugal would have both deterministic and statistical components, and crucially, it would say whether something is true according to a given knowledge graph. 
Mm -hmm. And so this way, at least what you can do is you can say, okay, here's the things that are consensus reality, like the value of the gravitational constant will be the same in the MAGA knowledge graph and the US establishment knowledge graph and the CCP knowledge graph and the, the I don't know, the Brazilian knowledge graph and so on and so forth, okay? But there's other things that will be quite different. And at least now you can isolate where the point of disagreement is. And so you can have a form of decentralized fact checking that is like, according to who, well, here is the authority and it is this knowledge graph, right? So that's like a kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So that is, um, so that's one concept of like what next social media looks like. There's, a, there's actually so much more. Another huge thing is decentralized social media, okay? Social media today is like, China under communism in a really key sense. There's this great article called The Secret Document That Transformed China. Mm -hmm. Do you know what China was like before 1978? I know about the atrocities. Sure. But, so, but to put some flesh on the yeah. bones, so to speak. Oh, okay. <laughs> so basically... There's a good book I'm reading because I think a lot of documents became public recently. And so... There was a window when it opened up. Now it's probably closing back down again, but... But, you know, great biographies because of that were written. Like, I'm currently reading Mao's Great Famine by Frank DeCotter. Yeah. Which is, uh, whoo boy. It's crazy. Okay. Yeah. Here's the thing is <laughs> capitalism was punishable by death mm -hmm. in living memory in China. Just to explain what that meant. Okay. I mean, that's what communism was, right? It was literally... The same China that has like the CC, you know, the entrepreneurs and Jack Ma and so on and so forth. Forty something years ago, capitalism was punishable by death. What to put to give you a concrete example? There, this is a famous story in China, maybe apocryphal, but it's what you know the, the folks have talked about. There's a village in Zhaogang, and basically all the grain that you were produced was supposed to go to the collective, and even one straw belonged to the group. At one meeting with Communist Party officials, a farmer asked. What about the teeth in my head? Do I own those? Answer, no. Your teeth belong to the collective. Okay. Now, the thing is uh, that when you're taking 100% of everything, okay, work hard, don't work hard, everyone gets the same, so people don't want to work, right? So what happened? These farmers gathered in secret, and they did something that was like, would have gotten them executed. They, they wrote a contract amongst themselves and said, we all agree that we will be able to keep some of our own grain. We will give some of them to the regime. So when it comes to collect the grain, they've got something. We'll be able to keep some of it. And if any of us are killed for doing this, then the contract said that the others would take care of their children. Okay. So they, to keep some of what you earned. I mean, just think about how- They formed a mini capitalism society within the common- Yes. A secret capitalism society. So, so what happened? Amongst- five people now, or, yeah right so now that they could keep some of what they it's earned good. right so keep some of what they earned they had a bumper harvest and you know what happened with that bumper harvest that made the local officials really suspicious and mad they weren't happy that there was a bumper harvest they're like what are you doing you doing capitalism yeah. right and in you know a few years earlier they might have just been executed mm -hmm. and in fact many were that's what it means when you see millions dead millions dead means guys were shot for keeping some grain for themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. It means like guys came and kicked in the door of your collective farm and, you know, raped your wife and took you off to a prison camp and, and so on and so forth. That's what communism actually was. Mm -hmm. Okay. It hasn't been depicted in movies. There's a great post um, by Ken Billingsley in, in the year 2000 called, uh, if I get this right, Hollywood's Missing Movies. Okay. This is um, basically here. I'll paste this link so you can put it in the show notes. All right. This is worth reading. It's still applicable today, but now that we have stable diffusion, now we have all these people online, now that Russia and China are America's national bad guys, um, you know, they, as they were before, they are again, perhaps we'll get some movies on what communism actually was during the 20th century and how bad it was, right? And, you know, vaccinate people against that as well as against Nazism, which they should be, okay? The point of this, uh, the, go ahead. Uh, no, because I'm, I'm congratulating myself on the nice because you're sending me excellent links on WhatsApp, and I just saw that there's an export chat feature. Yes, great. Because we also have disappearing messages on, so I was like, all right, this is great. Great. I'll be able to get it. This, 
your your ability to reference sources is incredible. So thank you for this. Anyway, this is just, uh, otherwise, yes. if I if I say something, it sounds too surprising. So that's why I want to make sure I have on this topic. Yeah. So like yeah, I mean people would be like shot for 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 holding some grain. So what happened though was Deng Xiaoping said, okay, um, we're not going to kill you. In fact, we're going to actually set up the first special economic zone in Shenzhen. He didn't try to flip the whole country from communist to capitalist in one go. Instead, he's like, we can reform in one place. And in fact, he fenced it off from the rest of China. And it did trade with Hong Kong. And he spent his political capital on this one exception. It grew so fast that gave him more political capital. You know, some people think actually that the, you know, Sino-Vietnamese War uh, was Deng's way of just distracting the generals while he was turning China around to get it back on the capitalist road. And what he did was um, the opposite of a rebranding. He did a reinterpretation. Like a rebranding is where the substance is the same, but the logo is changed, okay? You know, you're now, you were Facebook, you're now Meta. That's a rebranding, right? Reinterpretation is where the logo and the branding is the same. They're still the CCP. They're still the Chinese Communist Party, but they're capitalist now, the engine under the hood. It's deniable, Mm -hmm. okay? And this is a very common, once you realize those are different things, it's like swap the front end, swap the back end. Yeah. Go ahead. Good way to put it. Right? It's really good. Yeah, yeah, really good. (laughs) I'm enjoying your metaphors and way of talking about stuff. Yeah, so I get, yeah, yeah. Swap, you could, yeah, rebranding and swap to front end, reinterpretation, swap to back end. Yeah. That's right. Once you, you know, once you realize that, you're like, okay, I can, just like as an engineer, you can kind of, okay, sometimes I want to do this on the front end, sometimes I want to do the back end, sometimes it's explicit, and sometimes the user doesn't need to see it, and it's on the back end. Lots of political stuff, uh, you know, is arguably not just best done on the back end, but always done on the back end. Mm-hmm. One of the points I make in the book is left is the new right is the new left is, um, you know, if you look through history, the the Christian king, the Republican conservative, the CCP entrepreneur, um, the, um, the WASP establishment, these are all examples of a revolutionary left movement becoming the ruling class right. Mm-hmm. Okay, like the Republican conservative, just as that one example, I go through an extended description of this in the book, but the Republicans were the the radical Republicans, the left of 1865. They won the revolution and their moral authority led them to have economic authority in the late 1800s. You wouldn't want a Democrat Confederate traitor as the head of your you know railroad company, would you, right? So all the Confederate traders, et cetera, were boxed out from the plum positions in the late 1800s. Uh, and so what happened was the, the Republicans turned their moral authority into economic authority, made tons of money. The Democrats then started repositioning, not as a party of the Southern racists, but the, the poor, right? And you know the cross of gold speech by William Jennings Bryan was part of that. There's a gradual process that reached its apotheosis, not apotheosis, but let's say a, a crucial mark with the election of FDR, where it was actually not the 1932, but the 1936 election that uh, black voters switched over to FDR. Okay. That was actually the, the, like the major flip to like 70%, you know, to, to, to the Democrats. Now they had repositioned as the party of the poor, not the party of the South. Okay. And Republicans had lost um, some economic authority, or rather they had moral authority, they turned into economic authority. They started to lose some moral authority. The loss of moral authority was complete by 1965. That was actually mop up. People dated, you know, the civil rights movement as the big way where the Republicans lost moral authority. It's not really that was a mop up because uh, 1936, 30 years earlier, was when black voters switched to the Democrats. Okay, so 1965 was another 10 points moving over of black voters to the Democrats. Republicans had completely lost moral authority 100 years after the Civil War. Okay, mm-hmm. then the next 50 years, that loss of moral authority meant that they lost economic authority. Because now you wouldn't want a Republican bigot as a CEO of your tech company anymore, would you, right? So by 2015, 2020, or now, now you have, it's like two sine waves that are staggered, right? Moral authority leads to economic authority, leads to loss of uh, moral authority, leads to loss of economic authority. And so now you have the, uh, the Democrats, you know, have, you know, completed a 155 year arc 
from the defeated party in the Civil War to the dominant party in the US establishment. All the woke capitalists are now at the very top. And now the same repositioning is happening where if you're so woke, why are you rich? You get it, right? Like, you know, if you're so smart, why aren't you rich is the normal kind of thing, right? If you're so woke, if you're so holy, why is like, for example, the BLM founder, why do they have this million dollar mansion, right? If you're so woke and it's all about being good and you're anti-capitalist, how come you seem to be raking in the money, et cetera, right? This is an argument which I'm not sure how long it will go. Um, it, it might take uh, years to play out. It might take decades to play out. I think probably on the order of a decade, you're going to see, in my view, the repositioning uh, if the Democrats are the woke capitalists, the Republicans will eventually become, are becoming the Bitcoin maximalists. Mm -hmm. Why? Because, you know, if one guy picks left, the other guy picks right. It's literally like magnets kind of repelling. They're sort of forced into the other corner here, right? And the Bitcoin maximalists will essentially, where this guy says centralization, they say decentralization, where they defend the right of capital to do anything. The maximalists will say, actually, you're all cantillionaires. Um, you're all benefiting from printed money. You don't have anything that's legitimate. You don't actually own anything. It's all a handout from the government and so on and so forth, right? And um, so that's a counterpositioning that will basically attack the wokes by how much money they're making. Mm -hmm. They're not contesting the ideology. So when one guy signals economics, you signal culture. When uh, their guy signals culture, you signal economics. That's actually, that's a whole thing I can talk about. Should I talk about that for a second? Sure. Is, is this... Uh, inter integrated into the forces that you talk about, you, you've talked about s the three forces, the trifecta of forces that affect our society, which is the wokes, let's say. Woke capital, communist wo capital, woke capital. capital. You talk sure. so fast, <laughs> it's, uh, and I think so slow. No, no, no. Uh, woke capital, communist capital, and crypto capital. Uh, can you explain each of those three, we actually yes. talked about each of the three in part, but it'd be nice to bring them together in a okay. beautiful triangle. And th then I will also come back up and I'll talk about how the CCP story relates to social media and decentralized social media. Sure. Okay. All right. So NYT CCP BTC is woke capital, communist capital, crypto capital. And communist capital is the simplest. It is you must submit. The communist party is powerful. CCP is powerful, and you are not. If you're in China, you just submit. CCP is an embodiment of communist capital that you're talking about. Well, yeah. So basically, and, and by the in China, they call it CPC. You know, so basically, they don't like it usually if you say CCP, right? So, uh, like Communist Party of China, as opposed to Chinese Communist Party. Whatever. Basically, that is capitalism. That is uh, that is a Chinese pool of capital. That billion person pool. Okay, that that's WeChat, and it's um, you know, it's Alibaba and it's the entire kind of thing. That is one just social network with currency. The whole thing is vertically integrated. When we right? say communist, what, what do you mean here? Why is the word communist important? Why don't you just say China? So is, is communist an important word? It just, it's just, it's, well, it or is, is it actually, just a catchy label? It's a catchy label, but I think it's also important because it seems it's paradoxical, right? So I had a thread on this. The future is communist capital versus world capital versus crypto capital. Each represents a left-right fusion that's bizarre by the standards of the 1980s consensus. It's PRC versus MMT versus BTC, all right? And why is it bizarre by the standards of the 1980s consensus? Well, in the 1980s, you wouldn't think the communists would become capitalists, but they did. You wouldn't think that the wokes, the progressives, right, um, would become so enamored with giant corporations and and their power, right? They've, they've seen something to, to liken that, right? Um, and you also wouldn't think that the non-Americans or the post-Americans or the internationalists would be the champions of capital because um, you'd think it's the American nation, right? Mm -hmm. So rather than the conservative American nationalists being the defenders of capital, you have the liberal Americans who are with capital. You have the communist Chinese who are with capital. And you have the internationalists who are with capital. And it's the conservative American nationalists who are in some ways against that, <laughs> which is which is kind of funny, right? So, uh, so it's like this weird ideological flippening that um, 
if you if you look if you take the long lens, you have these poles that kind of repel each other. Okay, so just on the CCP NYT BTC thing, NYT by the way is woke capital. Yeah, what is NYT? So its formula is a little interesting. If CCP is just you must submit because they're powerful, okay, and then you bow your head because the Chinese Communist Party is strong. Woke capital is you must sympathize. Why do you bow your head, Lex? Oh, because you're a white male. Therefore, you're guilty. You sympathize. You must bow your head because you are powerful. Mm -hmm. Yet, notice it ends in the same place in your, your, your head looking to the ground, right? In China, it's because they are powerful, so therefore you must bend your head. For the wokes, it's the left-handed version where you are powerful and that's shameful, so you should bow your head. Right? Right. Okay? But it ends in your head bowed. It's an ideology of submission. It's not that subtle, but it's like somewhat subtle. And then finally, crypto capital is head held high. You must be sovereign. Okay? Which, and one of the things I point out in the in the book is each of these poles is um, negative in some ways when taken to extreme, mm -hmm. but also negative in its opposite. For example, obviously just totally submitting to total surveillance is bad, but a society where nobody submits is San Francisco where people just... <laughs> Sandy of math is white supremacist and whatever, you know, nonsense is, is happening today is terrible. But a society that's totally stripped of sympathy is also not one that one would want to be part of, right? That's just like the, you know, the, whether it's 4chan's actual culture or it's feigned culture or something like that, or some some weird combination, you, that's also not good. It's like Russia in the 90s, like nobody trusts anybody. That's also bad. And, you know, being totally sovereign, that sounds good. And there's a lot that is good about it. And I'm sympathetic to this corner. But being totally sovereign, you go so capitalist, so sovereign that you're against the division of labor. You don't trust anybody. So you have to pump your own water and so on. So you actually have a reduced standard of living over here, okay? And conversely- Basically like survivalist or whatever. Survivalist type of stuff, right? And you just kind of, you, you, you just go kind of too crazy into that corner. And then, of course, though, the other extreme of, you know, having no sovereignty is the- you will own nothing and be happy. Everything's in the cloud and can be deleted at any point, right? So each of these is kind of has badness when it's there, but also it's total extreme opposite is bad. And so you want to kind of carve out like an intelligent intermediate of these three poles. And that's the, you know, decentralized center or the re-centralized center, I call it. Now, with that said, I think there is a repositioning in particular of vote capital that is happening. And I think if the 2000s was the global war on terror, and then the channel just changed to wokeness in the 2010s. And when I mean channel change, have you seen Paul Graham's graph, or actually David Rosado's graph that Paul Graham posted? No, but well, uh, this is a good chance to say that Paul Graham is awesome. Okay, yeah. And so here is this graph, okay? David Rosado is a data analysis, I think, that put this together. So but basically, this is a graph of the word usage frequency in the New York Times, 1970 to 2018. And is, he's got some controls there. Paul Graham tweets, hypothesis. Although some newspapers can survive the switch to online subscriptions, none can do it and remain politically neutral. Quote, newspaper of record. You have to pick a side to get people to subscribe. And there's uh, a bunch of plots on the x-axis is years. On the y-axis is the frequency of use, and sexism has been going up, misogyny has been going up, sexist, patriarchy, mansplaining, toxic masculinity, male privilege, all these terms have been going up very intensely in the past in, in the in the past decade. Yeah, but really 2013 is the exact moment. You see these things, they're flat and then just go vertical mansplaining, toxic masculinity. What precisely happened in 2013? Ah, so I talk about this in the book, but I think fundamentally what happened was tech hurt media and their revenue dropped by uh, about $50 billion over the four years from 08 to 2012. Yeah. Tech helped Obama get reelected and media was positive on, on tech until December 2012. They wrote like the nerds go marching in the, in the Atlantic. Then after January 2013, once Obama was ensconced, then the knives came out because 
basically these tech guys were bankrupting them. They were through um, supporting them. And so the journals got extremely nasty and uh, just basically they couldn't build search engines or create social networks, but they could write stories and shape narratives. So a clear editorial direction. When realize that these words have just been chosen in such a way as to delegitimize their target. And they all went vertical in 2013 and they were suddenly targeted against their erstwhile allies, you know, in tech, but also just across the, the country. You can see that this great awakening, that's what uh, Iglesias called it by play on words, the great awakening, right? Mm -hmm. This kind of spasm of quasi-religious extremism. I wouldn't call it religious because it's not God-centered. It's really state and network centered. So I call it a doctrine, which is a superset of religion and, and political doctrine. This, uh, these words went vertical and the, all the terrorism stuff you just noticed kind of fell off a cliff. That was the obsession of everything in the 2000s and just channel change, right? It's amazing how that happened. Yeah, It's not, it's not, like, not like any of the pieces got picked up. Some of those wars are still raging, of course. And there's uh, victims to this wokeism yeah. movement. And, um, but in a weird way, even though some parts of it, just like, you know, Siri, like there's wars in the Middle East that still keep raging. There's, there's certainly active fronts of wokeism, you know, but yeah. in a sense, the, the next shift is already on. You know why? It's a pivot from wokeism to statism. In many ways, NYT is sort of, and more generally the U S establishment is sort of kind of coming. You may not believe this. They're kind of coming back to the center a little bit. In the same way that Lenin, after the revolution, implemented the new economic policy, which you may be aware of, right? Which was just like X percent more capitalism. He kind of boot on the neck, take control, but then ease up for a bit. And the so-called net men during the 20s were able to eke out something. There was like, you know, oh, okay, fine. He's, he's going to be easier on us. Then it intensified again because basically by loosening up, they were able to consolidate control. They weren't putting as much pressure on, right? Then it went extremely intense again, right? Uh, similar to like Mao's like 100 flowers thing, let 100 flowers bloom and, you know, everybody came out and then he found out all the people who were against him and he executed a bunch of them, right? So what's happening now is NYT is, and more generally the U.S. establishment is somewhat tacking back to the center where, you know, they're not talking BLM and abolish the police. They're saying fund the Capitol Police, Right. They've, they've gone from the narrative of 2020, which was meant to win a domestic contest, where they said America is a systemically racist country, tear down George Washington, we're so evil, to the rhetoric of 2022, which is we're the global champion of democracy and every non-white country is supposed to trust us. Now, obviously those are inconsistent, right? If, if you're in India or you're in Nigeria and you just heard that the America is calling itself the same guys, by the way, saying it's so institutionally racist, systemically racist, and now you're saying, well, we're the leader of the free world and the number one. Obviously, there's an inconsistency between the domestic propaganda and the foreign propaganda, mm -hmm. right? There's a contrast between abolish the police and put two billion for the capital police. You can reconcile this and you can say the U.S. establishment is pro-federal and anti-local and state. So abolish the local police who tend to be, you know, Republican or rightist, but fund the FBI, fund the Capitol Police who tend to be, you know, just like in the um, you know, Soviet Union, is the national things like the the KGB, right? That were they were for the um uh for the state, um, but there were always local nationalist ethnic insurgencies in like Estonia and other places, right? So you can reconcile them, but nevertheless, on its face, those those are contradictory. So what are you gonna get, I think? I think you're gonna get um, this rotation where uh, a fair number of the folks on the sort of authoritarian right are kind of pulled back into the fold a bit, okay? These are the cops and the military and whatnot, some of them, because as this decade progresses, you're going to see the signaling on American statism as opposed to wokeism, okay? Which is 30 degrees back to... So ...and decentralization and so on, Okay. And so the next one isn't red versus blue, it's orange versus green. It's the dollar versus Bitcoin. And so you have the authoritarians, the top of the political compass versus the quote libertarians, right? And here is the, here's the visual of that. 
So that's why, like, you know, as I wrote the book and after I showed, I was like, you know, I'm already seeing this, um, this shift happening from war on terror to wokeism to American statism, right? And here, just take a look at this visual. Interesting. So uh, the visual... versus crypto. That's right. And some folks switch sides, right? Because you have folks like, you know, Jack Dorsey and a lot of the tech founders in basically the lower left corner, right, who were blue, but are now going to become orange or are orange. And you have folks in the analysis perspective, or maybe in a deeper sense, if you can enlighten me. Do you think Bitcoin will rise again? Yes. Do you think it will go uh, to take on fiat, you know, to go over a million dollars, to uh, go to these heights? You know? I mean, I think it's possible. And the reason I think it's possible is I think a lot of things might go to a million dollars because oh, inflation. Because inflation. Right. What I, yeah. I was an important point, right? Yes, it's yeah. a very important point, yes. Because you're seeing essentially... <laughs> yes. Right, the, sort of the, the choke pointing on energy is pushing up prices across the board for a lot of things. The supply, you know, China's not doing us any favors with the COVID uh, lockdowns. Um, Putin's not doing the world any favors with this with this giant war. Um, there's a lot of bad things happening in the physical world, right? You know, you have, I mean, when China, Russia, and the U.S. are all and Europe is, you know, like there's folks who are just insane about degrowth and they're against, um, you know, they're, 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 they're pushing for burning coal and wood, right? So a lot of prices are going up in a really foundational and fundamental way. And um, with that said, also, the dollar is in some ways strengthening against certain other things because a lot of other countries are dying harder, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and you've got riots in Sri Lanka and riots in Panama and riots in, you know, all, all these places, right? So it's it's very complicated because you've got multiple different trends going in the same way. Your your Bitcoin maximums would just say infinity over twenty one million, and so therefore you print all the dollars. There's only twenty one million Bitcoin, so Bitcoin goes to infinity. But it can be something where lots of other currencies die, and the dollar is actually exported via stable coins. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, but I do so think it still moves fiat still moves somehow into the cryptocurrencies yeah, yeah yeah it's i think it's kind of like microsoft where i mean windows is still around right microsoft is still around it's still a uh, you know multi-hundred billion dollar company it had he it doesn't mean it he doesn't mean it don't worry all my machines are windows and are they still boot yeah okay okay i don't know a single mac really okay yeah. that you are unusual on that yeah that's um so at least for our it's, it's not ideology just convenience Fine. I mean, they actually now post that they do make some good stuff, right? Like uh, Microsoft Teams is good, right? Yeah, like, there's, you know, there's a lot of some, incredible stuff. Yeah. And new CEO has done a lot of innovative things like GitHub. You know. Yeah, I mean, well, there's an acquisition, but still, they give them credit for it. The acquisition, the pivoting of vision and motivations and uh, focus and all that kind of stuff. So, anyway, yes, okay. Microsoft does an analogy metaphor for something. Well, yeah, so basically just like, you know, they didn't need a turnaround, but they are, they did endure to the present day. They didn't die from Google app. I mean, for the massive yeah. attacks on them, yeah. they didn't die. They are less powerful, but they make more money, right? Yes. And um, I think that might be something that, I mean, our best case scenario is the US establishment or CCP has more power over fewer people. Okay. I see. And so, the, you know, but you can exit. If, you, if you're there, you're kind of knuckling under or whatever, but you can exit, right? And so I mentioned the uh, those three polls. CCP is obviously a billion people, 1.4 aligned under the digital yuan and so on, right? NYT is the entire, you know, it's it's the tech companies, it's the US dollar, it is the US dollar. And then crypto capital is everybody else. But I actually think that over time, that third world, is web three this time and that's the third poll and that's india and it's israel and it's lots of american conservatives and left libertarians and libertarians and it's also lots of chinese liberals all the folks who are trying to get out of china because you know the like the you know it's become so nationalist and crazy and, and difficult for capitalism and so if you take basically 
non-establishment Americans on both left and right, okay, the the you know the the bottom two quadrants in the political compass that I talked about. You take the liberal Chinese, you take the Israelis and the Indians. Why? Because they don't. Both of them are have a lot of tech talent, right? They're the number one and number two demographics for tech founders, and they want to. Uh, while they are generally sympathetic to the West, right? And they're more ties to the West. They also are more cautious about national interest rather than just starting fights. You know where that's how they would think about it, right? They just, you know, India thinks of itself as a poor country. Israel thinks of itself as a small country, and so therefore it needs to not just get in every fight just for the sake of it. And so need to maintain a cautious distance with China, but not like do what Pelosi is doing and try and start start like a big thing. Okay. I think Israel is similar, where it's maintaining diplomatic relations with China. It's more friendly towards China than than the U.S. is. India and Israel, I think, are two sovereign states that have a lot of globally mobile tech talent that obviously have ties to the West with the large diaspora that are hard to demonize. You know, in, in or in the sense of willing to argue on the internet. <laughs> Let's put it like that in English, right? It's very important, and. Um, them plus enough Americans plus enough Chinese can set up another pole that is not for Cold War or military confrontation, but for peace and trade and freedom and so on and so forth, right? That's the center as opposed to the, you know, left of the, you know. It will eventually be like the number three economy. It's on the rise. He's got the history and culture. He thinks he's entitled to have, India's entitled to have its own side. I actually think it's going to be tripolar. And the reason it's tripolar is these three pools are the groups that have enough media and money and scale and whatnot to really kind of be self-consistent civilizations. Obviously, China's like the vertically integrated, like Apple or whatever, just like it one country. Maybe a stable ideology. A stable ideology. That's right. Right. Obviously, the you know the wokes have control of lots of institutions. They've got the U.S. establishment. They've got the tech companies. They've got the media companies, and so on. But crypto is basically everybody else, and crucially, crypto has inroads in China and America, where it's hard to demonize it as completely foreign because there's many, many, many no longer be you know the, the number one rule of the rules based order is America is always number one. Mm -hmm. And China doesn't even pretend to maintain a rules-based order, right? Yes. Whereas for all those countries that don't want to either be dominated by the US media corporations that can, or social media that can just censor Trump, nor do they want to be dominated by China, this is an attractive alternative, a platform they can make their own, right? So that's where I think, you know, I wrote an article on this in, in foreign policy on um, here. Here's two articles that talk about this a little bit. It's called Great Protocol Politics. And then here's another one on the sort of domestic thing, Bitcoin is civilization for Barry Weiss, okay? But I wanna just come up the stack a little bit and just return to that original point, which I diverged on, which was why, I gave the whole example of how uh, we got into China because I talked about how China had gone from communist to capitalist and letting people have just a share of what they owned, right? With social media, we're still in kind of the communist era of social media almost, where whatever you earn on social media, like Google takes its cut, Twitter takes 100%, you earn nothing for all your tweets or anything like that. Not, not only do you have, do you earn nothing, um, you might get a little rev share on TikTok or YouTube, you can do okay, right? But not only do you earn either nothing or a little bit, you have no digital property rights, even more fundamentally. You are at the, just the whim of a giant corporation can hit a button and everything you worked for over years, gone, mm -hmm. okay? That is, even if that is, quote, the current state of events, the state of affairs, rather, that is not the right balance of power. To be able to unperson somebody at <music> presence is online. If that can just be taken away from you with a with the press of a key, that just gives you know, bad governments, bad corporations, so much power that that's wrong, right? Yeah. That's why I'm a medium and long-term bull on crypto, simply because it's a check on this thing. And that if you think about it in terms of just 
after China went from communist to capitalist. Literally billions of people around the world are no longer giving everything to the collective. They own the teeth in their head now, finally. Okay. Yeah. It's funny, right? Yeah. So your LexFriedman.eth, you own it. The keys are on your computer. The bad part is, of course, they can get hacked or something like that. Then you can deal with that with social recovery. There's ways of securing keys. But the good part is, ta-da, uh, you actually have property rights in the Hernando de Soto sense. You have something you own, ownership, digital ownership. It's The cloud is great, but crypto gives you some of the functionality of the cloud while also having some of the functionality of the offline world where you have the keys. So it's a, v, it's a V3, mm. right? It's, you know, it's a continuous theme, right? The V1 was offline. I've got a key. I own it. I have de facto control. V2 is the cloud. Someone else manages it for me. It's hosted. I get collaboration and so on. V3 is the chain where you combine aspects of those, right? You have the global state of the cloud, but you have the local permission and controlling of the private key, okay? So that's why I'm a medium to long-term ultra bull on crypto. And I've actually, there's a podcast I gave with Asimco where I talked through how crypto actually doesn't just go after finance. So it's, it's gold and it's wire transfers and it's crowdfunding and it's all finance with DeFi, but it's actually also search and it's social and it's messaging. It's actually even operating systems um, and uh, and eventually cloud and whatnot. Do you want me to talk about that briefly? Yeah, yeah. If you can briefly see, so sure. the, very briefly. how how how, how, does it how go? broad you see the effect of crypto. So first, crypto is fundamentally a new way of building backend systems, right? So if you think about how big a deal it was to go from AT and T's corporate Unix to Linux, it's permissionless, right? Mm -hmm. When you went from as much as I admire a lot of the stuff that you know, Sam Altman and Greg Brockman have done at OpenAI. I mean, they're phenomenal in terms of research. They've pushed the envelope forward. I give them a ton of credit, right? Still, it was great to see Stable Diffusion out there, which was open source AI, right? Mm -hmm. And so from a developer, from a power user standpoint, whenever you have the unlocked version, like an unlocked cell phone, it's always going to be better, right? So the um what, what crypto gives you uh, obviously it's every financial thing in the world you can do stocks bonds etc it's not just like the internet wasn't just a, a channel it wasn't like radio and tv and internet it was internet radio and internet tv and internet this and internet that everything was the internet all media became the internet mm -hmm. crypto is not an asset class it's all asset classes it's crypto stocks and crypto bonds etc in a real sense like private property arguably didn't exist in the same way before crypto. International law didn't exist before crypto. How is how are you going to do a deal between Brazil and Bangladesh? Um, if a Brazilian company wants to, you know, acquire a Bangladeshi company, they usually have to set up a US adapter in between because otherwise what are, what are the tax or the, you know, other obligations between the two? You set up a US adapter or a Chinese adapter to go between, but now that Brazilian and Bangladeshi can go peer to peer because mm -hmm. they're using the blockchain, right? They can agree on a system of law that is completely you know, international, and that's code. So each party can diligence it without speaking Portuguese and Bengali, right? So that's why I am a long-term bull on crypto. I just described the, the finance case. Let me go through the others, right? Social. So you have the private keys for your ENS. You have apps like Farcaster. You um, basically have decentralized social media where there's different variants. Some, you just log in with your crypto username. Others, the entire social network and all the likes and posts are on chain, like DSO. But, uh, but there's several different versions, right? Search. Once, uh, you know, once you realize um, block explorers are an important stealth threat to search, they're very high traffic sites like blockchain.com and either scan that Google has just totally slept on. They don't have a block explorer. You don't have to do anything in terms of trading or anything like that. Google does not have a block explorer. Why? They don't think of it as search, but it is search. It's absolutely search. It's a, it's a very important kind of search engine. And once you have crypto social, you have you now show that you're not just indexing in a block explorer like uh, on-chain transactions, but on-chain communications. Okay. So now you suddenly see, oh, the entire social web that Google couldn't index, it could only index the World Wide Web and not the social web. Now it's actually the on-chain signed web, right? because every post is digitally signed, it's a new set of signals. It's way easier to index than either the World Wide Web or the social web because it's open and public. So this is a total disruptive thing to search in the medium term because it's a new kind of data set to index, right? 
sets out. It's a threat to social, to search. It is a threat to messaging. Why? Because, or it's disruptive eventually because of the ENS name, as I mentioned, is like a universal identifier. You can send encrypted messages between people. That's a better primitive to base it on. You know, WhatsApp is just claiming that they're end to end encrypted. But with an ENS name or with a crypto name, you can be provably, audibly end to end encrypted because you're actually sending it back and forth, right? With, because the private key is local, right? That itself, given how important that is, right? That, you know, you could man in the middle signal or WhatsApp because there's a server there, right? If you have, you know, so end to end encrypted messaging will happen and with payments and all this other stuff, okay? So you get the crypto messaging apps, you get uh, operating systems. Why? Well, the frontier of operating systems, I mean, look, you know, Windows, uh, Linux, and Mac OS have been around forever. But if you actually think about, you know, what is a blockchain? Well, there's operating systems, there's web browsers. A blockchain is the most complicated thing since an operating system or web browser because it's a kind of operating system. Why? It's got, you know, something like Ethereum has an EVM. It's got a programming language. It's got an ecosystem where people monetize on it. They build front-end apps and they build back-end apps. They interoperate between each other. This is the frontier of operating systems research. Mm -hmm. People haven't thought of it that way, right? It's also the frontier of a lot of things in databases. Um, you will get a crypto LinkedIn where there's zero-knowledge proofs of various credentials, okay? Uh, basically, every single Web2 company, I can probably come up with a Web3 variant of it, right? Like Ethereum is, I mean, and this is high praise for both parties, but Ethereum is like the crypto Stripe, right, or the Web3 Stripe. And you will um, you will see versions of every, everything else that are like this. But, you know, I, I kind of described uh, search, social, messaging, operating systems, the phone, right? Solana's doing a crypto phone. Why do you want that? Again, digital property. Apple is, was talking about running some script to find if people were having you know, CSAM, like, ch you know, child porn, or whatever on, on their, on their phones. Right. And even NYT actually reported that, uh, like Google ran something like this and found a false positive. Some guy had to take a photo of a kid for, you know, medical diagnosis. It got false, you know, falsely flagged as CSAM. He lost access to his account. Total nightmare. Imagine just getting locked out of your Google account, which you're so dependent on, right? Mm -hmm. As more and more of your digital life goes online, you know, is it really that much ethically different if it's the Chinese state that locks you out or an American corporation, right? Basically, it's operationally very similar. You just have no recourse. You're unpersoned, right? So the crypto phone becomes like insanely important because you have a local set of private keys. Those are the keys to your currency and your passport and your services and your life, right? So like become something you just hold on you with your person at all times, like your normal phone. You might have backups and stuff, but you know, the crypto phone is an insanely important thing. Okay. And so that's search, that's social, that's messaging, that's um operating systems, that's a phone. That's a lot right there. Yeah, that's beautiful. Can I have 120 seconds to just finish up a few more thoughts on social media? Yes, please. Okay. AI and AR. Okay. This massive impact, obviously, of AI and social media. You're going to have completely new social media companies, gestures, other things. You know, TikTok having you know some of the AI creation tools in there is is just like a V1 of that. Um, there's this whole thread with everything stable diffusion is unlocking. But basically, this is going to melt Hollywood. U.S. media corporations that took a hit in the 2010s, we're now going to be able to have everyone around the world able to tell their story. And all the stuff about AI ethics and AI bias, the ultimate bias is centralized AI. Mm -hmm. Only decentralized AI is truly representative. You cannot be faux representative. You cannot claim that some that Google is representing Nigerian. You haven't actually truly decentralized it. This is the woke capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. You justify it with the wokeness and you make the money by centralizing it. But the actual way of doing it is letting it free for the world and letting people build their own versions. If people want to build a Asian Lord of the Rings, they can do that. If they want to build an Indian one, they can do that. If they, you know, whatever they want, right? So that is the argument for um, AI decentralization and for 
how that kind of links to this. I love that AI decentralization fixes the bias problem in AI, which a lot of people seem to yeah, cent centralization talk about and focus on. Yeah, centralization is inherently unrepresentative, mm -hmm. fundamentally. Like you can like mathematically show it. It's not representing the world. The, the decentralization allows anybody to pick it up and make it their own, right? And centralization is almost always a mask for like that private corporate interest where it's like one of the things about the woke capitalism thing, by the way, is the deplatforming of Trump is was political. Other things are political. But do you know what deplatforming started with? In the late 2000s, early 2010s, all the open social stuff was when deplatforming was being used as a corporate weapon against Meerkat and Zynga and Teespring, right? These were companies that were competing with features of, you know, TweetDeck, et cetera. They were competing with features of Twitter or Facebook and the API was cut off. And that was when actually progressives were for net neutrality mm -hmm. and an open internet and open social against the concentration of corporate power and so on. Remember that, right? And uh, so what's going to happen is both those two things, the political and the corporate are going to come together. Why? In the Soviet Union, denunciation was used as a tool to, for example, undercut romantic rivals, right? There's a great article called The Practice of Denunciation in, in you know, the Soviet Union, right? Which talks about all these examples where the ideological argument was used to like kick somebody into the 300 like pit mm -hmm. that existed at like the center of the Soviet Union. Anybody could be kicked into the pit at any moment. And ta-da, well, Ivan's out, you know, and now, you know, hey, Anna, you know, whatever, right? Okay. That same thing is going to be used by woke capitalists, is being used by woke capitalists, where the woke argument is used to justify pulling, pushing their competitor out of the app store or downracking them in search. Well, again, you wouldn't want a, a bigot to be in search who could compete with us or whatever, right? And conversely, um, so, so the wokeness is used to make money and um, the money is used to advance the ideology. It's like this kind of back and forth. Sometimes Right now, you think of those as independent things, but then they fuse, mm -hmm. okay? And so that's very clear with the AI bias arguments where it just so happens that it's so powerful, Lex. This technology is so powerful in the wrong hands it could be used, so we will charge you nine ninety nine for every use of it. How's that? How how altruistic is that? Is that amazingly altruistic? It's really good, right? So, <laughs> so once you kind of... Um, kind of see that, as I said, whenever they're positioning on economics, you can go on culture. When they're positioning on culture, you can go on economics. If they're so woke, why are they rich? If they're so concerned about representation, why is it centralized? Answer, they're not actually concerned about it. They're making money, right? Okay. So that is, I think, in a, in a few words, blows up a lot of the AI bias type stuff, right? Okay. Um, they're basically, they're biasing AI. All right. So the amount of stuff that can be done with AI now, like it also helps the pseudonymous economy, as I was talking about with the AI Zoom. So you have totally new sites, uh, totally new apps that are based on that. Um, it, uh, I think it may, um, I mean, it, it changes. You're going to have new Google Docs, new all, all these kinds of things. You might have, um, you know, once you can do things with just a few taps, you might have sites that are focused more on producing rather than just consuming because, you know, you, you might, with AI, you can change the productivity of gestures. You know, you can have a few gestures like, like a, for example, the image to image thing with, with Seattle Diffusion where you make a little cartoon third graders painting and it becomes a real painting. A lot of user interfaces will be rethought now that you can actually do this incredible stuff with AI. It knows what you want it to do, right? So, um, and I saw this funny thing, which was a riff on Peter Thiel's line, which is AI is centralized and crypto is decentralized. And, and somebody was saying, actually, it turns out crypto is centralized with the CBDCs and stable coin and so on. But AI is getting decentralized with stable diffusion. Ha ha, right? Which is funny. And I think there's centralized and decentralized versions of each of these, right? And finally, the third poll that actually, you know, Thiel, uh, you know, he talks about AI and crypto, but the third poll is actually that's sort of underappreciated because people think it already exists, is social. That just is keeping on going, right? And obviously the next step in social is AR and VR. And why is it so obvious? Because it's meta, you know, it's Facebook. Now I saw this very silly article. It's like, oh my God, Facebook is so dumb for putting a $10 billion into, you know, virtual reality, right? And I'm like, okay, the most predictable innovation in the world in my view, is the AR glasses. Have you talked about this on the podcast before? 
AR and VR? I mean, of course, a lot, but the AR is not as obvious, actually. Okay, so AR glasses. What what are AR glasses? So you take Snapchat Spectacles, Google Glass, um, Apple's AR Kit, yeah. Facebook's Oculus Quest Two, right? Mm-hmm. Or Meta Meta Quest Two, whatever. You, okay, you put those together, and what do you get? You get um, something that has the form factor of glasses that you'd wear outside. Okay, which um, can with the tap record or give you Terminator vision on something or with another tap go totally dark and become VR glasses. Mm-hmm. Okay. So normal glasses, AR glasses, VR glasses, recording. It's as multifunctional as your phone, but it's hands-free. And you might actually even wear it more than your phone. In fact, you might be blind without your AR glasses because, uh, you know, one of the things I've, I've shown in the book early on are like floating sigils. Did we talk, did, did I show you that? No. So this is a really important, just visual concept. That right there shows with AR kit, you can see a globe floating outside. Mm. Okay. Secret societies are, are returning. This is what NFTs will become. The, the NFT locally on your crypto phone, if you hold it, you can see the symbol. And if you don't, you can't. By the way, for people just listening, we're looking at a nice nature scene where an artificially created globe is floating in the air. Yes, but it's invisible if you're not holding up the AR kit phone. Yes. Right? So So only you have a window into this artificial world. That's right. And then here is another thing which shows you another piece of it. And this is using ENS to unlock a door. So this is an NFT used for something different. So the first one is using the NFT effectively to see something. And the second is using the NFT to do something. Mm -hmm. Okay. So based on your on-chain communication, right, um, you can unlock a door. That's that's the door to a room. Soon it could be a door to a building. It could be the gates to a community. Mm -hmm. It could be your digital login. Okay. And so. Amazing. What this means is basically a lot of these things, which are like individual pieces, get synthesized, right? And uh, you eventually have a digital, just like you have a digital currency, or digital currencies unify concepts like uh, obviously gold. Main name, all those kinds of things, and your key card for your door and so on, right? Mm -hmm. So the AR glasses are what probably, I don't know, it'll be. This is the Lex Free Podcast.